The Flat Earth Movement has taken the globe by storm, and more and more people are learning the truth about the lies that we've been told. But is the Flat Earth Movement an awakening to the truth of cosmology, or is it controlled opposition designed, as usual, to hide something much more profound? Today, we'll find out. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the show. You're listening to the Dance of Life podcast, and I'm your host, Tudor Alexander. Today is going to be a very interesting episode. I hope it's going to be interesting for you, as it is interesting for me, as we wrap up this cosmology series and the adventure that we've been on. It's going to be something for everybody today. And so far, we've looked at many things. If you've tuned in to the cosmology series last week, I, as of the time of this episode, I released a major work on heliocentrism. Make sure you check it out if you haven't already. Even if you are a veteran in the heliocentric versus geocentric debate, biblical cosmology discussion, flat earth, all these kind of things, you will learn a lot from that series. Because the thing that the flat earth movement does not take you to is how all of this applies to the Bible and Bible prophecy specifically. So make sure you go check out that heliocentric conspiracy. The total length of the presentation is about 22 hours, a little over 22 hours. It's in 10 separate videos. So quite the commitment, but it's going to be also quite the adventure as well. You will definitely learn much more about the heliocentric conspiracy, really. It's a conspiracy than probably any other platform or place I've seen on YouTube. I haven't seen... The point is this. I haven't seen anybody really tie together everything having to do with cosmology to the ultimate problem, which is that the beast will be worshipped at the end of time. And that particular destination is on the horizon. So make sure you check out that series. It's also going to arm you with defenses against this debate. And of course, today is going to be even more interesting, I think, because we're after we've refuted the heliocentric model clearly throughout this whole series, and if you've been open to the information, you know that, now we're taking a turn. There's another fork in the road. And the question is, do we, what are we left with? And of course, what we're left with is the flat earth model, the circular flat earth model. And my goal in today's presentation is to show you proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that the earth cannot be a circle. And that's an interesting adventure because there are many questions that come up. And my invitation to you is, despite the immediate questions that are arising, when somebody says, well, the earth is flat, but it's not a circle, like continuity, like all these other things, delay them for this presentation, delay them until the end, so we can both look at these things together and really marvel at the truth. That's my goal with you today. But this is the point, folks. We're at a, we're at a dialectic right now. We're at a crossroads, really, not a dialectic, but the dialectic is right in front of us. And, and the choice is, do you, if you reject the heliocentric model, then okay, I guess you're going to be a flat earther. Well... If you've been with me throughout this throughout this cosmology series, I've told you time and again that I am not a flat earther, nor do I want you to be a flat earther, because the flat earth movement, in my opinion, is controlled opposition. It's infiltrated. So we're going to unpack the flat earth model today in great depth, and we're going to see how it cannot be a circle. It just can't be. It's impossible. And again, however many questions that may rise for you in the moment, delay them. We'll try to answer some of them. And some of them will not have answers, and that is the journey of today. So if you're, a, if you're a seasoned veteran in this discussion, 
I promise you that you will learn quite a lot in this episode. If you are new to this topic, my encouragement to you is to watch the previous episodes, to buckle your seatbelt, to get your popcorn, because today is going to be quite a ride. Um, in the last four years of my researching this particular topic, since 2020, it's 2024 now, I have researched this intensely, the cosmology of our world. I have gone down a lot of rabbit holes. I'm not going to say all of them because who knows how many there are, but I've gone down many of them and you will see a lot of them in today's episode. And hopefully you've seen some in the previous one with the heliocentric conspiracy as well. But this entire cosmology series is a result of the four years of research that I've done on this topic. And today, as I stand before you and I present this, I have more questions than answers. And I think that's a good thing. Intellectually, I think it's good and scientific to say, I don't know, this is a mystery, to ask more questions, to be curious, to be open-minded. I think that is what God gave us an analytical brain for. And that is why God created science, because science really is an adventure, folks. Science is an adventure. It's an adventure into God and learning about God's ways through the things that he's made. You can't see God, but you can see the things that he's made. And as a result, through reference, you can discern his character, his will, his power, his heart, all of these important things. And science is a tool to do that because God created science. And we talked about that in the last series that ultimately the enemy has hijacked science and turned it into an antichrist in place of Christ, counterfeit salvation, and also simultaneously against Christ. So that's another thing also that I don't see the too, too much in the flat earth community is that they don't realize how all of these things really tie to the Bible. Because again, the flat earth movement is infiltrated, it's become very new agey, and we'll talk about that today as well. So I'm not a flat earther, neither should you be. The earth is not a circle. I'll prove it to you today. Hopefully, if you're open to the evidence, you will see that proof beyond a shadow of a doubt. And we'll reflect together on what that means, because it truly is profound. Today is going to be a little bit slightly different approach because I have there's so much visual material to present. We're going to be doing it kind of old school with a PowerPoint presentation. And probably my, my video view when I talk is going to be a little bit thinner, so hopefully that's all right. But either way, I think it'll be useful because it's it's there's a lot of visual information to be laid out and we'll just be looking at slides together. There's, I think, about 200 slides we're going to go through, quite a robust amount of information. And if you want to use this presentation yourself, I'm going to post it as part of the references of this series. So you can download. It's it's going to be in, uh, what is it, Keynote for Mac, but I think they're convertible one to a PowerPoint and Keynote. Either way, you can have the presentation with all the videos and slides and pictures and screenshots and everything in there. You can use it for yourself. You can use it for your own Bible studies. Um, you know, feel free to edit out some of the things that maybe are relevant to me because I talk about a little bit some of the things that are in my uh, life and so on. But either way, you can use that for your own projects, for your own resources, and I'll post it. It's a, it's a large file. It's, I think, like two gigs or something like that. So just FYI. But the slides are also numbered at the bottom right hand. So you can take notes based on the slide number and um, away we go. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, like, share, share with all your flat earth friends and see what they think, because I think this will be um, quite the quite the journey for anybody to take. So onward and forward. There we go. All right. 15 problems with the circular flat earth model. This is the title of our presentation today. Now, a couple disclaimers. I believe the earth is a, f a, pl a flat plane. It's flat. I'm not a flat earther, but the earth is flat. It is a plane. Obviously, from all of the material I've published, I have studied this topic intensely for many years. I've written a book on this in 2021. This is my book here. It's called Don't Let the, the Devil Boil Your, Boil Your Frog. And of course, it's got one of those Q memes on there, but you know, the Q is the devil, a Christian's guide to the great awakening. So this book is on my website. You can have it for free if you're a member. Um, I think it's also on Amazon, but either way, the point is this documents that I was into this stuff several years ago. So I've been documenting. I'm not a, you know, because uh, people will right away say, oh, he's probably undercover shill or whatever else. No, I'm not. I believe the earth is flat. I have an entire chapter dedicated to it in this book. This is in 2021. 
I've made flat earth videos. And of course I have no agenda. I really don't. My agenda is always as to the best of my ability, the truth. And hopefully you see that as well. The other thing I want to say is if you have answers to the problems presented in this presentation or theories or evidence, feel free to email me. I'd be curious just to learn and see what, you know, like for example, there's um, a friend, Neil, and we'll be citing some of his work in this particular presentation, who lives in Colorado, amateur photographer, and he and I have talked quite a bit about this. And he submitted a lot of photos and stuff, and we've looked at them together and talked, and it's fun to do that. So if you have the equipment, if you have answers to these things, feel free to either post them in the Fennec Fox chat or email me, and we can get a conversation going because I think that's really all that we have. We don't have billions of dollars of budget like NASA. We have equipment now better than, of course, we had 50 years ago, like the Nikon P1000s and so on and telescopes available. But ultimately, we really have to do this as a grassroots thing if we want more evidence. Because some of the problems here can be probably investigated by a group of people in different parts of the world with, with equipment, and then we can all compare notes and so on. So anyway, just something to realize that I first am not a flat earther. Number two, I believe the earth is flat. I believe in biblical cosmology. And today you will really understand what that really means. Because biblical cosmology, like all things, is the narrow road between two dialectic, dialectical schemes. On your left hand, you have the globe. On your right hand, you have the flat earth movement. Both of these are designed to pull you away from the truth, which is much more mysterious, as always, and it's the narrow path. And so I'm a biblical cosmologist. That's what I am. I'm not a flat earther. So moving on, the goals of this presentation are... First and foremost, for you to question, for you to question the narrative and to think and expand your horizons, to be curious, to dig a little deeper. We're going to examine some serious problems with the circular flat earth model, and we're also going to consider an alternative. And at the end of the day, regardless of all of this, folks, my goal is that you marvel at the brilliance of the creator. That's my goal really, because I don't think we can answer some of these things. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I really am. The mystery, I think we are designed to marvel at mysteries, not to put them all in a nice, neat little box and say, this is how it works. Again, just in a little side note, this PowerPoint is included for you to download if you want to use it. Feel free to erase some of these slides if they don't serve your purposes. But either way, here's the outline of the presentation. These are the 15 points. Number one is going to be speed of the sun and the moon. Number two is winter solstice, sunrise and sunsets. We're going to look at Enoch's gates. We'll look at daylight hour problems. We'll look at the sun's path. We'll look at the green flash. We'll look at uh, light underneath planes. Number eight will be flight patterns. Number nine is going to be northern and southern similarities. Number 10 is Polaris. Number 11 is going to be moon in two places at once, which is an interesting phenomenon. There's the, the upside down moon which is another problem, the moon map. A lot of things with the moon also that really just tell you that we cannot be living on a circle. We'll look at the dome and the firmament, and of course we'll close with how the flat earth movement is definitely controlled opposition, and there's so many red flags of that. Now in Proverbs 25 verse 2, this is the Masoretic text, so either way, but I think it's a nice translation. It says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a manner. Now, whether in the Septuagint, it's a little different, whether or not which one is the actual translation, I think that this still applies, is my point. If you've seen my Masoretic um, PSYOP documentary, then you know, there's certainly reason to be doubting the Old Testament in the Masoretic. But either way, I think this also applies. It is the glory of God to reveal his mysteries and the, and the, the honor of a king, meaning somebody who's a leader, somebody who's curious, who's taking initiative, who's wanting to draw near to God, not just a lemming, right? You consciously want more of that mystery. It's an honor for kings to search it out. There's this dance. There's this dance being portrayed to you in this particular proverb, which is that God is the creator, and he's mysterious, and we're seeking him out, and we're finding about him through the things that he's created. There's this dance. There's this dance of investigation. So that's the dance that I want to invite you in today with this presentation. Now, let's start with number one, which is the uh, speed of the sun and the moon. 
So right off the bat, you have a, a real problem with the circle because the tropic horn, the tro the tropic horn, the tropic of Capricorn, is much larger than the tropic of Cancer, and you're going to see this continually. In the sense that the problem of the circle is that as you go outward south, meaning towards the edge, the map becomes everything becomes extremely distorted and and it breaks down it breaks down logically this is one of the first things that happens which is that because the tropic of capricorn is much bigger than the tropic of cancer you have a distortion of time so think about it this way here's the sun with my little cursor as moving around the tropic of cancer okay supposedly this is the limit to where the sun on the flat earth moves and we know that, that that these tropics are as far north and south as the sun goes at noon, that you can see it overhead. So there's something to that. But either way, let's say here's the sun, right? And in 24 hours, it completes a revolution around the Earth. Well, you have a real problem because it's if it's out here at the Tropic of Capricorn, now you have to do this giant circle in 24 hours. So something has to be different, and namely the speed. Based on the sizes, rough estimate, but it's it's a good approximation. You have a 70% longer distance between these two these two paths. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the sun has to travel 70% faster than it does when it's on the Tropic of um, Cancer, and so does the moon, by the way. But you don't see that. We don't see that when when we're in the northern hemisphere and it's winter time, meaning the sun is out here in the Tropic of Capricorn. You don't observe the sun moving 70% faster in the sky. And so this is a problem. You also see this problem with the one hour equals 35 minutes in the north. So basically, again, this is how time zones totally break down with this model, because in the southern hemisphere, as the Tropic of Capricorn is being traversed, because again, the distances aren't the same. You're dealing with a circle, a bigger circle and a smaller circle. Well, time zone wise, the sun traveling this distance is an hour versus this distance would be 35 minutes because these are, t these are going from a center outward, these lines. There's an angle here. It's not straight. Does that make sense? Because of this angle, they're not proportional. You see the distance here. Let me see if we can, the distance on this curve, this part of the curve of the circle, on the Tropic of um, ca Cancer. Gosh, it's so hard to get those two in your mind all the time. In the Tropic of Capricorn, there are two different lengths. You see that? Meaning th there are different times. This is 35 minutes, whereas this is an hour. It doesn't make sense. So this is a major problem for the circle. Equidistant locations receive the same amount of sunlight on summer solstice. What does that mean? That means that places that are equally distant from the equator receive the same amount of sunlight on the summer solstice. They, see, they receive the same amount of sunlight. For example, Beirut, Lebanon, versus Sydney, Australia, which are both 33 degrees from the equator. They both receive 14 hours on the summer solstice. Swansea, Wales, and Rio Gallegos, Argentina, 51 degrees from the equator. They get 16 hours of sunlight. This is impossible on a flat earth model. And you'll see some animations in some future sections. We'll, we'll take a look at some things. We'll watch a very nice video at the end that really ties all these points together. I haven't seen anybody really talk about this. I've seen two videos. The one I'm going to, one of them we'll see at the end. We'll watch the whole thing. It's about 20 minutes. It's a great video. The only video I've seen. Now, I lied. There's three. There's three, but we're not going to watch the third one because the third one's a series of videos and the guy, we'll, we'll look at his picture of his model for this, but I'm not super convinced. And it's a lot of content also. It's like 15 hours worth of stuff. There's the one that we're gonna watch at the end. And then there's another guy named Richard, Kahl Richard Kahlberg, who doesn't seem to be making videos anymore. He's an engineer. He made some flat earth videos for a while, but he stopped. And then we'll, we'll watch a clip from one of his videos talking about the Masonic connections to uh, the Gleason map. And I can't find the full video anymore. It seems like he, he either took it down or it was taken down or something. So I only have just that clip left. But either way, th that's it. Nobody's talking about the stuff you're going to be hearing in this presentation.
But either way, you'll see this more and more as we go, is that it is impossible to create these daylight hours uh, on a circle map. Because what happens is you have too much, either too much light or too little. And you'll understand why as we go along, because light comes out of a source in a spherical pattern. And of course, the CGI model of the flat Earth tells you it's in an oval pattern, which is just nonsense. Now, the question is, what about relativity? In the sense that if, if the sun is farther away, like in the winter, if we go back to this little map here, if the sun is here, you know, it's about 3,000 whatever miles away from you than it is in the Tropic of Cancer, doesn't it stand to reason that if it's going faster, you wouldn't really notice it because it's farther away? Well, yes and no. The, 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 ang the angular size is the problem. Angular size is always the problem. And angular size is objective. Angular size is the size at which something appears in your visual field. If it moves farther away, it gets smaller, which is true. So yes, that's true that if something moves farther away and it's moving at a faster speed, depending on how far it is, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell, you know, if, if it's moving faster, if it went far away enough. This is true. However, the angular size of the sun is not significant from summer to winter. It looks the same, which is another puzzling thing because that would, the, the, the angular size has to change. If it, if the distance is going that far, 3,000 plus whatever miles between these two um, tropics, then the angular size should change. It doesn't really change. The sun does not get like smaller. And that's another thing we'll look at as well, but it doesn't really change significantly and the speed stays the same. If the speed stays the same, the angular size has to change. One of, the, one of them has to change. It can't be the same. It can't have the same size and it's moving 70% faster. That doesn't work. So the point is because we don't see the, the angular size change, and we don't see the speed change, then something is not clicking. Either the sun should get way smaller and the speed in the sky as it moves across should look the same to you. Okay, then that would be a support for the idea that it's on this giant ring compared to the smaller ring. That would be support, but it's not. The sun is the same size in the sky relative to, you know, like summer. And the speed is the same. So that means it's not going 70% faster, which means it's it's impossible for it to be doing what it's doing on a circle map. Do you understand? It can't be doing that giant uh, track. Now, another problem is that the sun and moon appear to, bo to move faster at the equator. This, we need some empirical evidence for this. Certainly, uh, this is a claim. And of course, the ball explains it with different rotation speeds that the earth is rotating at a thousand miles an hour or whatever at the equator. And it, little bit less at the tops, and so you can't really see it. You, that's why you see the difference and so on. So, of course, they have conjectures that they're explaining it with, which make no sense. But if this is actually the case, that if we can empirically test that at the equator, the sun and the moon move faster than they do, let's say, you know, I don't know, at 50 degrees latitude or something like that, then that also is a major problem for the circle, because that doesn't make any sense. Because again, if we go back to our little circle map, here's our circle map. Here's the equator between these two lines. If this is the fastest one and these two are slower, how does that work? That does not work on a circle map whatsoever. So if you live in different parts of the world, like if you live in Australia or you live in New Zealand or these places that are a little bit south, measure, I don't know how you would do that, how you would you know, calculate the speed of the sun moving across the sky or the moon. But it would be very interesting to get some empirical data on this and to see and to compare it with each other and to see, okay, well, Australia is the same as, you know, Colorado. And if we can find somebody on the equator that can do this, then we can say, okay, well, obviously there is a difference. And the question is, if, why is there that difference? Of course, we can speculate some answers today, but if that's the case, then again, that's another proof that we're not living on a circle. So speed, is, speed of the sun and moon summary. We're gonna have a little summary slide for each of these situations. On a circle, the farther you go outside, the, the greater the distance you travel. That makes sense. The farther outside of the circle, the greater the diameter of that circle. And so that means the path has to be longer, meaning the sun and the moon have to travel faster the farther they go out on the circle. 
We don't observe that because the angular size doesn't change, the speed doesn't change in the sky, so that means it's not moving 70% faster. And this alone, from the get-go, disproves that you're living on a circle. It's impossible. But there's more. Number two, this is winter solstice, sunrise, and sunset directions. This is another flat Earth killer. And again, I believe the Earth is flat. But we have to walk the narrow road here, folks, and not get sidetracked into distractions because the flat Earth movement is a psyop. This is a graph, a graphic of the approximate sunrise directions. Basically, the sun, if you didn't know, oscillates. If you look towards the east, right, the sun only rises directly centered east uh, at the equinoxes. Throughout the year, it oscillates in its position where, wherever it is basically either on towards the northeast or the southeast. So, for example, as of the time of this recording, um, it is, what is it, October something, October 18th, I'm recording this. So, we're after the equinox, meaning we're going towards the uh, winter solstice. So, the sun is starting to rise more southeast, 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 southeast. And then eventually, it's going to come back, work its way back, and then it's going to come to the east again by March. Then from March to June, it's going to start rising in the northeast. So again, if you look towards the east, in general, the idea is that this thing oscillates where it rises and sets. Of course, it sets in the opposite, which is the west. So northwest, west directly, and then southwest. Now, that seems fairly straightforward, but this is a major problem. A major, major problem for the circle. And we'll see why. Again, this is uh, the, the position changes. They move oscillating west and northwest. This is the sunset. This is a major problem because they oscillate throughout the year. And what this means is that it rises and sets in the northern sky during the summer for the northern hemisphere and winter, and winter in the southern hemisphere and rises and sets in the southern sky during the summer of the southern hemisphere and the winter of the northern hemisphere. The problem may not seem obvious just yet, but we have a little graphic to look at. But both of these represent real problems for the flat Earth model being on a circle. Here's why. These little dotted lines are basically representing how the sun should rise and set in the southern hemisphere during the winter. It's not possible for the sunrise and sunset to come from the south and exit in the south on a circle map. You can test this for yourself. These places like Australia, you know, uh, what is it, Johannesburg, in Chile and Argentina, these people during the winter, just like you and I up here in the northern hemisphere, experience a southern southeast rise and a southwest sunset. That's not possible because on this map, the sun, here's a little dot, you can see always comes from the north. Here's Australia, right? Here's Australia. This is north. You see? This is northwest it's going. So it came from the east, northeast, northwest. Australia can never see a southeast sunrise going to the southwest. It's impossible on a circle. Not possible. And yet this is what people observe. And you don't notice this because you're in the northern hemisphere. Most people in the world live in the northern hemisphere. And so they're very easy to deceive with this whole circular flat earth thing because, oh yeah, sure, there's no problem. Well, yeah, there's no problem for you for the sun to rise. In Here's the northern hemisphere. Let's say we're here in America. It's flipped around, but anyway. Here's, here's the east, right? Coming, the sun comes from here and exits this way. Well, if you're like, you know, like Colorado or Phoenix or something, yeah, you, it could come for you like when it's in the Tropic of, uh, what do you call it? Um, even the pr Tropic of Cancer, it's still south of you. You see that? The Tropic of Cancer is still south of the United States. So when the sun supposedly comes on it, you could argue that, well, yeah, that's how it works because it, it's, it's uh, during the winter, it's even more south. It's over here. So it appears south, uh, southeast and it, it sets southwest. See that? But that's not how it works. 
Because in the Southern Hemisphere, it's doing the same thing, and you can't have that. You don't notice it in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, Northern Hemisphere has other problems too, as you will soon find out. Time and date shows Southeast sunrise and sunset. So if you go to timeanddate.com, and these aren't fabricated numbers, folks. These are real numbers. This is impossible on a circle. This is Rio Gallegos. This is Southern Argentina. This is December 22nd, I believe this year. So if you see, if you go to timeanddate.com, go to this uh, winter solstice, where does the sun rise and set? Well, it rises 131 degrees southeast, sets 229 degrees southwest. That is 41 degrees south of east that it's uh, sunrise is happening. That is almost 45 degrees at a 45 degree angle south of east. That's an extreme south. There's no way that's happening on a circle. It's impossible. Same thing with sunset, 41 degrees south of west sunset. How does that work on a circle? It doesn't. The, the truth is that it doesn't. If you're honest with the data, it really doesn't. And there, see, there's not... People live here, folks. This is not fabricated data. People live here. So this is what happens. The Northern Hemisphere also doesn't make sense. So even though we most people live in the Northern Hemisphere and they don't realize the problem with this whole southeast and west uh, sunrise, sunset, there's also problems with northeast and northwest uh, sunrise and sunset. And I'll give you some examples. Phoenix, here where I live, is north of the Tropic of Cancer. All right, if we go back to our little flat earth map, here's America. And this, this yellow line here is the Tropic of Cancer. So we're north. Here's Mexico. We're north of this line. Okay? So uh, where are we at here? We're north of it. When I walk out, for example, during the summer, and I look at the sky... The sun is above us, always in the southern sky, always. It's like if it's the summer solstice, it's pretty close to overhead, it seems like, but it's still south. Like you could look up at the, uh, towards east, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, you're looking basically towards the south and it's going, going to be in front of you. If you turn around, you look towards the north and you look up, it's not, you're not going to see the sun. So that still checks out. However, you have a major problem. You have a major problem, and that problem is sunrise and sunset. Because during those warmer months, like the summer, the sun rises very, very far in the north. And it sets also far in the northwest, which doesn't make any sense at all. Here's some sample data. This is um, August 22nd, 2024 of this year. And it's in Phoenix. Remember, Phoenix is north of the Tropic of Cancer, right? So here's the sunrise. It was at 61 degrees east-northeast. Sunset was 299 degrees west-northwest. Total is about 29 degrees north of east, 29 degrees north of west. That doesn't make any sense. If, again, if you go back to this map, little flat earth map, here's... <laughs> approximately, Phoenix. How can you have, how can this line be south of Phoenix and yet it's rising, you know, from this angle here and setting in this, it doesn't make sense. You'll see an even more extreme example with like Iceland. Let's see. Yeah, this can initially be explained away by circular orbits. Of course, people could say, well, you know, it's coming, it's coming around and it's coming from the Northeast relative to you, you'll see that's another problem with the circular flat earth model is that it's relative. If people, we make fun of the globe being relativistic. It's a circle is the same thing. It's a relativistic model. There's no objective east, west, and south. But either way, despite that, you still have several problems. The sun moves in a straight line. We'll look at that. So it can't be going in a circular path. That's another huge problem. The Southern Hemisphere completely breaks down this theory that it's going on a circle. So either way, you have a problem. If you're going to cling to the idea that, well, it's the circle that's explaining the northeast, northwest uh, sunrise, sunset. Well, yeah, but how does that work with the Southern Hemisphere? It doesn't. And of course, we have more extreme examples in the Northern Hemisphere um, that prove to you that's not possible. Here's Iceland, 822. So this is the same day as Phoenix. August 20, August 22nd, 2024, 
61 degrees east northeast sunrise, 299 degrees west northwest sunset. So it's the same exact angles as Phoenix. And now you're going to see the real problem. Maybe it's not so obvious with Phoenix, but it's going to be very obvious with Iceland. It is not possible on a circular uh, on a circular map of the Earth with a circular path of the sun. Here's time and date, the data. You can see for yourself. You can check for this for yourself. These are real points of data, folks. People live here. Okay, no, Nobody's going to... If this was falsified and it was totally different, do you think nobody would speak up by now? It's, it's nonsense. These are real times and dates. So here's the problem. Here's what we're looking at. On this relativistic model of a circle, here's Iceland, where you can't really kind of see it because there's a dot, but there's Iceland right next to Greenland, okay? And these are rough approximations, but the problem is, you know, relative to Iceland, here's the, here's the x-axis and the y-axis, right? Here's east, and here's north and south, right? Pointing towards the supposed North Pole. Here's your axis. So this is the axis of Iceland. So according to this axis, if you have a, what is it, 29 degrees? Yeah, 29 degrees uh, from east. So this is east and west relative to Iceland. Then these angles, which are approximate, but these are about the angles that you'd have to sun, you'd have to have the sun rising and setting from. The question is, how can this create 16 hours of daylight? Because Iceland gets 16 hours of daylight during that time. If we go back to time and date, the sunrise is at 5.41 a.m. The sunset is at 9.17 p.m. That's 12, yeah, almost 16 hours of light. 16 hours of light. Go back to this model. Look at this. The sun, based on these positions, if it's on this circle, again, these are rough approximations, but, you know, it, it, it's illustrated enough to where it tells you the problem. The sun is only halfway through its little orbit, supposedly. How can this create 16 hours of light? And if it does, you have other problems because if the, if the light from the sun is so big and it's got this giant aura that it's covering this little piece of Iceland for 16 hours, then every other place would suffer and have way too much light. Doesn't work. This is nonsense. This, you see, the northern hemisphere is also a problem. You can't tell with, with things like maybe Phoenix, which is over here, which is more neutral. It's closer to the Tropic of Cancer. But Iceland is much farther from the Tropic of Cancer. And you cannot have these north, uh, northwesterly and northeasterly sunrise-sunset angles. You can't. How does that work with, with this model? The answer is it doesn't work. So things break down even in the north with um, circular orbits. Again, you have too much light if the sun is traveling from these extreme angles. Because again, we'll, we'll show you some graphics in the future. The light from a source is spherical. So it has to cover other places too if, it, if it's trying to reach Iceland and keep Iceland in the light for 16 hours. It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. The circle also doesn't have straight east to west, which is also complicating things and making things relativistic and really stupid, to be honest. We'll look at that again, because if you're going to rag on the globe for being relativistic, you have to see the relativism in your own model. The flat earth model is a relativistic model. You have one quote unquote objective direction, which is north, but even north is not objective. It's not. If you think about it, my north is not the same north as somebody else, because relative to me, if we go back to this model, here's Phoenix, okay? Here's north for Phoenix, right? Well, Iceland going this way, for me, it would be going west. It doesn't make sense. It's all relativistic because it's circle, occult nonsense as usual. But either way, the sun can't have these angles because both the northern and, se and southern hemisphere break down for different reasons. The, the sunlight in the northern hemisphere breaks. It's much more obvious like the, uh, the farther north you go like with Iceland. There's no way you can create these daylight hours. There's no way that the sun can be on such extreme paths and make its 24-hour uh, route. It just doesn't happen. And the Southern Hemisphere is very obvious because you can't, because it's so distorted that if you have any Southern uh, sunrise or sunset, it's not going to work. It's impossible. And yet this is what we see. So how can the sun rise in the north if it's local and you live north of the limit? That's another question, right? I live north 
of the Tropic of Cancer. A lot of people do. But how can the sun rise north of that? That doesn't make any sense to me, especially if it's traveling in a straight line. How can the sun rise south of the southern limit, i.e. the Tropic of Capricorn, and set in the south? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The circle map on the surface, sleight of hand, seems to explain a lot of situations because, again, most people live in the northern hemisphere and the extremes like Australia and Iceland, Argentina, you know, nobody really talks about them, but people live there, folks. People live there and if you look at the extremes, it doesn't pan out. It doesn't work. Even on a square orientation, which we're going to be looking at today, it's not clear how this would work. Of course, the globe explains this with tilt and, and a huge sun far away and all sorts of conjectures, but it's not true. We know that. So we need more information. We need more data. We need more. We need better science, to be honest. We need a better model. Uh, and of course, some things we may not be able to answer, and that's okay. So winter, summer, solstice, uh, sunrise, sunset, summary. The oscillation of sunrise and sunset is not possible on a circle map. Remember, the sun, as you look direct east, it rises directly east on the equinoxes, and then it oscillates to the south or to the north, depending on which solstice it's going to. That's not possible on a circle map. The southern hem hemisphere breaks down very easily. And of course, the northern hemisphere also follows suit because places like Iceland have extreme north northerly and uh, northerly uh, sunrise and sunset, which is, it doesn't make sense given the layout of the circle. Refraction is probably at work, is my guess. We'll look at some other things about this. But the truth is probably much more complex than we can imagine how all this works. The circle map certainly doesn't explain reality, that's for sure. All right, let's talk about Enoch's gates. The book of Enoch talks about the gates for the sun and the moon. Now, this is an illustration. This isn't true in the sense that the, the sun arcs like this across the sky. We'll talk about this in a little bit. But the book of Enoch talks about these portals, basically, that the sun enters in and, and comes out, and it's it's going through these portals. Who knows what they are? The sun and moon do these things, and they have these gates, these tracks across the sky that it goes. And we'll talk more about these as well. Now, Enoch is not inspired scripture. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, in my uh, video on the Nephilim, I outline in great detail several reasons why it's not. However, the Enoch, the book of Enoch does reflect cultural understanding and what people were discussing and believed at the time. And it seems to align with reality. Because again, if you look at the sky, the moon is especially obvious. This is very obvious with the moon. If you watch the moon, it goes through these gates in the sky, meaning it rises here and then it rises there and then it rises there. It's much more drastic. You can see it going through these various gates because the moon does what the sun does in a year, it does that in a lunation period, 29.5 days. Whereas the sun, you know, it's, it's gradual, so it's hard to, to see it, you know, transition through these gates. Who knows how many there are? I don't know. But we know that the sun's path is straight over the sky, which we'll be looking at. And we know it's not a circle, so the only, only option left is that maybe it's doing something where it's teleporting. I don't know. We'll talk about this. But this... this uh, kind of illustrates it, but again, just remember the, the sun is not arcing over a dome like this. This is wrong. So we'll talk about that as well. Now there's a challenge here. It comes from Psalm 19. And it says, Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. A lot of people take this to mean that there's a circuit, meaning a circle above that the sun is going around like this, around and around. It's not what it's saying. It's not. People say that this, the word circuit and course prove that the sun moves in a circular track or a form or inside the firmament somehow, like those little flat earth animations, but this is not what's happening. See episode number three. We talk about this quite a bit. But circuit and course refer simply to the path of the sun. 
it does not mean a circular path. It just means the path, the course. The word circuit, which is translated in English, it's the, the word originally in the original language is not circular path. So we need to look at the original language because this is messed up in translation, as a lot of things are. So if you go to Psalm 19.6 in the interlinear, this word here, and it's circuit, tekupatau, you look it up, there's only one occurrence, and it's used here. So that alone should tell you, okay, if there's only, it's only used one time, then that I need to perk my ears up because that means that there's something special going on with this word. Maybe it's not exactly what it's been translated to be. If you go to Jesenius' Hebrew Chaldee Lexicon, which is a very useful resource for the Old Testament in original language, because Jesenius was a Hebrew scholar. He was, he was a Jew in the 1800s, I believe, and he, he compiled this lexicon, and he's got a lot of great things to say about these various words that maybe some things got lost in translation. But what he says on it, he says, circuit as of the sun, hence the course of time, of season, after the course of a year. So the point is that this word is used to, de to denote the course of something, the duration, the journey of the sun, not a circular path in the, in the sky. That's the wrong idea. If you go to 1 Samuel 7.16, and we look at words where they are describing circular paths, they're different words. This is 1 Samuel 7, 16, And he went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel. So on a circuit, right, this, this word is washabab, washabab. If you look it up, it's got three occurrences. It's used in 1 Samuel 7, 16, on a circuit to Bethel. It's used in 2 Chronicles 33, 14. And he encircled Ophel. And it's used in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 14. He came to it, surrounded it, and constructed some buildings. So all of these usages for this word, and it's used three times, are used to denote a circular path. Either going on a circuit to these various cities in, in a circular path, or he encircled a particular town, or he surrounded it. So circular pathway. This is the word that's used. It's not used in Psalm 19, 4 through 6. It's a different word used, and that word, again, is used only once to denote the course of something, the entire course of the sun, meaning the from point A to point B. It's not telling you that point A to point B is a circle. It's telling you this is the course of the sun. If you look at the meanings uh, of this particular word that we just looked at, wasabab, I think, or washabab, maybe, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it says to turn, to turn around, or aside, or back, or towards, go about, or around, to surround, to encircle, to change direction. So this word has to do with circular paths, to encircle something, to turn around and around and about. It has circular meanings. If it was this word being used in Psalm 19, then there would be an argument from the original language. There isn't. That's not the word being used. So the word for circuit in the English is misleading. It doesn't suggest, or I should say it suggests the wrong picture. And a lot of flat earthers use that in the wrong way. They've been deceived by it. You have to look at the original language. You have to do a deep dive. The original language word does not mean circular path, surrounding, and circling, etc. It just means the course of something or the completion of a path. Another way to render it would probably be better in this way. Its journey is from one side of heaven to the other, would be more accurate, meaning its path, which is what we see, right? We see the sun rise <laughs> in one end of the heaven, it goes to the other, and then the next day it comes back. How does that happen? That's going to be our topic today. It's a mystery, really, I think, but that's what it's describing here, the mystery of the sun's path going overhead. It emerges from its chamber like a bridegroom, and it runs its course with joy. Its circuit is from one heaven, one end of the heavens to the other. You see the point? From one end of the heavens to the other. That's the circuit, meaning, again, the English is not well translated there. But its circuit, its journey, its path is from one place of the heavens to the other, one end to the other. But then how does it come back again? That's a good question. That's a very good question. So, summary for Enoch's Gates. 
Enoch describes two things, tracks of the sun and the moon, which aligns with reality because the sun you'll see and the moon go on different tracks. And we saw that from the east and west, sunrise and sunset. The moon does that too, by the way, but it does that in a month. Those little slices of northeast and northwest sunrise, sunset, the moon does that too, but it does that in a month. So Enoch seems to align with reality in that sense. It also describes portals for the sun and the moon, which again, with the moon, it's more obvious because the moon is quicker. And so it jumps through these things a little. You can test it for yourself. Put put a observation towards the east and, and catch the moon and watch it go through these tracks, basically. One minute it's there, the next night it's a little slightly over and then slightly over and so on and so forth. And in an entire month, it goes through an entire oscillation, which is really interesting. But these tracks are parallel tracks, which is very important. And of course, this matches reality because the sun and moon travel on a straight line. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. Psalm 19, which people use as support for this circular movement of the sun, is, is not telling you that the earth moves or the sun moves in a circle. It's not describing a circular track, but a journey from one place to another. The original language does not describe the circular track. The word used there is not the word that is used in several other places where the Bible is specifically describing a literal encircling or going around and about and so on and so forth. That's not the word used. So the circle map does not have biblical support. It doesn't match reality. And there's no way to explain any of these things on a circle. Now let's talk about daylight hour, hours. Big problem is that daylight hours of various places are impossible to create on a circle map. Because again, day, the light from a source is a circle. It's a sphere. You don't have oblong light. That doesn't happen. Light emanates from a source in a spherical pattern, equidistant from the source. That's a real problem for the circle. For example, Sydney, Johannesburg, Santiago all have 10 hours on June 21st. How does that work? 12 hours of sunlight in all places on the equinox. 24 hours of sunlight in Antarctica. And of course, there are some fake videos on this, but they're also real ones, folks. And in fact, I think at the time of this video, they're, they're going to coordinate some you know, flat earth trip with, with globers and flat earthers, and they're going to go to Antarctica, and they're going to see if they can see the 24-hour sun. And, you know, if they do film it, then that's destructive to the flat earth model. Th they'll try to argue refraction and so on, but that's, that's nonsense. It doesn't work. This is the map. This is the problem. Light is spherical. So if you're trying to enlarge it to get, you know, more coverage for, for how much light comes from this source, then the whole earth is going to have much more light as a whole, because your sun source is moving around this thing, and now it's giving way too much light. If it's too little, then it's too little. So this is the problem, because again, this doesn't work on a circle, and because light is spherical. You have these newer models, like the flat earth map, that show you how it works in a CGI model, but this is no different than all the NASA globe stuff, folks. Like, you can get this app. I have this on my phone just to be able to play with it. But, you know, these these data, these data daylight hours work in the sense that they produce, this produces the light patterns that are correct. However, light doesn't work this way. Light does not work in an oval from a source. That's nonsense. Light doesn't work in a half of a circle from a source. Light doesn't work in this weird you know, crescent moon type of shit. This is nonsense. And people look at it and say, oh, I see this is how it works. No, it's not. This is a CGI model using daylight hours and superimposing them on a circular orientation. This is no different than what NASA does. Literally no different. And of course, the globe memes that are making fun of these flat earthers make sense. They do. We have to give it to them. Again, I believe the earth is totally flat. You cannot change my mind on that. I'm completely convinced. But these memes make sense. Look at this. This is, here's the sun. And somebody's in Johannesburg, Africa. Here's somebody in, you know, Hawaii, so to speak, where they, they can't see anything. And then there's somebody in Antarctica that can see the sun. This makes absolutely no sense. And they're right. This is devastating. And so we need a better model. You need to let go of this model and realize that 
you're being baited into accepting something because most people can't handle a mystery. Do you understand? This is how the devil gets you. With everything. Anywhere where you can't handle the mystery and say, I don't know. I want to marvel at this mystery. I don't know how it works. I don't know how the Trinity works. If you can't handle that and say, well, it can't be possible that God exists multipersonally. So it must be that Jesus is sort of inferior and the Father is kind of unseen, but he's, he's the source. And you know, the Holy Spirit is maybe just a force between them and all this kind of stuff. If you can't handle the mystery, you're going to drift into error. Guaranteed. So this is how the flat earth gets people is that they, they want an explanation for things and they're given this goofy explanation because they can't handle a mystery and then they get refuted and dis discredited. So we have to be a little smarter. How can the sun have an oblong or oval light? That is not possible. Reproduce that. Reproduce that. Give me a light source and show me that it produces light in these weird patterns somehow. It doesn't make sense. We make fun of NASA's oblong orbits with their planets, which are impossible. But this is the same thing. This It's the same thing. If you want to make fun of NASA saying that the Earth moves around the sun in an ellipse pattern where it can't, it can't do that. Nothing goes in an ellipse pattern if there's only one foci. Then how are you going to believe in an ellipse, elliptical light pattern emanating from a source? That doesn't make any sense. If refraction off the dome is the cause, do we have experimental proof that this can happen? If the sun is outside the dome, we need more proof that the sun is moving to produce these patterns. How does this work? I have a video, I think in my, what is it, episode number one maybe, where I took, I, I bought a lens. I bought a lens from like a big lens off Amazon for reading, you know, various documents and you shine a light through it and you can, you know, you can kind of produce these same effects. But again, there's a problem with that. If the sun is outside the dome, and again, this is a, this would be a glass lens. Or, you know, we're not living in glass. We're living in an atmosphere. That's something we'll talk about too with the firmament. It, it doesn't quite match up. You, you would need to, to reproduce this and, and really have a lot of empirical evidence that this is possible. Because these are just math models, just like NASA. Now let's talk about the problem of light intensity. This is the inverse square law of light, which is just fancy word for basically the farther away from the light source you are, the less intense the light is. But the intensity is exponential. Like when I used to do red light therapy, I had these giant panels that I would stand in front of. And you have to stand, you know, like three inches away from them. Because if you stood, you know, let's say two feet away, the benefits would drop off exponentially. And of course, the problem was finding some panels that didn't emanate enormous amounts of EMFs because these things take a lot of power. So if you're standing too close, you're also getting radiated by EMF. So there's that. But anyway, I found some good ones. I think it was by, was it Juve? No, it was, I forget the brand now. But anyway, there's an article on my website about it. Either way, red light therapy, that's where I learned about the inverse square law. And this is very important for this discussion because, again, light in this graphic diminishes in intensity and heat in incredibly by the, by the square of the distance, meaning the farther you are, the exponentially less the intensity is of the light. That makes sense, right? Here's another graphic because of the square of the, the surface area that the light is being over. So up here when you're close, the light is more concentrated. That makes sense. If you're farther away, the light, the same amount of light is being dispersed over the uh, surface area that's, you know, much more surface area than at the beginning. So this is the inverse square law, meaning the farther you are away, the more the light has to be dispersed. And so it's less intense. That's common sense, common sense observation. But if the light decreases exponentially as you go away from a source, then this is a huge problem for a flat earth model with a local sun. It's a problem even for like a square model. It's a problem for any orientation where the earth is the infinite plane or the big plane that you're on and the sun is a local light source traversing above. It's a real problem because seasons and daylight and everything that we've talked about come into question because of this physical law. For example, this is some data again from my part of town. This is August 18th. And the sunrise is at 5.53 a.m. And the sunset 
is at 7.10 p.m. So sunrise, sunset. Now we're going to take these numbers and we're going to go into our Flat Earth app and we're going to see where does it, according to their CGI model, where does the sun have to be? Now, again, they produce the daylight hours correctly. If you see, for example, here, here's Phoenix, supposedly, right at the edge of the morning. So they produce the daylight hours correctly because, again, they're just taking the numbers and plotting them into a circular map with, you know, with CGI. So they're producing the daylight correctly. Doesn't mean that the sun's behaving this way, but this, the daylight is correct. So, okay, let's put it in the Flat Earth map. This is 5.53 a.m. This is 7.11 p.m. And you can see where the sun is on these two positions. Then you, tie, you tap your finger on there. You get the coordinates approximately. Of course, it's not super exact, but it's a good enough estimate. And then you take those coordinates and you plug them into a coordinate calculator. And you see, okay, the distance between these two points is about 10,351 miles that the, that the sun has to travel. Okay, this is a very important point, so pay attention. Now, if we go to Google Earth and we just double check it and see what does the Google Earth have to say about it? Well, the Google Earth says it's about 10,329 miles. So given 30 miles for user error because of the coordinate systems, okay, we're going to assume that these two are in agreement. So both the Gleason map, flat Earth model, based on the coordinates that it gave me, and the Google map says that this is 10,000 uh, whatever miles according. But again, one thing I'm going to say is this. The Gleason map, this is very important also. The Gleason map gave me these coordinates correctly. And if I type in the coordinates, it gives me the same number that Google Earth gives me. Again, there's about 30 miles difference. That's just my own user error. That's a margin of error. However, it doesn't mean that this distance on this flat earth representation of the circle is represented correctly. And you'll see what I mean by that. This is not 10,000 miles because the, the diameter of this circle, the flat earth Gleason circle is about 24,000 miles. Okay. So 24,000 miles, that means that the diameter of the equator, let's say the equator is at 6,000 miles, which is around here somewhere. 6,000 miles. The diameter of the equator is, I believe, about 6,000 miles away from the North Pole, assuming, let's just say, because it's halfway there, right? Halfway through the circle. So let's recap really quick. This circle is 24,000 miles in diameter. The equator is 6,000 miles, meaning halfway around the circle. 6,000 miles, meaning the radius of this would be 6,000, meaning the diameter of this smaller circle, where the equator would be the edge, would be 12,000 miles. Okay, if you do the circumference of that calculation of the circle with 12,000 mile diameter, it's about 37,000 miles, I believe, something like that. Meaning, half of the circumference of that circle would be about 18,000 miles, give or take, or maybe 13,000 miles, I forget. It's, it's greater than this circle, and this circle is almost on the equator. You don't have to, it, maybe all these numbers are flying over your head, but the point is this, this is not represented accurately. Because on this circle, because things get distorted as they go outward, a line like this, even though they gave me the correct coordinates, because they're using, you know, globe math, basically, or whatever the data that we have, let's put it that way. They gave the correct coordinates, and those coordinates are the same as Google Earth, in a coordinate calculator because they're using data from whatever databases. They're all using the same data. But the question is, is it represented accurately on the circle map? It's not. On the circle map, this line should be something like 14,000 miles, give or take. It shouldn't be 10,351. That's my point. That's the roundabout way of getting to it, is that this line is not 10,351 miles, meaning it's not represented correctly. The distance between these two points is 10,351 miles, approximately. But on the Gleason map, it's not represented accurately. This should be much bigger, which is even more of a problem, as you will soon see. So anyway, what's the point of this? The average lumens at noon, meaning when the sun is above you, is about 100,000 lumens, meaning light intensity. The average lumens at sunrise and sunset is about 400. The distance that the sun traveled from sunrise to, to noon so let's go back to our little circle. 
from sunrise here all the way to noon, meaning halfway in its path, right? When it's overhead is, what is it? 5,000, 5,175 approximately, give or take, right? But about 5,000 miles. This means, very important now, that from noon to sunset, where the lumens drop from 100,000 lumens lighting up the world to 400 lumens, a little nightlight, if that, there's a 99.5% change in light and light intensity based off a of distance of 500 and uh, 5,175 miles. So from, back to our map, from the distance that the sun travels from here all the way to here, supposedly, right? Halfway, this is noon. This distance, when it's recovered back to sunset or even sunrise, because these two points are sunrise and sunset, the difference between the increase in light and decrease in light is 99.5%, meaning most of the light is gone between these two points. So we can then take that as a reference and say, okay, over a distance of 5,000 miles, the light decreases by 99%. Because again, on a flat earth with a local light source, all you have, especially a circular flat earth where you're relying on the sun to go in a circle, the argument is that, well, sunset happens because of perspective, because the sun is just moving farther away from you. Okay, if that's the case, let's see how far does it have to travel for the lumens to go down to zero, which is about approximately a little over 5,000 miles, let's say, give or take, in this example. 5,000 miles for light to go from maximum intensity to zero intensity. 5,000 miles. Okay, well, that's a real problem because that doesn't work. It doesn't work on a circle, and that's easy to prove. We go back to our two tropics again. The distance between these two tropics is about 3,200 miles. Now, 3,200 miles, going back to our previous calculation, if the sun's intensity changes by 99% over a distance of 5,000 miles, give or take, then when the sun is away from you in the winter, going on the winter solstice, which is 3,200 miles away from the Tropic of Cancer, then that's 60% of that distance already made for you in the winter time. Do you understand the problem here? The, the serious problem? Arguing that the sun sets because of perspective? If that's the case, and it's only the sun's distance that is causing the change in light and all this stuff, if that's the, if the, only, if that's the only variable, then during the winter, there should be a 60% drop in light because the sun is farther away, right? The sun is 60% of that distance that it travels for sunset. Does this make sense? So you can't argue that it's just perspective. We don't see this. We don't see that the light during the winter solstice is 60% dimmer than it is during the summer solstice. It doesn't make sense. The light intensity is still there. The heat is different, which is interesting, but the light, the lumens are the same amount, relatively speaking. On a clear day, on the winter solstice, on the summer solstice, the lumens are relatively the same. It's not a 60% difference because the sun is, you know, 3,200 miles away on the Tropic of Capricorn. doesn't make sense, folks. If the sun was setting just because it's moving away from you farther, farther away, don't you think it would make sense that when it's moved away from you during the winter solstice, which is 60% of that distance anyway from noon to sunset, that you should see a drastically obvious change in luminosity because of the inverse square law of light. And yet we don't see that. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is something much more mysterious. The sun is setting, but how that happens, I have no clue. Here's another issue. Morning light is more blue and afternoon light is more red-orange. How does this happen? The globe explains this with rotation, with atmosphere, all sorts of conjectures. And of course, the current flat earth explanation doesn't make sense because it relies on perspective. But how does that work? How does it work that it's more blue in the morning and more uh, warm and soft in the evening? Our entire circadian rhythms are adapted to this. That's why blue light is stimulating to you and red light is calming you down because we are adapted to this cycle 
of morning being a little more blue light, and then as the sun goes to the afternoon and evening, it's more red, and it tells your body to wind down. These are cues that all animals have, at least um, diurnal, like, uh, what does he call it? Not nocturnal, but throughout the day, animals. All animals have these hormonal changes. Blue light stimulates cortisol, red light stimulates melatonin. So why is that the case? Well, that's the, I don't know what's the case of that, because that would suggest that the sun is going through some sort of refracting medium. It's rising and changing frequency. And when it's setting, it's also changing frequency. If the change of light of frequency is happening because of perspective, just perspective, then the winter solstice should create an afternoon look, even at noon because of the distance. Does that make sense? So again, if we go back to here and we say that this, this color, the reason it gets, you know, warmer and reddish is because the sun is just farther away. If that's the only reason, then when the sun is in the winter solstice, 60% farther of the distance that it, it sets normally, right? So 3,200 miles, that's, that's a significant distance. You should see the sun, if this was the rule, you should see the sun much warmer even at noon, meaning it should be like orangey. It should it should look like afternoon, basically, all day. Does that make sense? Because if the distance is the only thing controlling it, but that's obviously not the case. This pattern is still the same in winter as it is in summer, which is confounding. Even when the sun is farther away, we still see the same blue and red light pattern throughout the day. This means it cannot be just perspective, folks. It's not. Something else is happening. The sun is setting somehow. However that works, we can speculate, speculate about it today, but the sun is setting or something else is determining what we see. It's not just simply, oh yeah, this is how it works. The sun moves farther away from you and it goes on a circle, which of course is not true. Even if both morning and afternoon are more reddish, like let's say you are in a place where in the morning it's it looks the same as afternoon, the, the point, again, still stands. We should see a color change during the winter. If I'm in the northern hemisphere and the summer solstice looks a certain way, when the winter solstice comes, I should see a color change. If the color change is due to perspective, because the sun during the winter solstice, for me living in the north, is very much farther away. It's thousands of miles farther away. And yet I don't see the color change. I see the same thing as I see in the winter. I see blue light, red light, blue light, red light. The globe says that the heat of the sun creates different atmospheric effects as it moves across the sky. So by the time it gets to the afternoon, the atmosphere is more warmed up. And so it, it creates a different frequency for the, um, for the light. And, you know, of course at nighttime it's cooler. And so when the night, when the sun first rises, it's a different frequency. It's blue, but of course, we know that the globe is not true. The globe is not true, but they can explain it because the sun is setting behind the curve. And so it gives time for that to cool off and it comes back and so all these conjectures and math models. But on a flat model, this is, how do you explain this? This is why I said this is a real problem for a flat model of any kind with the local light source. How is this possible? How is heat the only cause of what we see? Because again, for example, in Phoenix, you have times like during the summer where it's, you know, it's 100 degrees outside, literally at night, at like 10 o'clock at night, if you try to take a walk, it's like 100 degrees outside. So it's still hot. And by the time the sun comes back up, you know, it should be a different atmospheric effect if heat is the only thing causing it. So I'm not, I think the globe does a better job explaining it, even though I don't believe in the globe. Certainly they hide the truth, let's put it that way. The flat model doesn't have any way to explain this. It has no way to explain these these oscillations of light uh, of blue light and red light. It has no way to explain the lumen change. It has no way to explain it on a local flat Earth model. We have to have some way that the Earth or the uh, Sun is setting. But how do you accomplish that if the Sun is moving on a straight line? Because we know it's not on a circle, and it's over a flat plane. How does it set? That, that's that's confounding. And of course, uh, that's the mystery of today. It's part of the mystery. Here's another example. This is Phoenix on the winter solstice, 1222-24. The sunrise is at 7.30 a.m. And the sunset is at 5.25 p.m. Again, look at this light pattern. This is nonsense. This crescent moon light pattern. This is 
ridiculous. This, that's not how light works, man. It does not work that way. But let's take them on their word for it. If we plug in these coordinates, so we take these two coordinates where the sun is based on sunrise and sunset, and we plug them into a um, coordinate system, and we say, what is the distance between these things? Okay, so this is the winter, this is the example I said that this breaks down in the southern hemisphere. So look at the distance between these two uh, on the flat earth map. The flat earth map gives you the coordinates correctly. But it refutes itself because the coordinates are not accurately represented. If you type these coordinates, you'll get the coordinates in the in a coordinate calculator. But the distance is 8,864 miles between these two points, which is 1,500 miles shorter than it was in the previous example where the sun was closer to me. Do you see the problem? That's not that's not possible. Between the distance between this and this where they go like this, this is a much bigger circle. The, the the path of the sun here should be, you know, I don't know, it should be much bigger. But anyway, maybe the path from here to here is 8,000. I don't know. It doesn't seem that's accurately represented because it, the circles get bigger and bigger as you go outward. It doesn't make sense. Either way, the experimental data and what we have does not match the Gleason's map. They don't work. They don't work with what we see. It, it doesn't work with the the way that light propagates through a medium. I mean, this is this is nonsense. This is not how it works, folks. The question would be, how can we trust these numbers? It's globe math. How do you know that they're not just faking all these numbers and coordinate systems? Well, the distances on the Gleason map break down, folks. They they break down, and ultimately, uh, that's you'll see that in the in the next section on flight patterns. They break down totally. And we've seen that so far also with the path of the sun and the moon. And so test for yourself. Test and see. Test and see. Try to get some empirical data. The sun cannot travel less distance in the outer circle for winter. It can't do that. It doesn't make any sense. If the sun were 3,000 plus miles away, we should see 60% less light. And or, and or some sort of afternoon look in the sky even during noon when it's winter solstice and you're living in the north or vice versa if you're living in Australia during uh, the summer solstice for the north. So either way, when the sun is farther away from you, if that's what's causing the afternoon and the difference in lumens, you should see that when you're in the winter, but you don't. So the sunset is not just due to perspective. That is the problem. Perspective, meaning the sun just moving away from you over a flat plane, is not causing the sunset. It's not causing the sunrise. It's not causing the phenomena that we see, the change in light intensity. It's not. It can't be because the distances prove it. So summary for daylight hours. Light is emitted, emitted in a spherical pattern. The local sun going around a circle cannot produce the correct daylight hours. It's either too much or too little. And we'll see some more animations of this in the future. There's no explanation for oval or weird light patterns like we saw. These are just CGI conjectures, nothing different than the globe, folks. The inverse square law is a real problem for the flat Earth model because distances, the flat Earth model that says the perspective is the one that's causing all of these changes in light is a real problem because that means if that's all you have, then what we see doesn't match reality. When the sun is going... Uh, in its yearly path from solstice to solstice, there should be a marked difference in the light intensity and the light color, but it's not. It's the same thing. The heat is different, which is interesting, but the light intensity and the color, this color schemes are the same, which doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense if perspective is the only thing causing these things. These flat earth animations that you see on that um, app and other places, these are just CGI. They take the data and then they represent it in a flat, just like the globe takes data and twists it through their model through math and conjectures. If the local sun vanishes out of perspective, when you're looking at it, just if the sun setting is just the sun vanishing out of perspective, then again, you should see differences when there's winter, between winter and summer. You should see major differences, but we don't. We see heat differences, absolutely, but we don't see lumen intensity and color differences. We don't. 
Now, number five on this list is the sun's path is straight. And a great example of that is the, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, but Sri Padmanabha Swami Temple in India. It's on the equinox. It has this little thing. It's little points, basically, that the sun rises through. And it rises on a straight line. This is a real problem. Because, again, it proves to you that you're not living on a circle with the sun circling about. This is impossible on a circle map. And yet, the ancients built these things to align with the sun, and of course on special dates like the equinox, for it to be going through these lines. But the fact that it rises straight through these points proves to you that it's not on a curve. It matches the laws of perspective. So here's the sun. Here's sunrise. Here's the oscillations from north to south. Let's say you're on the equator at the equinox, so it's going to go straight above you like this. Here's noon. Here's sunrise at the bottom, at the horizon, and here's noon at the top. If you are, let's say, more in the northern hemisphere, you're going to have sunrise, and it's going to rise, and it's going to go like this, across. You'll see an example of this, or depending on where you're at, on these diagonals. This is what the sun does, because it's straight. Here's a video of it from Neil, and we're going to watch it. I drew a red line here for your convenience, so you can see how the line, the sun stays on the line. This was taken from Colorado, northern USA. So it's after the solstice, is around the summertime. Look at this, you see? Sun stays on this line. Stays on the line. Watch it. See? It's not going anywhere. It's not curving around like this. It's not curving around like that. It's going straight, which matches the perspective, the laws of perspective, and our predictions. Because if this is in Colorado, meaning Colorado is north of the Tropic of Cancer, and this is around the summertime after the summer solstice, the sun is south of you, it would be expected that it's if you're facing east, it's on your right. So if we go back to our little perspective map, here's the sun, and it basically is going towards the south, you're facing east, and it rises like this on one of these tangent lines. See? One of these, or I should say one of these tracks, because it's not a tangent line, but one of these tracks, like this. This is what we see. It goes on a, on a track to the right of you because the right is south of you. You're facing east, south is to the right. It goes like this on a track. If you are on the equator at the equinox, like that building, it would go like this, boop, straight line. So this is the problem. The sun does not do this. It doesn't circle above you like that or the other way around. It doesn't, doesn't do these things, which is what it would have to do with the circular flat earth model. The globe also in the flat earth models sometimes say that the sun does this arcing kind of thing. The globe says this a lot. You saw the Enox gates talked about this too, that there's this arc and it goes, this is not what's happening, folks. Like here's another illustration. Oh, the sun goes like this and it goes to the noon and it arcs and it has this nice little circle, but it doesn't, the sun does not do this. this. Watch it for yourself. Film it for yourself. Face east and watch the tracks go straight across the sky. It is a straight line. This does not do this. And we can prove this as well because on a flat earth model, this would be impossible for the sun to arc around like this. So even if we have some model, for example, why this is important, well, several reasons why it's important is that you're not in a circle. But then, okay, if, if it's setting somehow, which you'll see some future models of this, if it's setting, then is it going in an arc across the dome and setting somehow and then coming back? Well, that's not true either because of heat, and we'll look at that as well. So it's not doing this arc pattern, as the globe tells you. It's not true. What you're actually seeing is perspective. If you're facing, for example, south, if you're, let's say you're in the northern hemisphere, like I am, you're facing south, ideally during the winter, meaning the sun is very south of you, so it's very obvious. You'll see it rise in the east. You'll go, it'll go right above you towards the south, towards the zenith, and then it'll set in the west. So it has a straight line and it comes back. These are creating an obtuse type of triangle. Probably not to scale here. Obviously, this is maybe a little too extreme. But either way, what you see is perspective. Ignore these little characters here or this perspective drawing. 
and this is a little bit extreme, but this is my point. It's got a vanishing point here, it's got a vanishing point here. As it gets closer to you, it passes, it gets a little, you know, it's the highest, it's the zenith, and then it comes back to its vanishing point. This is how it works. Boom, boom. Just watch it yourself. Watch the moon. Again, face east, or I'm sorry, face south, so that it rises across you, and it sets across you. So you can see how it just draws a straight line with perspective. But again, that's a real problem for extreme situations, like the winter in the southern hemisphere, or the um, summer in the northern hemisphere, where it goes way, way in the north, and it's still in front of you south and at noon, and then it sets in the north again. That doesn't make any sense. We'll talk about a little bit more about that later. But either way, the sun's path is straight. And this is what I was just talking about, is that the, the, the works, it, this works during the winter months. Like I said, it's ideal when you're looking, again, if you're in the northern hemisphere and you're during the winter, you can look towards the south, then this is going to be very obvious. The sun is rising in the south. It's south of you and it's setting in the south. Very straightforward. It's, it's a straight line with a zenith perspective and it comes back down. However, this is a real problem because during the summer for the northern hemisphere, it crosses your, your vanishing point, which doesn't make any sense. If I'm, again, in my, where I'm at in Phoenix during the summer, it's always at noon, it's always going to be south of me. If I look in the southern sky, if I look up, the sun is there. It's in the south. If I look in the northern sky, it's not. So it's always going to be south of me at noon, which is consistent with what we would expect because Phoenix is north of the Tropic of Capricorn. However, look at the sunrise and look at the sunset. It rises very, very north in the sky during the summer. And then it comes, you know, basically, if you're, if you're looking towards the east, okay, in the summer, summer solstice, it's rising very, or it would be equinox, but let's say after the equinox, after the equinox, or no, summer solstice, I'm right. I was thinking, again, two things mixed up. Summer solstice is when it's the most extreme. Very, very north in the sky. And yet it crosses over into the southern sky, and then it sets back in the northern sky again in the afternoon. How that works, I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. That's why I said this also breaks down. If it's in the winter and the sun is in the southern sky, it's still in the southern sky at noon and still in the southern sky when it sets. That makes sense. And you can see it's just a nice straight line, follows the laws of perspective. It works. But then in the summertime, it doesn't work. And it's not as obvious maybe for some people because, again, they think they're on a circle and it's floating around. Oh, that makes sense because it's a circle. But no, the sun moves on a straight line. Face east, like we saw with that video, and you will see that the sun moves in a straight line. Therefore, what you're seeing when you're facing south, for example, and you see, okay, sun rises way north, goes to the south. Now it's setting in the north too. How the heck does that work? It's not a curve it's going on. It's a straight line. So it's, what is it, zigzagging? It doesn't make sense, folks. The moon also seems to be doing this as well. We'll, we'll talk about this later. It's oscillating it, because the moon, again, some things are more obvious with the moon because, hey, you can look at the moon. It, it's not going to burn your eyes, but it's also doing things faster. So it's it's a fun thing to observe. It's a second witness to observe because it's doing these circuits faster. And you'll see the moon goes, it oscillates from having a curved type of path to a straight path to another curved path, which seems to be, again, there's something to do with the firmament and some sort of something, something electromagnetic we'll, we'll see a couple videos on it but it's things are not what they seem they're, they're not they're not what they seem and they're not as simple as they seem it's much more profound folks even though we see the sun moving on its tracks and it follows the laws of perspective this works when the track of the object is in front of you for example let's say you go to a street go to a street that's just an empty street like on like a nice long street and if you look down one way you see that street having a vanishing point. You look down the other way, you see a street having another vanishing point. If you were to see a car go from one side of the street, it's super tiny, it gets bigger, it's right in front of you, but it's you know in front of you, and then it goes back to its vanishing point. So that kind of idea, if it was a little bit above you, it would be the same thing 
with the sun in the southern sky. That makes sense. But it doesn't make sense if that street was crossing your vanishing point when you look this way. So if I'm looking to the to the left, in my case, or whatever, it's crossing your vanishing point, goes in front, and goes back around your vanishing point to the right. That means that that street is on an angle. Does that make sense? It's not a straight path. So that's the part that doesn't make sense. In the northern hemisphere, summer, the sun rises and sets in the north, but the noon, in noon, it's in the southern sky. Because again, the Tropic of, Cap the tropic of Cancer is where the sun is overhead. That is the, the northernmost place where the sun can be viewed directly overhead, the Tropic of Cancer. Anybody north of that is always going to see, at noon, the sun in the southern sky. And that's true. That is a true observation. But why can it? Why is it that during the summer months, in any northern, even if you were in Iceland, you would still see the sun rising in the north, like we saw in August, was it 30-something degrees, 29 degrees, north of east sunrise, and 29 degrees west of uh, south of west uh, sunset. How does that happen? How is that possible? You'd have to have some sort of, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. The same thing is with the southern uh, sky in the winter, where the sun rises and sets in the south, but in the noon, it's in the northern sky. That doesn't make any sense. So all of these things, when you put them together, it just, the laws of perspective sort of break down and even though we can observe that the sun is moving, if you look east or west, you can observe the sun moving on a straight line, like the Indian building that shows you its straight line, like the video footage that you saw where it's on an angle, but again, it's a straight line, laws of perspective. That tells us the sun is moving on a straight line. But then once we face north or south, depending on where you're at, whether northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, it breaks down during the, the, during the summer of the Northern Hemisphere and the winter of the Southern Hemisphere. I'm saying hemisphere just for lack of another word, but you know what I mean. The Southern and North parts of the Earth. It breaks down, folks. It breaks down. So that says that it's not a completely straight line or it's a, a straight line that zigzags somehow or something. This It doesn't make sense. But either way, this refutes the circle map and it means we need a better model. This is why also we see the midnight sun. In the Arctic, the midnight sun, if you look at the midnight sun, it's not a circle. Like, for example, how they were saying, where's my little graphic? Um, like this, where they tell you, oh, here's the sun going like a little circle over the earth and it's arcing. That's not true. The midnight sun is this. Midnight sun, if you actually see a time lapse of it, it is a, it is a line. It's going down, up, down, up, because the sun goes down, but it never sets, and it comes back up again, and it goes from west to east, which is a phenomenal thing to observe. I would love to see it for myself. What a phenomenon to see that, where the sun goes from west to east, and it's doing these up and down lines, which proves to you, again, that this is, the sun moves on a straight path, but then how does this work on a, on a flat earth model? It certainly doesn't work on a... Um, what you call it, in a circle model, because the the highest the sun goes is the Tropic of Cancer. Let me see if I can find a flat Earth map. Where is it? The highest the sun goes is the Tropic of Cancer. And you're telling me that if you're in the Arctic Circle, where the where the Tropic of Cancer is thousands of miles south of you, you're seeing this. Where is this thing at? You're seeing this. I don't think so. I don't think so. That I don't think that's at all what's happening. The question is, what is happening? I don't know. It's a mystery. And of course, if there's portals to the sun, you know, maybe there's something going on there, but this is a phenomenal mystery. And also, this seems to happen where you have the 24-hour uh, sun in Antarctica, too. So that's also a huge problem for the flat Earth model. Here's another problem with this whole thing, which is the heat I talked about this. Now, again, even if we have a flat Earth model and we say that the sun is setting and it's maybe arcing over the dome and coming out back and it goes under somehow and, I don't know, there's some sort of mechanism where it sets. It cannot be arcing over the dome. So whatever the sun is doing, it cannot be arcing over the dome because of heat distribution. It's not possible. 
if the local sun is on an arc, it's always equidistant from the ground, meaning all of these points, if you can imagine these little tangent points on the arc of the dome, all of them have the same distance from the ground, right? In that sense, from the, from the observer. So they're all equidistant. So that's a real problem. And that's a real problem because you have different heat in different times of the year. In June, the sun's rays, of course, this is a globe explanation. They're giving you straight rays. But the point is that if the sun's rays are concentrated more because the sun is closer to you. That makes sense. It's a local light source. It's closer to you. And then in the winter, it's farther away. It's going in a different angle. So remember the inverse square law. It's over a greater surface area, meaning it's not as warm. That makes sense. The ball explains this with tilt and with all sorts of conjectures, but we know that's wrong. But a local sun, that's a little trickier to explain. Because again, it's just, it's not possible for this to be going on a curved path. It has to be going straight. So if it's going straight, then how do you explain continuity? That, that's just another mystery. Here's another mystery. Weather anomalies put this together actually today, which is that today's temperature that I'm recording it, this is the 18th, 75 degrees is the high today in Phoenix. Very nice weather, love it. But you have a real problem because up until like a week ago, it was like 100. Here are some recent weather records in Phoenix, Arizona for October. On Tuesday, October 1st, Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport recorded a record high of 113 degrees breaking the daily and monthly record of 107. 109 Fahrenheit average high. The average high temperature for the first two weeks of October was 109 degrees, which was 15 degrees higher than the average high of temperature between 1991 and two, uh, 2020. Here's Phoenix AZ weather history. Here you are, this is 100 degrees. You can see this, 100. Here's all these temperatures. And then suddenly they drop off like over the course of, you know, like a couple days, like maybe two or three days, they drop, you know, 40 degrees? That doesn't make any sense to me. How do you explain that with a local sun and perspective creating heat and light and it's slowly moving south from you? Like the sun, for example, from here today when it's 75 degrees is not that much farther than it was October 13th when the temperature was like 104. And yet there's a difference of 30 degrees temperature despite the sun not really being that much farther away in its yearly oscillation. How do you explain that? That doesn't make any sense to me, unless there, there's something else going on with the sun to create heat through maybe it's an elect electromagnetic thing and there's it has its own cycles with UV energy. I mean, I don't know. But this, this is very difficult to explain on a flat earth with a local sun that is just oscillating up and down, and that's the reason we have heat and seasons and everything else. That doesn't make any sense, folks. It's much harder to explain. Of course, the globe can hide this with conjectures and tilt and solar flares and distance of the sun and parallel rays and blah, 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 and elliptical orbits, but we know that that stuff is nonsense. But then once you have a flat plane and a local light source, you can't, there's not much wiggle room to hide behind math. You see the point? There's not much wiggle room, and so what do you do? Now, some people have suggested that this might be a projection of some kind where you have, here's maybe the sun and here's maybe a projection that's traveling over the dome. But the question is, how can this cause heat and, and look real in the sky? Like when you look at the sun, of course, obviously it's hard to look at the sun, but if you have some sort of camera that can observe it, it's an object. It's a, it's a sphere or a circle or something, but it's an object. It's something in the sky. It's not just like a illusion. It's not a projection. So this is a real problem. And of course, we also don't have empirical evidence that you can have a projection moving across the sky over such, we'll talk about this little distance, but this distance here over the dome is much longer than this distance here. You see the problem? So if I play this again, this distance that, that is traveling is much longer than this. So this has to travel much faster than this, which again, these need empirical evidence. And we know, of course, that the Earth is not a circle. Here's another problem that proves to you that the sun is not going in a circle around the Earth. The analemma. If you know what this is, it's not possible on a circular flat Earth model. We're going to watch some videos here. And let's see. 
some globe videos, but they'll refute themselves really quick. Notice this is an animation, but look how they're animating it. Watch, look at how see the sun is. So an analemma is basically you pick a certain time of the day and in that particular time of the day, you take a snapshot of the sun's position at that time of the day. And what you get is something like this. For any time of the day, you get this snapshot of an infinity sign, which, uh, which is an uneven infinity sign. And this person is videoing it's a simulation, but you can see the sun is going to go like this, like a straight line. And he's going to mark it at different days, but at the same time, and it's going to create tick, 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 a little track in the sky. So let's watch. You see how the sun is moving towards to uh, to the to the east. It was in the south. It's going to the east, and then, or sorry, it's going to the north. My bad. So it's mo so many things to think about right now. But the sun is moving across the horizon towards as it gets warmer towards the north. But it's all straight lines. It's going like this: straight lines, straight lines. Straight. These are tracks that the sun is following on. See? Look. You see the tracks? It went from here, chick, 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 and it just creates straight tracks across the sky as it oscillates from south to north. Now it's reached its maximum, and you're going to see a track. It's going to go on a track backwards now and oscillate back the other way. Of course, they give you this little globe explanation here, which is nonsense. But this is not possible if the Earth, if the Earth is a circle and the Sun is moving around in a circle above. It's not possible, not at all. Here's another video. I think. Well, yeah. Here we go. Let's watch it. Here's the date and time. And you can see basically every 24 hours, they take the analemma. So all of these are the same 4.40 p.m. and they take a snapshot of the sun. See, these are this is where the sun is at in the sky. If you're facing west, because this is, he's taking a snapshot of the sunset. This is 5.40 p.m. probably because of daylight savings time, but so he's facing west and taking a snapshot of the sun exactly at the same time. And it follows this little track. Yeah, you see? Boop, and it comes back down. This is the sun's position in the sky when you're facing west. This is not possible on a circle map. Not possible whatsoever. Here's some more. These are several years, it seems like, of data. But you see, it just keeps doing this. Because the sun is going like this, trick, trick, trick. It sets in different places of, this, of the sky. Remember, west, due west. Yeah, I'll show you in a second. Just watch this whole thing. He's doing it again. No, he's done. And the limb of the movie, Robert Quimby. Yeah, cool. And there's so much of this online. And the problem is this. If you if we take screenshots of this, remember the sun, here's he's facing west, right? He's facing west. He's facing west, looking directly west. And the sun oscillates throughout the year, right? So in the summer, it's gonna set northerly, north of west, in towards the uh, winter, it's going to, actually, this is 
This is south. Yeah, this is south. My bad. I've switched them around. This is south. This is north because he's facing west. That makes sense. North is on your right. South is on your left. This is south. This is north. Okay. You're facing west towards the sunset. It oscillates. During the winter, it's going to be setting more towards the south. As it goes through the year, it'll oscillate and it'll go uh, set towards the north because these tracks are on different, it's on different tracks of the year. On the summer, it's on a track over here. On the winter solstice, it's on a track over here. Does that make sense? So this straight line is a little tangent line to each of these points. Here's the sun sets on December 30th. I took a screenshot. The sun's position, just draw a straight line to it. This is an approximation of the angle, but just a little tangent line. Okay, that makes sense. It is, and you could probably check, the, you could probably get more specific with this with timeanddate.com. Get an analemma from somebody, or if you have the patience to do one, they, they take a long time, obviously, but get an analemma from somebody, find out their location, get it from timeanddate.com, and see the, the angle of sunset, and see, okay, does it is it consistent? Like, if I have my son here is, this is what, 240, I don't know, 43, 44 degrees, something like that, um south of west, something like that. You could verify that with timeanddate.com. Either way, the point is this is an approximation. It's a line. This is a track. If we go to the next one, during March 21st, we can see if I drew a line through here, it goes straight to due west. That makes sense because the sun oscillates through this particular path. So on March 21st, which is around the equinox, the screenshot, we draw a line through it, it's directly west. So again, if we go back to the December, this is a week after the winter solstice. Here it is. It's very south of west. If we go to the equinox, it's right through west. That makes sense. The track is going through west. And if we go to the summer solstice, you can see the track is very north of west, June 22nd. So this aligns with our predictions so far, that, that there's tracks, these tracks oscillate throughout the year. How the sun goes on these tracks, who knows? But the point is that observation matches reality. It does not, this is, it cannot happen on a circular track, is my point. The analemma phenomenon, however it works, and we're, there's going to be some more things we'll talk about in just a second, proves to you that the Earth is moving um, on a straight line. A straight line through the sky. Because these are snapshots of the position on the tracks in the sky at different times, and it creates this phenomenal pattern through the sky, which is an infinity sign. The problem, though, is that when you look at the analemma in the southern hemisphere, it's inverse. This is also very curious how this works, which is very strange. It's just a very strange phenomenon. Of course, the globe explains the CGI and clever math, but we don't have a way to explain this in the current model, in the circular model, that's for sure. Here's, a, I think, a video on globe analemma. The Earth in its journey around the sun, lays on its axis with a 23.4 degrees tilt. Because its north pole always point to the same direction, from the sun's perspective, it seems that the Earth wobbles in a rocking motion that lasts an entire orbit. Now remember from the heliocentric conspiracy that many physicists have admitted to you, even from a thousand years ago, that geocentrism is a valid frame of reference that you can explain what you see either by the earth moving and the sun and the, the heavens not moving or the heavens are moving and the earth is still. And of course we have empirical proof for the latter and the former is just a conjecture. So what you're seeing here is a conjecture, but through math, they can explain some of these things because remember math can be used to represent many things. Doesn't mean they're representing reality. So just keep that in mind, but this is how the globe explains it. And the flat earth model does not have an explanation for this. This apparent wobbling describes a pattern that affects how the sun is perceived from a fixed location on the planet. If we decided to record an image of the sun in the sky at the same time of day every week of the year, we would realize that the sun marks a slightly different location in the sky every time a new picture is taken. After an entire year of recording the sun's positions, a pattern is emerging. 
It looks like a figure eight shaped loop. This figure eight loop diagram is called an analemma and is the result of the apparent rocky motion of the Earth from the Sun's perspective. Its two subloops have different sizes. This is due to the fact that the Earth's orbit is not perfectly circular. In reality, the Sun doesn't move, but the fixed location where it is viewed from is. It is that motion that creates the figure eight pattern in the sky. That was your latest Earth fact. Want more? Then tune back in for more. Tune back in for some more fake globe conjectures. But look, the globe explains this. When people look and say, oh, that's how it works. Because the Earth is wobbling and orbiting oval, oval, oval orbits and flying through a void of space. So people tell oh, that's how it works. It's not how it works. We have empirical proof that the Earth is motionless in the 1800s. Michelson, Morley, Airy, Sanyak, and so many others. That's so why they had to develop relativity so they could hide behind math because you have ob objective empirical proof that the Earth is not moving. So if that's the case, then all of this is wrong. Obviously, we see the analemma. That's a, a true phenomenon. But what is causing it? What is causing it? And that's the, that's the real question. We know that the analemma, if we go back to our little graphics, is because these tracks, these tracks are, are going through the sky. Here's the track. Here's the track in the equinox. And here's the summer solstice. They're going through the sky and you, you pick a particular time of the day and you do it every single day for a year and you see the position where the sun is on its given track and it forms this little eight sign and it's irregular in the in the southern hemisphere it's it's opposite of what it is in the northern hemisphere which is very strange so don't let the cgi get to you and the fancy math because earth obviously is not a ball there is more than one way to explain a phenomenon the globe assumes that the earth is moving but it's the sun that's moving. We know that. We know the sun is the one moving. The Bible says it so, and we, we have empirical evidence, and our senses tell us that the sun is moving, not the earth. Remember the episode on Eratosthenes, where math can be used to basically turn a table into a ball, and nobody's the wiser. And it works out mathematically if you ignore refraction. So math is, is useful, but it's also, it can be very deceptive. So you have to be aware of that. But the point of today is that the circle, the circle map has no way to explain this phenomenon. It doesn't. Their CGI little thing where the circle, where the sun is moving in a circle like this and, and telling you the daylight and stuff, that doesn't explain an analemma. That doesn't explain it whatsoever. Because an analemma requires the sun move in a straight track across the sky, for one. And the fact that it's in different positions, which is another confounding thing, is, is very, very crazy. So... Other problems with this analemma phenomenon is that the loops aren't even, suggesting there's more time in one area than in another, which is just so strange because, again, the north and the south are opposite of each other, which doesn't seem to make sense. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, I mean, I'm missing something, but it doesn't seem to make sense to me that they're inversed. Maybe they should be. I don't know. By the way, it seems to be that there's conf conflicting information. There's no, basically no objective sense of what the sun is doing and where it's at. Again, if we go back to our little drawings, if it's on these tracks, you have a real problem with this infinity sign. So the analemma, it confirms what we have been looking at, which is the sun's tracks, the sun's path in the sky is straight. It confirms that. You can see from the CGI animations, you can see from the actual footage. Both of those videos confirm the same thing, that the sun is moving. Not the last one we saw with the wobbling, but the first one we saw with the CGI going over the horizon and the... Um, and the actual footage where these screenshots are taken from. So it proves it's on a straight line. But then we have another problem because of that. And we have a very confounding problem because the sun has two positions on the same track throughout the year, except for one where it's at the, whatever, wherever the center of this figure eight is. You see the problem? So here's the screenshot from October 24th, 2015. This, the black dot here is the actual screenshot. There's the screen. And I drew a line through that tangent point. And we found the position of the sun, which is around February 9th. So when it's coming this way, it's February 9th, yada, 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 comes back around October 
24th, approximately. So February and October are on different sides of the analemma, but they're on the same track. That is very confounding. It's not just the sun's movement north or south that determines the days and seasons, because there's something else at work. The sun is at different positions on the same track all throughout the year, except once. Again, all these positions, all these tracks that, that you, if you drew tracks through all of these points and connected them, you would have two positions for the sun on the same track throughout the year, meaning it's going at a different speed or a rate or something. Do you understand? It shouldn't, we shouldn't be able to see this analemma if the sun was just moving across the sky in a straight line and that was it. There's something else going on to, to produce what we see as seasons and so on, which is that the sun is moving at a different speed, something. How is this possible if Earth is stationary and the sun is moving at a constant rate, cycling through different tracks? How is that possible? If it's moving at a constant rate, we should not see an analemma phenomenon. We should see a straight line. And it's just 24 hours. It's like, for example, it, you shouldn't see an analemma. If you picked a time, like let's say, you know, 540, it should just be a straight line like this, just be a straight line. And every day it's just going up and down that straight line because it's oscillating as the sun goes from uh, north to south on the horizon. Does that make sense? It would just be a straight line and the tracks would be across it and it would just be a straight line of dots. It shouldn't be this oscillating thing where basically one track has two positions. In February, as it's approaching the equinox, the day is a little bit longer. In October, as it's approaching the winter solstice, the day is a little bit shorter because you see the sun is here and it doesn't have that much more to travel to the horizon. Where it's on the same track in February 9th, the same track in the sky, yet it has more to travel, meaning the day is a little bit longer because the days are growing longer. February 9th is after the winter solstice, the days are growing longer and it's approaching the equinox where the light and day are the same. So that makes sense. So this makes sense, but it also doesn't make sense. How can it be on the same track? And again, for, for, a lo for the globe, they can handle this. They can do all sorts of crazy explanations with math and ridiculous conjectures. But on a local, on a plane with a local light source, how do you explain that the sun is on the same track? And on one of those times, it has much more time to go to the sunset, whereas on another time, it has much less time. That means it's traveling at a, at a, at an irregular rate or something, or the rate changes or something. It doesn't make sense. It does not make sense, given what we've established. Also, another thing is that the point where there is, where there's only one, how do I phrase this? The point, here's this point, let's just say this. The point where it's the middle of the infinity sign. You see, there's only one time in the year where there is not two places. It's the sun is on the same point. It is not even astronomically significant. I think what was this point? It was April and August. So in April, so here's February, right? Blah, 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 blah. By the time it gets here at this little intersection point would be April. And then it goes around summer solstice and it comes back and then uh, it comes back to August, September, October. So April and August, approximately, whatever dates they are, you can, you can get a little more specific with it yourself, but April and August, are when these two things cross, meaning that this track, if I were to draw a line through this little point here, the sun is at the same position on this track as it is in April and it is in August, meaning April and August have the same amount of, you know, distance that it's traveling, which doesn't, doesn't make sense. It doesn't really make sense because they're not astronomically significant. It's not the equinox. You should expect to see this at the equinox. Does that make sense? You should expect to see this at the equinox where the, the sun and the, um, the, the days are, the daylight is the same. Does that make sense? The, the, the equinox means equal night. So anyway, there's equal lux, which is another thing, but basically equinox where the day and the night are the same, same length, approximately. You should expect to see that here, but it's not. April and August are not astronomically significant. They're not solstice, they're not equinox, they're, they're nothing. They're just transitioning. So. How does that work? That doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Nobody's ever bothered to plot this out on a 
map on a flat earth map, whether it's circle or, or square or whatever else, and see how this would work. If we do plot it out, let's take those two dates again, February 9th and October 24th, and we put them on a square map. This is like a Mercator projection. And here's the Tropic of Capricorn, or Cancer at the top, Tropic of Capricorn at the bottom. And the sun, let's just say, just go with me and pretend that there's supernatural continuity, Pac-Man style. It goes from one end to the other, it comes back. Let's just pretend that happens. And we accept that the sun goes on a straight line, so it's just going through these straight lines and oscillating through the sky when it comes down to the winter, and then it comes back here, and it's just oscillating through the sky like this, across these tracks in the sky. Okay, great. But now you have a problem because the analemma that you observe, going back here, um, there's one track, one of these tracks that it's on, February 9th and October 24th, the sun is in two different positions. Okay, so let's go back to our little map here. Here's the sun for October. It's blue, it's colder, right? They're on the same track. Just imagine an imaginary line between these two suns. They're on the same track. But this one is closer to setting in the west than this one is because it's February 9th. This is February 9th. It's, a little, it's on its way. The days are getting uh, warmer and the days are getting longer. This is October 24th. So again, going back to our little thing here, here's the analemma. Here's February 9th. Here's October 24th. Okay, this one is closer to setting. This one has a little bit more to go, but they're on the same track at the same time of the day. Okay, well... Here they are represented over a square plane with a dotted line, imaginary dotted line is not really a dotted line, but a line through these on the same track. One is closer to setting, the other one is a little bit farther away from setting. So far, so good. But it's not so far, so good because these are two different distances away from the Tropic of Capricorn. Do you see the problem? Tropic of Capricorn is the winter solstice for the Northern Hemisphere, December 22nd. So... February 9th, which is this one, the orange sun, is 49 days away from the Tropic of Capricorn, okay? October is 59 days away from the Tropic of Capricorn. October is on its way to the Tropic of Capricorn. February 9th is going away from the Tropic of Capricorn. But either way, the distance is 49 versus 59 days. That's 10 days difference. You would expect there to be what is the problem? You would expect there to be, if they're on the same track, that there would be the same amount of distance from the Tropic of Capricorn, which doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. These are 10 days difference. Now, you could say there's user error and maybe, you know, there's some sort of mismatch in my part uh, that, you know, I, I maybe have this a little bit wrong. Maybe it's a different day. Maybe it's a different day in February. And so the numbers work out. I don't know. 10 days is a huge margin of error. And I don't think I'm that off with this estimate. So... Because I did this, I took, a, I, I wrote over February 9th, but this is actually taken from uh, a screenshot that I superimposed on here. The original screenshot was February 9th, and I took for October 24th. So it's based on what this guy has taken as empirical evidence. So I'm not that far off. Maybe I could, maybe it was February 10th or maybe February 8th. Give her plus or take, uh, you know, plus or minus one or two days. Sure, maybe user error for sure, but not 10 days. So this is a real problem. Because since the times are different, then the sun cannot be on the same track. Do you understand? February 9th is 49 days away from the Tropic of Capricorn. October 24th is 59 days away. This is what it's actually looking like. If the, if the sun is on tracks and moving over these tracks over the earth, and okay, so far so good, and it just goes up and down and up and down, well, it would stand to reason that on October when it's 59 days away from the Tropic of Capricorn, the track that it's on would be farther away from the Tropic of Capricorn than the track of the February 9th, because it's only 49 days away from the winter solstice with the Tropic of Capricorn. Does that make sense? These two should not be on the same track. And yet they are. If you look at the analemma picture, they are. They're the same track. <laughs> Again, give or take, you know, maybe one or two days max, but they're on the same track, man. That doesn't make any sense. Because again, if you try to represent these, that that is not possible. 10 days is a significant amount for these things to be different from each other. They should not be on the same track. And yet they are.
So you have this, which is a mystery, and somehow the sun, one sun is ahead of the other, and it means it's it's something is we don't have a picture, we haven't painted a correct picture of how the sun is moving. We don't know. We don't know how the sun what is what the sun is doing. These CGI graphics that you see on flat earth and all this stuff, oh, this is how it works. That's not how it works, man. What the sun is doing is way more fascinating and complex than what we could ever imagine. Now, here's another problem. The moon is also doing the same thing. The moon has an analemma. And it's doing this every month. And of course, these, these flat, flat earth animations, there's no way they're representing this. The sun and the moon doing whatever the heck they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. But obviously, they're moving on straight lines. We know that. But even that has exceptions to it, where you, you'll see a video here, I think, pretty soon. Yeah, two poles. This, I think, explains the issue with the oscillating paths of straight to curved. Let's see. Earth is a level, motionless plane with the sun, moon, and stars. This is not how it works, but anyway. Stars revolving over and around us, just as you experience every day. The North Pole is the magnetic monopole center point, with Polaris, the North Pole star, situated directly above. Polaris is the only motionless star in the heavens, with all the other constellations revolving. Remember this graphic, too. I hope you remember it from the heliocentric conspiracy of the monad. Bring perfect circles over the Earth every night. All the stars rotate around Sigma Octantis. There are two pole stars. So here you can see, obviously, we're looking north. Was the North Pole. Stars are rotating. This guy, just a quick pause, but this guy is the one, the only one I've found that really has addressed this issue. He has a video we're going to watch at the end, like a 20 minute video that's kind of putting all these things together very nicely. But he's talking about this issue in the, the, the two poles. There's two poles and the stars, you'll see how they, they diverge. It's really fascinating. Anti-clockwise. This is what we actually observe. Yeah. The North Pole rotates within 0. 0.75 degrees of the North, sorry, Polaris does of the North Pole. If we look east, stars rise. up from the horizon. If we look to the south, we now see stars rotating clockwise. Opposite direction to the north. Opposite direction, but we're still on a fixed plane Earth. Right? So this is how, very simply, we don't have to say the reflecting from the north, reflecting from one side to the other, or any kind of strange anomaly, there's no need to explain We'll go through all these big explanations. It's one semisphere of stars all rotating across one axis with two poles. Think about your, your back axle of your car, if you like, but obviously with a huge semisphere. If we look west, we see the stars setting and all rising in the east again. Very, very straight, very straightforward. Earth is a fixed plane, the heavens rotate about us. And this is how we get opposite star rotation, north and south. We'll do one more and show. See how they rotate in different directions if you look one direction or another see it rotates this way and if you keep turning around the view goes over your head 
the and electromagnetic the ether is a luminiferous substance for the propagation of light and it's in a constant constant state of vortex motion and it carries all the heavenly bodies according to their varying altitudes densities and frequencies and it's made up of two vortices two one in the north and one in the south Now you put these side by side and you can see when you're facing in one direction it appears to rotate in one direction and when you're facing in the other direction it seems to fit the, uh, rotate in the other direction. If you're on the equator you'll just see them pass straight over your head like that and then they'll obviously bend off to the side. This is an interesting time lapse. So I'm going to say that there's two wheels in the sky and not just one. So when the moon is high on the Tropic of Cancer and it appears to be circling the northern circuit, as the moon gets southern declination, it will cross the celestial equator and pick up on the ethereal currents in the opposing vortex. So what it'll be doing then, it'll appear to circle in the southern circuit. And as you can see here, with the time lapse, the moon crosses over and it appears to be circling in the opposite or the opposing vortex. See how it does that? The moon over a time lapse of an entire lunation, it goes, it does what the sun does in a year. It goes through these different tropics. And it seems that the electromagnetic ether, whatever is happening, is pulling on it and it's it's distorting its path so that it goes in an arc this way, then when it's the equator, it goes straight. And then when it's more towards the other uh, tropic, it goes curved the other way. And as it gets northern declination and crosses the celestial equator again, it will be appear to rotating around the northern circuit. So when the moon's high on top of Cancer, if you take a time lapse, what you'll see, the moon will appear to be following the stars in the north. You take one bang on the celestial equator, whoom, travels in a perfectly straight line. Take a time lapse when the moon's low on the Tropic of Capricorn, and it'd be a, appear to circle in this, what I call the Southern Circuit. Now, it's, observing the sky is not going to affect the land beneath our feet. We know it's flat, we know there's no measurable curvature, so all I'm trying to do here is look at it from a different perspective. So, from the equator, what you'll see you can actually see both celestial poles, the north and the south. Looks a bit like a dome as well from there, actually. Yeah, maybe it's a dome with two energy foci on each side, some, some kind of structure. There you'll see, it comes round, that's the south celestial pole from the equator. And the stars will just appear to go straight over your head from there. And there you can see the North Celestial Pole. A bit like a giant magnet. Magnet has two poles. Yeah. Some of the currents go in one direction at the North Pole, and some of the currents go in the opposite direction in the South Pole. So for an analogy, imagine that the clock is two giant wheels in the sky. As you can see, one wheel turns one direction, and one wheel turns in the other direction. And if you put that, that image with the time lapse from the equator side by side, they look very similar, don't they? There you can see, see. you've got the stars coming overhead, but you've also got the North Pole and the South Pole. Now, the way Eric Dubai said it, it works, it doesn't work the way it's, he said it works. The reality is that the Earth and Polaris do not move, while everything else in the heavens revolves over Earth and around Polaris, east to west, like in a planetarium dome. The reality is that the Earth and Polaris do not move, while everything else in the heavens revolves over Earth and around Polaris, east to west, like in a planetarium dome.
That simply is not true at all. As stated before, only the stars in the northern hemisphere rotate around Polaris. It's true, yeah. Doesn't match reality. Stars in the southern hemisphere rotate around the south pole star Sigma Octantis, while stars at the equator travel straight overhead east to west. They don't rotate around anything, you see? South, they rotate around Sigma Octantis, north Polaris. and Our Earth planetarium, however, is so vast that perspective won't allow any observer to see all the stars simultaneously from any one vantage point. We can see Polaris, Ursa Major and Minor, and other northern constellations from every point north of the equator simultaneously, but conversely cannot see the so-called South Pole Star, Sigma Octantis, the Southern Cross, or other outer constellations simultaneously from every point south of the equator, because they all sweep over a great southern arc from their rise in the evening to their setting in the morning conversely, cannot see the so-called South Pole Star, Sigma Octantis, the Southern Cross, or other outer constellations simultaneously from every point south of the equator, because they all sweep over a great southern arc from their rise in the evening to their setting in the morning. Not true at all. As stated before, the South Pole Star is also fixed in place. It does not move from east to west on a great sweeping arc. Yeah, true. Some goes, same goes for all the stars in the Southern Hemisphere. They are not rotating around Polaris, as the model shows. We have two pole stars, two points of rotation, Polaris and Sigma Octantis. And he quotes 2 Peter 2.1 with false prophets. Yeah, Eric Dubay reminds me of, like, Carl Sagan, like a New Age Carl Sagan. Yeah, there he goes. There you go. Antichrist. Eric Dubay, Jesus Christ never existed. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Exactly. That's exactly what we're doing today, folks. We are exposing the works of darkness because the works of darkness are often dressed as false light. So, very fascinating information. Who knows how it works? Maybe it's a dome with these two energy vortices on the side that's that's doing some sort of i don't know i don't know what it's doing but it's certainly fun to speculate but it's not i can tell you what it's not is that it's this circular earth with polaris and everything's rotating around polaris that's not what's happening that's a false view so summary for this section what we observe is that the sun moves on straight tracks across the sky you can test that for yourself look east do a time-lapse photography or a time-lapse uh, videography and see for yourself and confirm it. Observations prove that Earth cannot be a circle with all the things we looked at, but some observations don't make sense at all. For example, the, no the northern sunrise sunset for the North Hemisphere during the summer, even though the sun is in the southern sky during uh, noon, like at noon, at noon it's in the southern sky, but yet it rises and sets in the northern sky, which is very north, by the way, which doesn't make any sense. Same thing with the southern uh, sunrise and sunset when it's wintertime for them. Even though the sun is in the northern sky, it's coming from the south and it's setting in the south. That, that means it's doing some sort of arc or something. Again, it reminds me of the way the moon behaves. Maybe the sun is going through these same... Uh, it seems to be. It seems to be that the sun's path, even though it's straight, is getting, I don't know, diverted or influenced by these two energy centers. Just like with the moon, you saw the time lapse going arcing, and then it goes straight, then it goes arcing again, where it's getting sucked into the basically orbit or whatever else I can call it of the tropics. It's bending that path, or maybe it's straight and it just appears bent. I don't really know. Maybe there's a refraction happening because the dome's structures is is doing something. I don't know. The analemma phenomenon shows us that. Yes, the sun is moving on straight tracks. That proves the point. But it also raises more questions because it, ha it puts the sun on two positions on the same track. And so the sun has to have an irregular rate of some kind, it must be moving, <clears throat> excuse me, slower or faster or something while it's on the same track, which doesn't make any sense. The analemma doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense because the sun is on two tracks. I'm, let me put it this way. The analemma as we understand it from a flat earth orientation without further data, doesn't make sense. 
because again, it, it, the, how can the sun be on two tracks? How can be how can the sun be on the same position or different positions on the same track on different days of the year? February 9th, October 24th. How can it be on two different positions of the same track? Because those days, if they were equidistant from the solstice, let's say they were both 40 days away from the solstice. One of them is 40 days, 40 days uh, coming out of it. One of them is 40 days approaching it, 40 days to approach it, right? The time should be the same, and therefore they should be on the same track, but they're not. There's a 10-day difference, meaning one is closer to the reaching the solstice, which is an absolute measurement, and the other one is has gone away from it much farther. So they shouldn't be even be on the same track, and yet they are. So how do you explain that? That that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. So either way, the the evidence that we have proves that the Earth is in a circle, that the Earth, that the Sun is moving on a straight track at least most of the time. But it doesn't prove what the Earth is. It doesn't prove what the dome is. It doesn't prove what the Sun is doing whatsoever. It raises more questions, as as things usually do. The time lapse of the moon shows that it oscillates from a curved path to a straight one as it goes through these different uh, positions, the lunation. Again, we know the moon does in a lunation, which is 29.5 days, what the sun does in a year. So could it mean that the sun's path is getting curved at the extremes? Is that why we see in the north a north and uh, a north sunrise and north sunset, even though the sun is in my southern sky at noon? Is that why? I don't know. Could be. It seems like it would be, but again, I'm all I'm almost hesitant to say that because it seems that everything we are quick to say, oh, this is how it works, that's not how it works. It, it's much more mysterious. Maybe the moon is different because it's a 2D projection. You know, maybe the moon aligns with the suns or with the uh, stars because it's some sort of energy phenomenon and the suns may be different. I don't know because we looked at those lunar waves in the last episode if you haven't seen that, then buckle your seatbelt, but the moon is basically refreshing in the sky like you have some sort of TV image. And that proves that it's a 2D projection. There's other proofs for that being a 2D projection, but the lunar waves for sure sell at home. And so is the, is the moon, I haven't seen that with the sun. I, I don't think I've seen anybody talk about that with the sun. The sun definitely seems like some sort of object in the sky. But the moon seems like a projection. So if that's the case, does that mean that it's more susceptible to these electromagnetic changes? I don't know. I don't know. We, we can't 100% use the moon to determine the sun's behavior. Meaning you can't say that, well, the moon does this arc thing and it's straight and then it's arc. And therefore the sun must do that too. Well, I don't know because the sun is not like the moon. There are two great lights in the sky, but maybe they function very differently. I don't know. It's very strange. We know that the sun moves on a straight line, both from observations in the northern hemisphere and around the equator with that building uh, in India, that proves that it moves in a straight line. And yet you have these confounding realities of a sun crossing your vanishing point when you look to the east. Meaning during the summer, if I look east, the sun is across my vanishing point. Due east, it's north, right? And it, it crosses my vanishing point to get in front of me in the southern sky. And then it, when it sets, if I'm looking due west, it crosses that vanishing point and it sets in the west. That doesn't make any sense. Even though it's moving straight, it must be moving zigzag at the very least, which of course brings up more questions. All right, the next part of this is number six, the green flash. If you've never heard about the green flash, then this is something to learn. This is a phenomenon that happens with sunsets, not all the time, but it definitely happens. And it suggests that some kind of frequency change is happening with the sun, that it's actually setting. It's not just going away and getting smaller. You see here, um, that's not the video, this is the video. Let's watch a video of this. See, it looks like it's actually setting. You see? Like this is actually going under the horizon, however that works. It looks that way. And watch, as it gets lower, you see the, the light is going to no. Get green. Look at that. Ages ago. Ages ago. Yeah, Look at that. You see how green that is? Look how green that is. It's called the green flash. And they're rare, you know, they're not always happening, but. Yep. 
So there's that. So the green flash is interesting because light that goes through a prism, when you change the angle of that light, it also changes the you know, the type of light that you get back through the prism. So it's it's suggesting to me that the light source, which is the sun, somehow interacting with the firmament, something is changing to create a difference in frequency. I don't think it's just the fact that the sun is moving far away and, it, you know, light is going through the atmosphere and, and creating some sort of effect because the sun in a flat earth model where the sun is local, and again, the flat earth people say that it, the sunset happens just because the sun moves away from you. But we looked at the lumen problem. We looked at the heat problem. We looked at, you know, the, the afternoon and morning problem with the light change in frequency. All those problems prove to you that it's, sunset is not happening just because of perspective. Does that make sense? So this is just another point to add to that, which is that if this was happening just because of perspective, that's really tough because the sun never changes height. It just stays at the same height and moves farther away from you. And suddenly it's creating some sort of green flash. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense at all. Remember the lumens problem with 99.5 reduction in lumens from noon to sunset. And yet there's no change in lumens when there's winter, even though there's a 60% distance difference between the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer give or take, between the, the distance that the sun has to move, supposedly, from east to west for it to, to rise and set. So the distance that the sun moves from noon to sunset, that distance is a particular distance, 5,000 whatever miles, right, that we looked at. The distance between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer are 3,200 miles. That's about 60%. Meaning you should see something when the sun is in the winter, but you don't. You don't see less light. You don't see different, you know, afternoon light at, at noon. You don't see reddish light at noon. You know, you see a heat difference, but that's it. So this is the problem. The ball explains sunset with the curve that the, you're just rotating and, you know, the curve of the earth just hides the sun. It physically obstructs the sun. And it explains the fact that there's less light, drastic reduction in lumens, uh, frequency changes with the afternoon and, sun and morning, the green flash. It explains that. doesn't mean it's true. It explains it. It offers you an explanation that seems convincing. You can't reproduce that on a circle map with the sun just hovering over the surface and just, you know, whatever, moving in a circle, which it doesn't. It, it can't happen just because of perspective. These things tell us that the sun is somehow setting. But the question is, how the heck does that happen? And of course, that's that's an ongoing question that we'll have in this discussion. There are videos of the sun getting smaller and smaller online where it seems like it's just perspective. And there are also videos where it seems like the sun is setting, like the one you just saw, where it's this giant sun and it's just setting under the horizon. The green flash only makes sense if there's an altitude change of the source, meaning it's setting. But if it sets, how is it possible on a flat plane? That's the explanation that we don't have. What other explanations could there be for the green flash? Is it just refraction? I don't think so. I don't think that's enough. We need a better explanation because if that's the case, if refraction is causing it, then why doesn't it cause it at different times of the day? Why don't we see other type of phenomenon? Again, if you're going to argue refraction, then why don't you see a different color at noon when the sun is in winter? because it's thousands of miles farther away from you. Does that make sense? If you're gonna argue refraction and refraction is that crazy, why does it happen only when the sun's about to set, number one? And why don't you see other effects of similar refraction uh, when the sun is farther away, thousands of miles farther away, i.e. difference between summer and winter? Why don't you see that? So something is missing from our understanding, folks. I don't know what it is. I'm just presenting it to you. And if you have the answer, great. Now, number seven, this is, what's his name? Dave McKeegan. He's a globe, globe shill, but he brings up some good points. And these points are, you can't respond to these with the flat earth circular model. And this is why they're getting destroyed. So we're going to watch a video by him with light underneath planes, because there's sunlight being filmed underneath planes. And this destroys the idea that the sun is not setting, number one. And that it's circling around the earth and it's at 3,000 whatever miles above. It just, it doesn't work that way. 
It's a mystery, but let's watch Dave. Now, at the start of the year, I went across the pond to New York for a few days. And on one of the evenings, we went up to the top of the Rockefeller Center for sunset. We got there about an hour before the official sunset time and stayed there taking photos of New York until long after the sun had disappeared from view. Now, on a globe, the sun disappears below our horizon because the Earth is rotating. Flat Earthers argue that the sun is actually remaining at a constant altitude above a flat stationary Earth, although they can't agree on what altitude the sun is. Many flat earthers have said it's around 3,000 miles, others have said it's much higher than that, but most of those aren't prepared to actually put a figure on it. But the general consensus amongst seemingly a vast majority of flat earthers is that it is much higher than aeroplanes fly. And what we perceive to be sunset is actually just the sun moving away from us. Except whilst I was at the top of the Rockefeller, soon after the sun had set, so the sun itself was no longer visible, but the sky was still quite bright. I spotted about a half a dozen aeroplanes cruising in the sky between myself and where the sun had just set, and they were glistening with sunlight bouncing off them. Now, in this photo that I took, this antenna in view is the top of the H&M building. So I had a look at Flight Radar 24, and at the time that the photo was taken, there were several planes in that direction cruising just north of Baltimore, which would put them in the region of about 225 kilometers or 140 miles away. Some obviously a bit further, some a bit closer, but they were in the general vicinity of southern Pennsylvania. And the key question is, how is the light reflecting off a plane between myself and the sun that would allow me to see a reflection of the sun? High school physics covers the law of reflection, which is angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. I.e., if you shine a light at a mirror, whatever angle the light is approaching the mirror at is the angle that it will be reflected away at. So, given that the plane is much higher than me, and I'm seeing the sunlight reflecting off the underside of it, then the reflected light from the plane must be travelling downwards to reach me, meaning the incoming sunlight that's heading towards the plane must therefore be travelling upwards. That makes sense on a globe, because it's after sunset. The sun has moved below my local horizontal, and the plane is between us and above my horizontal, but if the Earth were flat, the sun would be physically higher than the aeroplane, so direct sunlight should never be able to reach the underside of it in the first place. So I would be very interested to hear any explanations from flat earthers as to how this observation would be possible on a flat Earth. I've heard one, because I posed this observation to flat earther Gary Wybenga during a stream on STSD's channel, Initially, Gary denied that you could ever see sunlight on the bottom of a plane until I informed him that I photographed it happening, to which Gary then changed his claim to saying that it's because planes fly nose up. So where I've got a photo oh, mm -hmm. of, of the sun glistening from the bottom of a plane after sunset, mm -hmm. how's that happening? Yeah, it's, it's just like going straight into the sun. The plane is tilted up slightly, right? Just a little bit. <laughs> What? Right? Uh, it, is the sun, is the, is, when you've got the sun on the horizon, it's perspectively, it's shining straight across, right? The plane is tilted slightly up because that's how they fly, right? Over the plane of the earth, they have a little, just a slight tilt up, which means you're going to get a slight angle to the bottom of the plane. I will admit uh, that response almost broke me. Now, commonly, yes, planes do indeed fly slightly nose up. Slightly. They don't fly perfectly level because at high cruising altitudes, the air is very thin. So to generate sufficient lift to maintain their altitude, they often fly with a slightly raised angle of attack on the wings. But we're talking about one degree here. If the plane was severely nosed up, then the people on board would all be wearing their drinks. However, even that wouldn't actually explain the observation because you can't get light to shine off the underside of an object when the object is that close to level and the light is higher than it. Easy test if you want to try this out. Find a faraway light source like a street light off in the distance. Lie yourself down on the ground. Take your phone and place it face down on the ground in front of you between you and the light source. Then 
Keep the phone parallel to the ground so it's still facing down, but begin rising it up and you will not see a direct reflection of that faraway light in your phone's screen. You will only see light that is traveling upwards towards the screen and the light source would therefore have to be physically lower than the screen. Plus, if it were because the plane is flying nose up, we should only ever see the reflection of the sun when the plane is flying away from us because then pitching the nose up would be bringing the underside of the plane towards the sun. Yet, I've seen this happen with planes that are flying across my line of sight, to which the pitch of the nose would make no difference, and I've even seen it with planes flying towards me, in which case the nose up would actually be shielding the underside of the plane from the sun. The only way I could hypothetically see it happening at all on a flat Earth would involve an insane amount of upwards refraction. When I was viewing those planes in New York, they were in the region of 225 kilometers or 140 miles away from me. They were cruising around 35,000 feet or 10,600 meters. Now, based on time and date sun moon map, at the moment I took that photo, the ground position of the sun was around the Cook Islands in the South Pacific, about 11,260 kilometers or 7,000 miles away from me. Now, as I mentioned earlier, flat earthers can't unanimously agree on what height the sun is, or even agree on a ballpark figure for it. However, I have had quite a few people give me the figure of about 3,000 miles, which is 4,828 kilometers above flat earth. Now, from my vantage point, given the height of the plane and the distance that it is away from me, presuming the earth is flat here for a moment, that would put the plane almost 2.7 degrees in the sky above horizontal from my location. So the light reflecting off the underside of the plane is traveling downwards at 2.7 degrees, meaning the light from the sun to the plane would have to be traveling upwards at 2.7 degrees. With the plane's altitude at 10.6 kilometers and the sun's altitude at 4,828 kilometers, that puts the sun 4,817 kilometers higher than the plane. From my location, the plane is 225 kilometers away and the sun is 11,260 kilometers away. So the sun is about 11,035 kilometers further away from the plane, which would put the sun 23 and a half degrees above the plane. So for the light to get from the sun to the underside of the plane, it would need to refract upwards. So the incoming light would need to bend by 23 and a half degrees just to get to level. It would then need to bend by a further 2.7 degrees upwards to get to the bottom of the plane, which is a total of 26.2 degrees of upwards refraction needed for the sunlight to get to the bottom of the plane on flat earth in this instance. But flat earthers cannot really use that explanation given how they dismiss atmospheric refraction when it's used to explain observations on a globe and globe refraction is nowhere near as severe as 26 degrees across 11,000 kilometers. That is also then presuming that after we've had this huge amount of upwards refraction to get the light to bend round to the bottom of the plane in the first place, the upwards refraction would then magically stop once it's reflected off the plane to get to us. Really, the light that's coming off the plane should be also refracting upwards, meaning that for me to see the reflection, the light coming off the plane would have to be coming off steeper than 2.7 degrees and bending upwards to reach my eye, thus meaning then the light hitting the plane must be coming in at steeper than 2.7 degrees as well, and so the whole total amount of refraction needed would be even higher. Now, I know I said you don't need maths for this, and then I've just spewed a load of maths for refraction, but really, you don't need it because it's not possible to get a direct reflection off the bottom of an object if the light source is higher than it. And the great thing is, like I said at the beginning, Pretty much anybody can see this happen. With so many planes flying these days, pretty much everybody lives within line of sight of high-flying passenger planes. So just watch out for them either just before sunrise or just after sunset. And if the plane is flying in the right path so that it goes between your location and the sun, you can often catch the sun glistening off it. Obviously, provided there's no clouds or anything blocking the light path. 
I've caught this happening quite a few times recently. In this video I took, the plane is flying across me perpendicular to my line of sight to the sun. You can see the plane is initially dark because I'm looking at the shaded side of it, but then the underside of the front begins to glow. That is the sun's direct reflection, which then slowly moves towards the rear of the plane as it continues flying, and then within a few seconds it's moved right to the back and then disappeared. So the reflections only occur on the plane in a very narrow window relative to me and the sun. If you catch the plane soon after sunrise or before sunset, then the light doesn't reflect off the underside and instead it winds up lighting up the side of the plane. And not too long before sunrise or after sunset, the plane doesn't get lit up at all. Now, it's worth clarifying here, I'm not talking about seeing general light coming off the bottom of the plane during the day. There's always light reflecting off the plane. If there wasn't, we wouldn't be able to see them, which is what happens at nighttime. But during the day, that general light is just light that's reflecting off the earth up to the plane. I am talking specifically about direct sunlight, which you can differentiate because it's much brighter, harsher, and it leaves a clearly defined shadow on the plane. Or when you see that glowing blob appear, that is a straight reflection of the sun itself. Now, I can imagine some potential flat earth or explanations. One might go down the road that the plane is cylindrical, so the light is shining against a curved surface. So just in case, we'll address that one. Firstly, curved surfaces would not really change anything. For the light to approach from above and still continue downwards, the surface would need to be heavily angled so that the sunlight is almost just glancing off the plane, which you wouldn't get from the underside in level flight. That would be more coming from the sides of the plane, so the underneath would still not be getting any direct sunlight. I mean, based on the figures we've already gone through, the sun should be at a higher angle to the plane than the plane is to me, so the light, if anything, would be glancing off the top of the plane. There is probably the other flat earth favourite explanation of perspective, that because we see the sun set near the horizon, that must therefore mean that the light is coming in from under the plane, even though the sun itself isn't but I will be amazed if any of them can actually show a practical demonstration that has a light above an object that doesn't involve long distances across Earth, which would be them presuming that that long distance is actually flat. Perhaps a clearer way of thinking of this is if you have light A that is shining light against a reflective surface, wherever that reflected light lands, you place a second light, we'll call light B, and shine it back at the reflective surface, the light from light B will go back to light A. Therefore, that must mean that if the Earth is flat, we can somehow shine a light towards the bottom of an aeroplane and have it reflect up into the sky to the sun. But just to drive a final nail into this, like I said, this is a fairly easy observation to make. Not only have I personally captured numerous examples of this, but I happened upon a video from a channel called X-Spot Aviation that does a lot of plane spotting videos. And one of theirs in particular I saw, I think absolutely destroys Flat Earth. It's a video titled High Altitude Plane Spotting. It's numerous clips of planes all flying at high altitude, and it's done with a very impressive camera setup because the views of the planes are extremely clear and the tracking is very smooth. And the video also includes all of the specifics for each flight as well, such as flight number, route, altitude, speed, etc. And there are two clips in particular that I would love to see Flat Earthers demonstrate. Both of them involving Emirates Airbus A380s flying between Dubai and London. Both stated to be at 40,000 feet and both captured at what looks more like sunset rather than sunrise. Both of them show exactly what I've been describing here with the clear reflection of the sun gradually moving across the underside of the left wing. However, both of these also show some interesting characteristics. Firstly is the middle of the fuselage underside is clearly lit by direct sunlight. This area of the A380 is not a curved fuselage section like the rest of the plane. It's where the undercarriage goes and it has a flat bottom to it. So that tackles any potential claims about curved surfaces being the cause. 
Secondly is that both planes are at 40,000 feet, so they're at a steady cruising altitude, and they're viewed for quite a long time, and there's no visible changes to their direction. So it's safe to say they're not banking or pitching, the plane is in steady level flight. Crucially though, is that not only do both videos show the undersides of the left wings being brightly lit, whilst the right wings are completely shaded, so the light is coming from the left side below the plane at a shallow angle, but we can also see clear shadows being cast on the underside of the wings. Those shadows are being cast by the engines, which are hanging below the wings. So the sunlight must be hitting the plane from below in order to be casting shadows of the engines upwards onto the underside of the wing. And to be casting clearly defined shadows like that must be direct from the light source. It can't be bouncing off the earth and reflecting up because that would evenly light the whole underside of the plane. Like I said, that's all easily explained on a globe because at that particular point, for the observer, the sun is below their local horizontal with the plane above them, so therefore the plane has direct line of sight to the underside of the plane. Explanation for flat earth? I guess we'll have to wait and see. That's going to wrap it up for today. As always, feel free to leave your... So, quite a lot in that one, but look, Dave McKeegan is right. He's a globe shill and he's annoying, but... You have to give it to him that he's right. He presents to you an inf a piece of information at this particular point that the flat earth people do not have an explanation. You saw that guy there, he's like, oh, uh, oh, yeah, it's moving upward. So are you kidding me? Like if your model says that the sun is 3000 miles at least above the earth's surface, that is not possible with a plane flying at, you know, whatever, 30,000 feet or whatever it is. But these are real observations, folks. These are real, they're devastating and the point is that sunset is not happening because of perspective only. It's not happening because the sun is moving away from you. It's just getting smaller and it disappears in the horizon. That's nonsense. You have the lumen problem that we talked about, meaning the light problem from noon to uh, afternoon to evening. That's a problem for the flat earth model. You have the green flash. You have the afternoon and morning light changes where in the morning it's blue and the afternoon is red. And that distance, we don't see that when it's winter. In the summer, we don't see the same effect happening there if distance is the cause of all these things. And of course, we have, uh, what else? We have lumen, green flash, afternoon, light underneath planes. This final point that we just said. All of these tell you that the, earth, that the sun is not just, first off, it's not moving above the earth, you know, uh, in a circle. That's number one. Number two, it's setting somehow. Somehow it's setting. The sun is setting. But how that works is a real mystery, especially if the Earth is not a circle. So we need more observations. We need better models. The flat Earth movement is easily discredited, and I think this is the point. The point is to be easily discredited, because these things don't hold up under scrutiny. Yes, the globe does explain this. It explains it really well. Of course, it's not true. It's, it's fakery. It's full of lies and math and conjectures, because we have evidence that the globe is nonsense. But it explains it. And so this is the problem, that we, unless we have a way to argue effectively, and again, we'll, I'll say this again, but this is why I don't make any claims about the size and position of the sun, what the moon is doing, what, I don't make claims about that, because I don't know. But I do make claims about the horizon, how Christianity is not compatible with heliocentrism because of the gospel, gravity, there's plenty of claims to make there, and water. All those, the, the big four, water, horizon, gravity, and the gospel. Those are the ones you want to focus on, and that's how to walk the narrow path in this biblical cosmology debate. Because it's not the globe, and it's also not flat Earth. It's something more mysterious. And being okay with not knowing some of those things, and being okay with mysteries and saying, I don't know, but I can tell you what it's not, because water's level, gravity's a farce. Gospel tells us that Earth has to be in a, in a biblical orientation with an enclosed you know, space and, and a flat model and local light sources, all the things we talked about in that short video. And of course, the horizon. The horizon is the simplest proof to me. You rise to meet your eye level. Whether you're sea level or whether you're on the top of a mountain, it rises to, be, to meet your eye level. That tells you that the earth is a plane, an infinite plane probably, because on a, on a ball of any size, the horizon would not rise to meet your eye level. It just wouldn't because the, the edges fall away because it's curving. 
So anyway, we need, we need a better model, folks. Now, let's talk about flight patterns. There's trips that you can book around the world, and they have basically the same amount of flight time when they shouldn't be if the Earth is a circle. On the flat Earth map, it should be at least double the time to fly in the southern hemisphere to do an around the world trip versus the northern hemisphere. And these are real flights, folks. These are real flights that people are flying on. The, the flat Earth community says, no, they're fake flights. You, you can't fly that. You no, know, they're real flights. And so that's, that's a real problem for the circular model because you get refuted very easily. Here's the circle map. And we'll just take these flights from Santiago to Sydney to Johannesburg to Sao Paulo in the southern hemisphere. So those four destinations versus New York to Los Angeles to Shanghai to Dubai in the northern hemisphere. Okay, if you, you plot those on a Mercator map, again, just pretend that there's continuity here. They're relatively equidistant, or uh, yeah, equidistant meaning they're the same distance. So they're relatively the same distance, these flights. But on a circle map, you see, because the circle gets distorted as you go outward, this should be at least double the length of this. And if you do this in a spreadsheet, and people have done this, here's the flights, here's the flight time, the average, and this is about, they're about the same. In fact, the one in the Southern Hemisphere is slightly shorter. It's 39 hours. This one is f almost 41 hours. So it's almost an hour shorter, a little, actually, a little over an hour shorter in the Southern Hemisphere, which is crazy. Now, again, maybe that's just because they're, these are, these are, uh, I think direct flights are, you know, they're, they're nonstop, meaning they go from one to another. They don't, there's no layo uh, layovers, but either way, they're the same, same distance. I think actually, yeah, no, what they did is probably what they did is they plotted the flights, direct flights <clears throat> to each of these locations. And so, yeah, th that's the curious thing is that the Southern hemisphere is an hour shorter. So there you go. These are real flights. You can look them up yourself. You can book them and... You can, you can fly yourself if you're not convinced. I am familiar with the book, uh, 16 Emergency Landings by Eddie Alca Alencar. I almost said, Al Al I almost said Alcazar because I'm, I'm thinking of Luis de Alcazar, the Jesuit who created preterism, but no, Eddie, a Eddie Alencar. But I'm familiar with his book. He has some convincing arguments. Again, this is where you have just very confounding evidence because the emergency landings that are documented in that book are very convincing but they're all in the northern hemisphere which is a problem north of the equator that seems to work but if you go south of the equator flight patterns totally break down and this is where the flat earthers get uh get themselves refuted the flights are too long the ones that i just showed you and the the flights just don't work they don't work to fly that far the distances are crazy some people say that there's an airline fuel hoax where oh they're, they're not really using fuel, they're using advanced technology and they're using jet streams and all this stuff. But folks, th these things are just, um, they're conjectures. You're not actually providing empirical evidence because the empirical evidence is these flight exists and the, the total flight time is the same approximately. So that's a real problem. New York to Tokyo is equal to Santiago to Sydney. So New York to Tokyo is about 13 hours. Santiago to Sydney is about 13 hours. People say this flight doesn't exist. It exists. Trust me, I've looked into it. I got into a lot of debates with people about this because I believed it didn't exist either, but it exists. This is a real flight, 13 hours, 13 hours of the same duration. And yet on a flat earth map, this thing is like double the, the, the distance of the other one. So that doesn't work. There's awkward flight patterns too in the Southern hemisphere. This is from one of these shill sites for the globe where it says, look, on the globe, it makes sense. And of course, it doesn't even make sense on a globe either way, but it makes even less sense on a flat earth map. Hong Kong to Perth to, Par to Port Louis. This doesn't make any sense to go here to here and then all the way there when you can just go straight from Hong Kong to Port Louis. So the, the flat earth map has its own fair share of awkward flight patterns. That's another thing that I caution you not to get up, swept up in debates of because you, there are so many confounding things with flight patterns. There are lots of flight patterns in the globe that are very suspect. But don't use flight patterns to justify your view of biblical cosmology because it goes both ways is the problem. That's the confounding part. Here's one again from this Flat Earth Dart WS site. It says, the Sydney Santiago flight route is one of the southernmost passenger flight routes. Such route is impossible if Earth were flat. It confirms Earth is a sphere, blah, blah, blah. So what they show you is that, you know, this, 
you know, they have their little globe map. But what the problem is this, Santiago to Sydney on a, on a Gleason map cuts right through the middle of the United States. And you don't see that. When you, when you fly from Santiago to Sydney, you're not cutting through the middle of the United States. Otherwise, you see it. And people say, oh, well, you know, you go around this way, and you use the jet stream, and that's how they fool people. No, because the jet stream actually makes things worse. You'll see in just a second, it actually debunks the, the circular model. Here's another problem with this, which is the east or west, you're constantly turning. There's no objective directions in the uh, circle map. People say there's an objective north, but not really. Because again, from where I'm standing in Phoenix, north, versus, you know, let's say somebody in Africa going north, to me, that's going west. So there's, there is no objective direction of where you're going. On top of the fact that east and west, you're constantly going in a circle. This is not what we observe. You go straight. And then you end up back where you are. You don't, you, like where I had this little, you know, Mercator map. You go straight, and then you end up back where you are, however that works. But, you know, we can talk about that in a little bit later. But you go straight. You don't keep curving like this. You don't keep curving. Because this is a problem. People don't realize how problem this is. And, of course, especially if they're going to argue the jet stream, which is not that significant. But if you're going to argue, then it causes even more problems. You know, we, we have this meme about the globe earth where it says, well... See how stupid the globe is, how basically, you know, 5,000 feet above the earth, there's a there's a diameter or a, or a circumference, basically, that you're flying over. But if you're at 33,000 feet, it's four times the flight time. Yeah, agreed. This is really silly because you're, you're going from one point to another on the globe. You're actually flying four times the flight distance. It doesn't make any sense. The, these memes are true. They, they point to a truth because you couldn't possibly be flying over a sphere. At ground level versus at 33,000 feet, the arc of the flight between these two points is much more significant. You'd be flying much farther. So these are the problems with, this, with the ball because there's these curvature problems. Well, the same thing is with the flat earth, the circular flat earth, where you're constantly curving, going back to this one, you're constantly curving one way or another to go east or west. That's nonsense. Just like you're telling them that they're having to nosedive constantly and how it's really stupid that they're telling you that they're nose diving, which they don't, they go straight. The same thing was with the flat earth Gleason map. You'd have to constantly be curving to go east or west, which doesn't happen. You go straight. The diameter of the flat earth map is about 24,000. The radius is about 12,000 miles. That means halfway. So these are approximates, but the radius of the Tropic of Cancer is about 4,800 miles. So this is, so from the North Pole to the Tropic of Cancer, this is about 4,800 miles. Okay. The radius approximately from the North Pole to the Tropic of Capricorn, about 7,200 miles. So the radius of the equator means it's about 6,000 miles. These are approximations, but give or take, this is what it is. Meaning if we draw circles with circumferences of, of these various radii, then we can have an understanding of how much curve you'd have to be curving in order to get to a particular direction. Just like with the nose diving problem. So we put this in the chat GPT. Plane traveling at a tropic of Cancer, which is 4,800 miles radius, so, you know, something like this. So from the North Pole to here, and it's traveling along the tropic of Cancer, okay? At 500 miles an hour, at, at this circumference, how much centripetal acceleration is there? And it's 10.4 meters per second. If the jet stream is on and they're going supposedly 1,000 miles per hour, you're at 41.6 meters per second. For example, like these, what do you call them, the Concorde airplanes? That's also another problem, too. They were flying, I forget how fast, but they were flying super fast. Mach, you know, what, two or something like that, I don't remember. But anyway, how do you explain that? How do you have this amount of centripetal force? Because the average roller coaster is 25 meters per second. 25 meters per second. So when you're on a roller coaster and you're going through like one of those loops, and whoa, whoa, that's 25 per meters per second on average uh, on, when you're on a loop, on a roller coaster, centripetal acceleration. So... When an airplane moving at 1,000 miles per hour, supposedly, on the Tropic of Cancer, which is the smaller circle, it would experience almost double the centripetal acceleration of being on a roller coaster being you know, pulled to your chair, which doesn't happen, folks. You just go straight, and you're cruising. Of course, it's slightly different based on the different circles and so on, but the point is it gets worse the, the farther out you go. So if you're going from you know, Santiago 
Chile to Australia, and you're saying that, oh, no, they don't actually go over the middle of the United States. They're going using the jet stream, and they're going this way over the ocean. Well, look at the size of the circle. You would have an enormous amount of centripetal acceleration going 1,000 miles per hour, trying to wind your way around the circle all the way till you get back to, uh, what do you call it, uh, Perth, Australia, wherever it is. It's nonsense. It is, it's nonsense. Two reasons why this is a major problem for the circular flat earth model. Number one, nobody experiences roller coaster level centripetal force and acceleration on these southern hemisphere flights. Nobody does. You just fly and you go straight. Number two, if you want to argue that the jet stream is happening and they're, they're doing all sorts of speed hacks and they're not actually using fuel, they're actually flying way faster. That's how they make up these times to be the same. That's actually worse. Do you get it? It's actually worse for the flat earth map. Because they say, well, the reason the flight times are the same is because they're doing all these speed hacks in the Southern Hemisphere and they're using technology. And okay, sure. Let's say they're flying 1,200 miles per hour and they're going around the circle of the Earth like this. this. This is nonsense. People would be glued to the side of the airplane with the amount of centripetal acceleration that would happen. It doesn't work. Flat Earth is also relativistic. You know, this is another Glober meme that says, you know, it's basically making fun of the Flat Earth, but <laughs> this is this is true. This is true, folks. You have no objective frame of reference. There's no difference between you and the globe. There's no difference. The globe has no objective frame of reference. Everything's relativistic. This is also relativistic, which tells you it's not from God, but it's from the devil, because there's no objective south, east, or west. God would not create a relativistic system. God creates objective truth and harmonious systems, the things that make sense, and straight lines. And of course, there's curves too, but there, there is objective north, there's objective south, there's objective east and west, and that doesn't work on this circle. It doesn't. Of course, what about the jet stream? Jet streams are things in the atmosphere that go from west to east. And the argument is that, well, these flights in the southern hemisphere basically use the jet stream to travel, to make themselves faster, to make up the flight times. But Again, the around-the-world flights in both hemispheres are the same flight, the same distance. In fact, the southern hemisphere is an hour uh, shorter than the northern hemisphere, which that's also interesting. We also have flights in both hemispheres that are the same distance, like New York to Tokyo versus Sydney to Santiago. Same distance, same, same um, time, 13 hours. And also the jet stream is not that significant. If you actually plot this out, for example, from Atlanta to Honolulu, Okay, west to east. That's 4,500 miles from Atlanta to Honolulu. If you plot the flight from Atlanta to Honolulu, meaning from west, from east to west, and then from Honolulu to Atlanta, from west to east, the difference between those two flights is only 45 minutes. Meaning whatever advantage they got from the jet stream is not that significant. It's not going to boost your speed by 500 miles an hour. That's nonsense. It's, you know... It boosts your speed for sure. It's an advantage, but it's not that significant. What about the jet fuel conspiracy? Of course, people say, oh, they're not actually flying on jet fuel. You saw all those little, um, whatever, contrails that they had. They're using some sort of compressed air. There's some some technology that's going on that we don't know. They're just charging you for the, for the flight to basically make profit, but they actually have different flight technology. Well, yes and no. I mean... I'm sure that they use some compressed air or something to help themselves that they're not telling people about. And of course, they're using that as a tool to basically jack up the prices and say, oh, fuel prices have gone up. I guess we have to you know, jack up prices and, and gouge you for money. But they are using fuel, folks. They are. If you, if you do the math, take, for example, an Airbus A380, which is huge. They take 250 tons of fuel. People say, no, that's not, that's not possible to put that much fuel. Actually, I mean, look at the size of these wings. Volume is a crazy thing. When you actually do the math and, and try to evaluate how much volume is in this thing, there's a lot of volume and in this fuel that can fit in here. And of course, again, I'm sure they use fuel for takeoff and probably for different parts. I'm sure they, they combine it with other things. I wouldn't be surprised. But they do use fuel. And another question is, how do they manage to fill these things up so quickly? That's something that I'm skeptical about. There's, there's some shenanigans going on there as well. But either way, they, it's very possible. It's very possible to fit that amount of fuel in these enormous 
you know, planes. I mean, look at the size of this thing. This guy is a tiny little dude, and these things are huge fuel chambers for these wings. They're, they're skyscrapers with wings, basically. So there's that too. I mean, you have to be more rigorous. Another thing with the Southern Hemisphere is, is this idea of military coverage in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. Of course, we know that they have Antarctica on lockdown. You can't go there without a permit. You have to be in the club to do anything. But on a flat earth map, it's nonsense. It's really nonsense. Again, this is another Glober meme, but they have a point. Are you saying there's military around the earth like this, like 60,000 miles of military coverage? This is insanity. They're not covering 60,000 miles of circumference. So this is this is nonsense. They have probably a, like if, again, if we go back to some sort of Mercator, Mercator projection, where who knows what the distance is here, but they have, you know, ports of of entry that they're monitoring and that's it. It's not it's not a circle like go back to our little meme here. This is nonsense to monitor 60,000 miles plus of coverage. That's not happening. They don't have they don't have that many resources. Sure, they can mobilize all the countries, but I doubt that I mean, it's it's I'm very skeptical. I'm very skeptical of this. This is nonsense. Of course, you also have something called the Vendi Globe. If you've ever heard about this, let's see if we can pull up our, uh, all right, here it is. What is the Vendee Globe since 1989? Solo, nonstop, and without assistance. This is a race that they do that is, it's been going around for, you know, almost 30 years. 45,000 45, kilometers or 24,300 miles as the theoretical distance of a sailor would sail around the world. A revolution accomplished with a record time of 74 days and three hours during the eighth edition of the Vendee Globe. 2016 and 2017. So 74 days and three hours. This planetary voyage is, is firstly a climactic climatic journey to sail down the Atlantic across the Indian Pacific Oceans, then sail back to the Atlantic. To be expected, a start from the Les Sables de Ron in mid-autumn, a trip in the heart of the Southern Seas in full austral summer, and a wintry return to Vendée. Vendée. 45,000 kilometer journey that they're going from basically France around Antarctica, supposedly, and coming back this way. This is a ball. We don't believe in a ball. The ball is nonsense. So how are they doing this? Because this is a real voyage. This is a real deal. And of course, um, the globe, or if I can get my image here, here we go. The globe uh, tells you that, oh, it's going through here and there, but this race is real, folks. On a circle map, it looks like nonsense. This is a race for time. They set sail eastward, and it's not possible because they're, they're first off, the distance on a circle map would be enormous. It, it just breaks down in the Southern Hemisphere. People say everything is fake, but this is, this isn't true. This is a real race. People that these people are monitored, they have, you know, GPS systems on them and so on and so forth. On a circle, it looks like this. See, it goes from here all the way around come back through. This is nonsense. This is not what's happening. People are not doing this in record time. This is not at all what's happening. But if you put it on a Mercator map, again, just imagine there's some kind of co connectivity or some sort of supernatural thing here going on. We'll talk about it in a second. But they go from France, they go out through here, and they go through there. Um, where is my little slide here? The next thing, if that's that. Okay, there we go. Yeah, James Cook also circumnavigated the Earth. And some tried to use his journey as proof that the Earth is a circle because of his journey. But it, the numbers don't add up, folks. They really don't. Again, the Flat Earth movement is very careless with their numbers and with their science. It's very careless, and that's why I think it's a PSYOP, and it's just very easily uh, discredited. The voyage of James Cook wasn't just around Antarctica. It's just typical misinformation that they use, like any other controlled opposition, to basically you know bait you with low-hanging fruit of a conspiracy and then give you misinformation. So if we look at, if I again have to turn this, uh, okay, here we go, here we go. Here we go, Captain Cook's voyage. First voyage of Captain Cook. The first voyage of James Cook was a combined Royal Navy and Royal Society expedition to the South Pacific Ocean in the HMS Endeavor from 1768 to 1771. It was the first of three Pacific voyages of which James Cook was the commander. The aims of this first expedition were to observe the 1769 transit of Venus 
and to seek evidence of the postulated Terra Australis Incognita, or Undiscovered Southern Land. The voyage was commissioned by King George III and commanded by Lieutenant Cook, a junior naval officer with good skills in cartography and mathematics. Departing from Plymouth Dockyard in August 1768, the expedition crossed the Atlantic, rounded the Cape Horn, and reached Tahiti in time to observe the, the transit of Venus. Cook then set sail into largely uncharted ocean to the south, stopping at the Pacific islands of Huayne, Barobara, Rayatia to claim them for Great Britain. In October 1769, the expedition reached New Zealand, being the second Europeans to visit there, following the first European discovery by Abel Tasman 127 years earlier. Cook and his crew spent the following six months charting the New Zealand coast before resuming their voyage westward across the open sea. In April 1770, they became the first known Europeans to reach the east coast of Australia, making landfall near present-day Point Hicks, and then proceeding north to Botany Bay. The expedition continued northward along the Australian coastline, narrowly avoiding shipwreck at the Great Barrier Reef. In October 1770, the badly damaged Endeavour came into the port of Batavia in the Dutch East Indies. Her crew sworn to secrecy about the lands they had discovered. They resumed their journey on the 26th of December, rounded the Cape Cod, the Cape of Good Hope on 13th March 1771, and reached the English port of Deal on 12th July. The voyage lasted almost three years. The year following this return, Cook set out on a second voyage of the Pacific, which lasted from 1772 to 1775. His third and final voyage lasted from 1776 to 1780. So Cook was all over the place. It wasn't just this, like, the way the flat earthers make it seem is they, oh, he went around Antarctica and he just, he charted the Antarctic and basically, there you go, that's how you know how big the earth is. It proves that the earth is a circle. Well, no, look at this journey. He went all over the place. He went up here. He went down there. He went up and down, up and down, up through here, up there. It, he was all over the place. It took him three years. He didn't just go to Antarctica and then just, you know, go around Antarctica on a circle map. That's nonsense. This is the second voyage. And again, you know, we can look, he describes it here as far as all these different places that it went to, but just look at the, look at the map. See that? Look at the, look how squiggly this is. Goes through here, there, comes back out through there, up and down, up and down, up, a couple of circles through here, meandering in the southern oceans, and then coming back and, and through here. This took, I forget how many years, let's see how many, it's 70, three years also. Another three-year voyage. This is an explanation about it, Captain Cook's Voyages of Exploration. I highlighted something on your second voyage. Cook's second Pacific voyage aimed to establish whether there was an inhabited southern continent and make astronomical observations. The two ships, Resolution and Adventure, were fitted out for the expedition. In 1772, before he set out, Cook created a map which showed the discoveries made in the Southern Ocean up until 1770 and, stretched, and sketched out his proposed route for the upcoming voyage. In 1773, uh, Accompanied by naturalists, astronomers, and an artist, Cook made his first crossing of the Antarctic Circle, claiming that he had been further south than any person. During a voyage of 100,000 kilometers, Cook sailed out, sailed south of the Antarctic Circle at 66 degrees, 30 south, minutes south, or whatever arcs, on three occasions, proving that the southern landmass was neither as large or as habitable as once thought. Cook also discovered several islands along the Scotia Arc, initiating the commercial interests that underpin much of the focus of the Antarctica over the, la the next 150 years. So his voyage was 100,000 uh, kilometers. But that doesn't add up on a circle map. It does not add up. Let's see if we can get our PowerPoint presentation back here. And there we go. It doesn't add up because of the southern, southern distortion of the circle. James Cook's journey would have been much, much longer. Do you understand? Based on how he was squiggling around, if the Earth was actually a circle, the journey would have been way more than 100,000 miles. So they refute themselves by trying to use James Cook. The circle map is 25,000 miles in diameter, approximately, 24, 25,000, meaning it has a circumference of about 78,000 miles or 126,000 kilometers. So now do the math. Even if James Cook was moving around Antarctica like this, going back to this one, if, he, if this was what James Cook was doing, Antarctica, this would have been way more. But he didn't. He went here, he went there, he went there, he went there. He was squiggling around. It would have been, if this was actually the way that it's laid out with, this, with the circle of the earth being 25,000 miles in diameter, 
his journey would have been 150,000 kilometers easily, not 100,000 kilometers. People say, oh, look, it's 100,000 kilometers, so it proves that the Earth is a circle and he went around this way. No, he didn't, because if you look at the journey, it was all over the place. And if it was actually on the circle of the flat Earth map, then it, it just wouldn't work, folks. It just wouldn't work. So this is the problem. If, he's, if it's just a straight voyage, then it would be even more than the entire journey. If he went straight around Antarctica, it would have been more than the entire journey listed, which is 100,000 kilometers. But it wasn't, and so it would have been even more. So the, the James Cook example basically refutes the circle flat Earth model. So now if the Earth is not a circle but has supernatural continuity, then there's no issue. Again, he just went through here, went through there, blip. Don't worry about how that works for now. Just imagine that it works, and it went back here. There's no problem. No issues with distance because the north and the south are equally sized. They're not disproportionate from each other. On a circle, the south is massively disproportional to the north, and that's the problem. So flight patterns summary. Around the world, flights are the same length, and you can check that for yourself, and the Gleason map doesn't explain that. It breaks down. East, west, south are always relative. The north is also relative as well. But just like a globe, it's a relativistic system, and we know that God doesn't produce relativistic systems. God is objective. East, west travel would also produce constant torque and, 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 and um, what do you call it, centripetal acceleration and force because of the roller coaster effect, especially for flights that are moving, having to fly 1,000 miles an hour, you know, supposedly with the jet stream and so on, that's an even worse situation because they're they're having to curve constantly around the circle of the earth. It's the same argument. Be, again, people say like, oh, it's so stupid that the globe says that the, the flights have to basically constantly nosedive on a globe. Well, yeah, that is stupid because that's not what happens. But it's the same thing with the circle map. Your flight has to constantly curve in order for you to fly straight. You see, the, you see that it's the same thing in a different package? The globe says, oh, we're going over the curve of the earth, which means you have to nosedive. You're, what you feel is you're going straight, but the globe says you're actually nosediving, really, but you don't feel it. Well, the same thing was with the circle. The circle says you're having to curve constantly, but you don't feel it, which is not true, because in this case, we have empirical proof that based on the amount of radius, especially on the really southern flights, you would definitely feel some sort of centripetal force. There's also things like the Vendee Globe, the James Cook uh, journeys. All these things prove that the Gleason map is false. They don't work. People would not be able to do this Vendee Globe and the James Cook journey on a Gleason map. It's nonsense. The Southern Hemisphere is huge. It's massively distorted. So logic and measurements and empirical evidence all break down in the Southern Hemisphere, which is a real interesting case. Now, I think we're on to the next part. And of course, yeah, the next part is another Northern and Southern similarities. I'm going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right. Well, I got some fat, I got some sugar, I got some salt, and I think I'm ready to go. So round two, we're now on part nine of this, which is Northern and Southern similarities. The Northern and Southern lights suggest that there's two magnetic poles, not one. We looked at videos with that. And of course, observations confirm that. In the flat earth model, however, you have one magnetic pole, which is the North Pole with Polaris. Some people argue that the Southern lights are just reflections, but how do you know that the Northern lights aren't, if that's the case? How do you know that the Northern lights aren't the reflection and it's the South that's the actual pole? There's no, there's no explanation for that. There's also no explanation on a circle map for the Southern lights. There's no mechanism being purported for that. If you're going to say it's a reflection of the northern lights, how is it reflecting across 12,000 miles of distance and, and, and only showing at the edge, which is the Antarctic in the circle map, and only North Pole? And, and people at the, at the, across the dome can't see it being reflected. That doesn't make any sense to me. It just, we have you have to provide empirical proof that that works rather than just say, oh, this is what's happening. Because this is how we get refuted very easily. And of course, if you believe in biblical cosmology, you're starting to realize that the narrow road is not going to the left or to the right, like with all things. It's not flat earth and it's certainly not the globe either. But either way, there's a lot of flat earth failures on this when it comes to the northern and southern similarities. There's also a lot of 
uh, North Pole mythology with the uh, with the Northern Lights. Like there's Mount Maru there and the Garden of Eden used to be there and all of this stuff that really is not at all substantiated by history. Now, who knows? Maybe there may be something in the North Pole. I don't know what's the North Pole. I don't know what's at the South Pole either because I know that they haven't been to the South Pole with the, the at least well, at least the claim that they've made where they've put that, um, you know, where you go to the South Pole. It's not actually the South Pole. It's, it's a place that's off to the side a little bit. And of course, the Freemasons were the first there. We talked about that in the heliocentric conspiracy, but either way, this is it. You have Northern and Southern lights. These are what they look like. They look the same. And this happens both in the South and in the North. So the question is, how does this happen? It's not just reflection, folks. These are electromagnetic phenomena, which again is consistent with the reality that there are two poles, like a magnet, the dance of life. God creates everything in twos, male and female, up and down, left and right. Everything's about relationships. And so does it surprise you that the earth is maybe, first off, an electromagnetic system, we know that, but like a magnet where it's got two poles, a positive and a negative side, or maybe just two foci, maybe it's better better stated. And the, these are also another issue with the constellations being visible from South America and Australia. See, on a globe, this again, this, these are glober memes, but they, they have a point, folks. They have a point. You have to give it to them. Jakarta, Sydney, Papa Ete, Santiago, they all on a globe face a certain direction, so they see the same stars. Of course, we know the globe is nonsense. It's baloney, but on a circle map, it's even worse. Look at this. How can Santiago and Jakarta see the same stars? Or Papete and Johannesburg and Sydney? It's impossible. The reality is that they do see the same stars. They see the same constellations. Of course, they're in different positions, but they're, they're seeing the same stars. This is not possible on this. This orientation does not produce this because each of these people are facing south in a completely different direction because it's relativistic. It's nonsense. Southern Cross, also another problem. It's visible from all southern continents, but it, that's not possible on a circle map because, again, the circle map, everybody's pointing a different direction. How can Santiago and Jakarta or Sydney and Johannesburg see the same thing like the Southern Cross? It's not, it's not possible, but yet you can see it. And people do see it. So these things can't be overlooked. Polaris is also another problem, which interestingly enough, what's the name Eric Dubay touched on, that you can't see it past the equator. So you have the equator. Anything south of the equator, you can't see the uh, Polaris anymore. It's at the horizon. So at the equator, Polaris is at the horizon, which doesn't make sense to me if the Earth has a dome where supposedly it's 3,000 miles high and the sun is maybe even higher than that or who knows what it is, and Polaris is at the top. You should be able to see it based on perspective. doesn't make sense on a circle with a dome if Polaris can't be seen from the equator. It doesn't make sense. Why is Polaris not being seen a problem? Well, it's very simple. If Polaris is at the center of the circle and you can't see it after 6,000 miles, give or take, where the equator is on the circle, <clears throat> This means that the dome has to be very low. It has to be a particular height. And that creates other problems with the position of, of the sun, the moon, and everything else that we've been talking about. Do you understand? So the, the, the distance of 6,000... I haven't actually calculated this, but I, I'd be interested to find out. What would the dome height have to be in order for, at a range of 6,000 miles, you, it would be obstructed by perspective? How high would the dome have to be? I, don't, I can't imagine that it would have to be very high. And the question is, they have observatories in the south. They have observatories. They have telescopes. Why can't they see Polaris if it's flat? If it's a flat plane and you can bring everything back into her your horizon with, um, you know, with magnification, then why can't you see Polaris from the observatories in the southern hemisphere? Because they have observatories, but they can't see it because it's obstructed. The question is, how does that work on a flat plane? That doesn't work, at least not the way that we've been told. The globe, of course, explains it like everything else with the curve. Oh, it's just behind the curve. You can't see it. Like this stupid little drawing here. You see, oh, it's behind the curve. See, here's Polaris and here's Sydney. You can't really see it because the curve's in the way. Oh, I guess that's how it works. Well, no, it's not how it works. So the Earth isn't a ball. So, but this is not how it works. So we need, we need a better model. We need better science. We need better detail, rigor. Um, yeah, so that's Polaris. Number 11 is the moon in two places at once. 
The moon can be photographed in darkness and in light at the same time, which should not be able to happen. That, that's nonsense on the circular flat Earth model. The globe explains this with conjectures, obviously, as usual, with the huge size of the moon, curvature, so on and so forth. But with a flat Earth model where you have local light sources, this is a real problem to, for it to be in the dark and in the light at the same time. How is this possible is the question. At the very minimum, it proves that the moon is not under the firmament, but somehow outside of it, or maybe it's a projection. Again, the lunar waves, who knows what it is. Here's a globe explanation of it. Here, here's person A, person B. <clears throat> here's the moon. And of course, one side's in the dark, one side's in the light. Person A takes a photograph, person B takes a photograph, everything's solved, right? That's how it works. Well, again, the earth isn't a ball, we know that. But how do you explain this on this orientation? where it's a flat plane and everybody can see the moon. And the sun is also local and it's over here doing its thing. How can you? How can the moon be in the darkness and in the light at the same time? Does that make sense? That does, that does not possible with this orientation. The moon is local and it's either in the light and you can see it in the light and everybody sees it in the light, or it's out of range of the light and everybody's seeing it at night. You can't, you shouldn't be able to photograph it in two places at once, but people can do that. How is that possible? How, how does that work? Something is missing b behind this model. Of course, this is not the truth because it's a circle, but something's missing about our understanding of how these luminaries work. The moon is not a physical object inside the firmament, but probably a projection on top of it. It's two-dimensional. Everybody sees the same side, which is another problem too, because again, if you have <clears throat> all the southern continents, when they look at the moon, they see it upside down, which should not be possible on a circle. So here's the moon from Canada. It's this way. Here's the moon from Australia. It's got its little features upside down. So <clears throat> everybody in the Southern Hemisphere sees the moon upside down. But that shouldn't be possible. Again, if you have a little fennet fox here, and where is that? Look how cute he is, or she, whatever. And is, what is this? South America and Australia. So you have two fennec foxes, one in South America, one in Australia, and they're both looking up at the moon. And they both see the moon upside down. That doesn't make sense because this one should be seeing it one way and this one should be seeing it another way. This also, by the way, proves that the moon is not an object, like, like a 3D object. Because if it were on a... If, we know the Earth is flat, but if, if it were an object, then people should be able to see the back of the moon if they're, you know, in different parts of the world. But they don't. We see the same side every time, no matter where you look. So that proves that the moon is not an object, but it also proves that the earth is not a circle because then this would not be possible. Also, there's the moon map. If you haven't heard about that, then, you know, get your seatbelt, get some popcorn. There's this idea that the moon <clears throat> is a plasma photograph of the earth. And once you see this, you can never unsee it. So like I said, grab your seatbelts. There's definitely... A lot of evidence to this and people have taken the moon and basically seen that it's a it's a map it's a map of the world at least uh, of part of the world maybe and they've identified the continents on there it's really fascinating but it shows basically we'll, we'll get a bit better picture of this here this is the moon this is the moon it's turned green and stuff and there's labels on it and the place where we live is here and there's this land, supposedly, if we're going to be consistent, this is land that's beyond somewhere. It's beyond, beyond the earth. And maybe the earth is just this giant plane. And maybe there's more to it. I don't know. But the moon map is a really confounding situation. The sun, some people say that basically the sun, there's this giant circle of the earth. And here's the sun and it goes in its circle. Again, we, we know that it doesn't go in a circle, but just this is what they say. Here's the earth, flat earth, and the sun is circling like this. And then there's the procession of the equinoxes, which basically the sun does this every, you know, 20,000 whatever years. And so, you know, there's a new society every, every so often. And so these, all these ancient lands are probably pre-flood and so on. And there's a lot of mythology that goes with this, but nevertheless, it's, it's convincing. And it also has a, a structure or an island for Lemuria, which they have recently discovered. Of course, they're not going to call it Lemuria. They, they found a giant continent submerged in the Pacific Ocean. 
And of course, Lemuria is an ancient continent, just like Atlantis that people were talking about. So my guess is that if this is a photograph, it was taken at creation when all of the land masses were, you know, maybe a little, little different. But here's a different picture. Here's the moon. Here's the, you know, coloring applied to show you the uh, land masses. And this, this gets really interesting because, again, here's a map of it. And you have all of these countries are very well identified in, in this moon map. And it's a very fascinating thing. Like I said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And the question is, if that's the case, what's all this other stuff? What's this hole up here? Maybe is that, you know, the, the top of the firmament? This is a really interesting thing. And of course, there's a lot of theories about it. I, I don't think, I'll tell you what I think in just a second. We'll watch a video on it. But it is nevertheless very interesting. I think this is the video. On the moon map. Let's watch the moon map. The true flat Earth map is the plasma moon map, which reveals the hidden continents of Atlantis, Lemuria, and Pangaea. Now, really quick, this is not the true flat Earth map. I'm just showing you something because we're going to address it. But still, very interesting. Beware of Gleason gatekeepers. Gleason gatekeepers are the controlled opposition agents of the satanic cabal. They promote or sell the Masonic United Nations as a monthly equidistant or Alexander Gleason false flat earth map to suppress the true flat earth map displayed on the plasma. Controversy, conspiracy, the true flat earth is in the moon, not in the Gleason map. Moon, which mirrors the larger and stationary flat earth in real time, revealing the hidden or forbidden continents of Atlantis, Lemuria, and Pangaea. By misleading the masses with the false flat earth map, they also suppress vital information about macro climate change and the North Pole shift. If mitigation measures are not implemented, macro climate change and the North Pole shift may have dire consequences for all the living organisms in the world. The clips coming up next. 1. The moon is a map of Earth. 2. Flight and marine traffic maps. 3. Hidden or forbidden continents. 4. Time zones and daylight movement. 5. Macro climate change and North Pole shift. The clips are from the documentary Plasma Moon and Greater World Map. The moon is a live reflection of the Earth like a mirrored X-ray. In this way it reveals to us all part of the terrestrial and oceanographic surface of the Earth. These characteristics serve as the full map of Earth. Got some good techno music, a sexy accent, what more could you ask for? This is not how it works. I'll show you in just a second how flights debunk this, but still, it's very interesting.
This is, by the way, the the processional the um, procession of the North Pole that they're saying that basically, in this model, the sun moves around the magnetic North Pole, but this circle is not the entire circle. So that's why there's the ice wall, so to speak, of Antarctica. But really, Antarctica is just ice because the sun isn't moving there. And so all of this rest of the Earth is covered in ice. But this processes over the course of, you know, whatever, 24,000 years. And it goes around like this and around in a circle. And it comes back. So what he was saying is that, you know, climate change is actually caused, which again, to me, is like, okay, if you're going to bring in climate change, that to me is a red flag. But either way, you're saying that basically the North Pole moves... And as a result, the, the area where the sun is also moves. And so different lands are being revealed over time and hidden over time. And these are hidden lands. So again, it's very, very seductive, but I'm not entirely convinced. You see, time zones in this, it just, it doesn't work because these things break down on a, on a circle. Everything just becomes really ridiculous. Anyway, back to some more techno music. See this, the techno music is so nice, but I hate to interrupt it. But you see, this is this is 3,200 years ago. It was, you know, somewhere around here. That doesn't make sense. We have we have lots of stuff from, like the 3,200 years ago was the flood for sure, and that created like an ice age of some kind. It wasn't because this was happening. It was because after the flood there was an ice age, because there's there's actual explanations for that. The flood is actually a better explanation for the ice age than what the globe tells you. But it's not because the procession of the North Pole was changing, which again, this is relativistic, but anyway. Please share or re-upload everywhere. Spread the truth about Plasma Moon, Flat Earth, Greater World Map, Hidden or Forbidden Continents, and Macro Climate Change. Be part of the Flat Earth Movement. No, don't be part of the Flat Earth Movement because the Flat Earth Movement is a deception. This stuff is very interesting. It really is. Uh, however, you can see the subtle tangents into Gnosticism, hidden forbidden lands. This is where the Anunnaki are from and so on and so forth. So this is how they get you folks. They give you something that's true. When you look at the moon, and for sure, if you take the negative of the moon, uh, you can create, like if we go back to this thing, you can create a map. And the map is uncannily representing all of the continents of the earth with even ones that were not were they're not here anymore which is lemuria which was in the um, i think pacific ocean or somewhere yeah so so there's definitely something there absolutely but they, they and then they take that into oh it's hidden lands is the, the procession of the north pole and all this other kind of nonsense that of course uh the enemy takes it and infiltrates so it's clear the moon is a photograph of some kind i've studied this quite a bit i definitely uh, recommend that you look into this for yourself if you find it interesting, the moon map. Of course, utilize discernment because most of these people are very new agey and so on. But nevertheless, again, once you see it and you look at it, you're like, okay, that, that makes total sense. It's a photograph. It's an energy plasma photograph that was probably created at creation when everything was let there be light and it imprinted a snapshot of the world somehow in the moon, which again, I think that's very plausible. I don't, I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. And certainly the evidence seems to suggest that. Remember the lunar waves and how that suggests that the moon is a two-dimensional image of some kind. The problem, though, is distortion. And the thing is that 
even though you can identify the continents on there very well and you can see the relationships, it's very, very distorted. It's very obvious that these things are very uh, you know, distorted, especially as you go outward, which is the same problem as the Gleason map. There's no difference. They're telling you the Gleason map is Masonic and evil and, we're, and they're giving you an erroneous interpretation of what you see. Because what you see, I think it's legitimate to believe that the moon is representing the earth in the sense it's, a, it's an image of the earth. However, you're not looking at a perfect image in the sense that, because it's perfect in some sense, right? But in another sense, it's not, I should say, you're not looking at a perfect representation of the earth. You're looking at a circle. We don't know how the projection was created, what medium it went through, what lens it went through, and so on, because it has the same problems as the Gleason's or any circular orientation. It's distorted. Flat Earthers argue that there's probably this conspiracy by the United Nations to hide the true Flat Earth, well, like you saw, but this isn't the right map either, and it's easy to prove. It really is. You just go to their Flat Earth map, you find that Tokyo to New York, Sydney to Santiago. Remember, they say, oh, this is how flights work. Well, they don't work that way. Sydney to Santiago and Tokyo to New York are two flights that are completely different on the circular map. They are, the, the Southern Hemisphere one is twice the distance of this one in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you plot it out on their map, here's the moon map. <clears throat> here's New York approximately to Tokyo. And there's, uh, what is it, uh, Santiago, Chile. Here, that's the end, it's South America, you can kind of see it. And all the way to Australia. Or is it Lemuria? No, it's not Lemuria. Maybe I went to Lemuria instead. But anyway, I think it's Australia. Anyway, this distance... No, because this is Lemuria. This dark one is Lemuria, I think. Yeah, so it, it crosses the Pacific Ocean and it goes to Australia. This distance, either way, is the same thing. Double the distance, you see? This is not true. It's not how this works. Now, in this case... The interesting thing is that the, the flight directions are different too, though. If you see, for example, on the Gleason map, one thing that's a clear reason why it's not true is that this has to cut through the middle of the United States. So that's interesting, that on this one, it actually cuts through the Pacific Ocean like it's supposed to. Nevertheless, it's twice the distance as the other one. So that, does, that doesn't check out. The flight problems are the same. Like if we plot those other four, here's the, here's the four we looked at in originally. Santiago, Sao Paulo, Johannesburg, and Sydney. Okay, in the Southern Hemisphere. Los Angeles, Shanghai, Dubai, and New York. Okay, well, you do that on the moon map and you get the same thing. Look at the, look at the size differences of these flights versus the flights in the Northern Hemisphere. It doesn't work. This is not how things work. Empirical data does not support this. But it's obvious that this is a map. So the question is, what's going on? Well, the, the answer is that this is distortion. It's a map of the Earth, folks. The moon is a photograph. And like I said, once you see it, you'll never see it. You know, Every time you look at the moon, you're like, wow, I can't believe that. You'll never look at the moon again the same. However, it's a distorted photograph because it's, it's in a circular fashion. So whatever it went through to be created somehow uh, distorted it. So the moon map is very fascinating, it's very interesting. At the very least, it, it proves, I think, that the moon is a 2D, 2D projection and not an object, which again is consistent with what we see. But if that's the case, then we can't be on a circle because the circle map says the moon is this object in the, in the heavens and it's circling around like this, it's not doing that. And because, remember, the two fennec foxes looking, if we have our little, little graphic, they're both looking at the moon, and if the moon's a 2D projection, because the moon map basically tells us it's a projection, they shouldn't, people from opposite sides of the world should not be seeing the same moon direction. Because, <clears throat> again, from the southern hemisphere, you see upside down, the northern hemisphere, you see it right side up. That's, that shouldn't be possible on this orientation of, of the Earth. But on a square orientation, where there's an objective north and objective south, it's possible. Number 14, dome versus firmament. Here's the classical representation of a circle with two spheres and a dome, but this is not how it works. It gets so much more complex and confounding than this. The dome is an assumption. The Bible never says, quote unquote, dome. It just says expanse. The word is rakia. Now, rakia comes from the word raka, which means to beat 
to stamp out and spread a metal. But either way, it's not, the Bible never says a dome. Dome comes from some ancient cultures concept. Remember, for example, the ancient cosmology episode we looked at. But, you know, like Isaiah 40, 22, Psalm 19, 4, they both say tent for the sun. But tents can be different shapes, folks. These are all kinds of tents right here. Look at these pictures. There's a square tent with a pyramid on top. There's kind of a, a hexagonal tent with, with different sections, a, a more circular tent, but it's a square. I mean, there's so many different orientations for a tent to be. A tent doesn't mean dome. A tent just means a covering for the sun. What about Operation Fishbowl, <clears throat> where the military claims that they, they sent a Thor missile 680 miles up into the atmosphere, supposedly, and it detonated at 250 miles. The problem is that we have amateur footage of the GoFast 2014 rocket, if, you've, uh, if you know what I'm talking about. If not, you can look it up yourself. Very interesting little piece of footage where they have a camera strapped to this rocket, and it's just going and going and going, and then it stops. It goes 73 miles and stops suddenly. And so the point is, if it stops suddenly as if it hit the firmament, but it didn't hit like an object, if it hit like a glass ceiling, it would have exploded at that speed, but it didn't. It just goes, shoop, and just kind of like rotates like this, just in some sort of stasis. Like it hits a magnetic field, basically, and just stops. But that was 73 miles in the air. So the question is, how do you reconcile these two pieces of evidence? We know that the government's always pulling shenanigans and lying, but let's say if they did detonate it at 250 miles, or even 680 miles if it went up that high, then how do you reconcile a height of 73 miles where this thing obviously stops in something? Something seizes it. Is it a force field? Is it a magnetic field? I don't know. Something stops this rocket. It doesn't fall back down. It just stops. It floats around in this thing, and it comes back down. So that's really something that doesn't make any sense, because that's obviously empirical evidence, and we have it on video, and it's from an amateur place versus what the military is saying. But either way, if we take the military's word on it, if we go to Johnston Island, this is where Johnston Island is. This is a little bit southwest of Hawaii, slightly southwest in the Pacific Ocean. This is where they launch their missiles. And again, this is on a flat Earth map. If you find that coordinate, you know, which is, it looks like it's north of Hawaii, which again, these representations on a, on a circular map are not, they're not the best. But either way, let's say this is where it launched it from, and we're on a flat earth with a circle. Now, notice the arrow here where they did the GoFast 2014 launch in Nevada, in some desert Nevada. The place where they launched it in Nevada is only 24 degrees difference from Johnston Island. Can't really tell here as far as the latitude, but it's about 20 to 24 degrees, which is not super significant, but it is very significant in the sense that they have two different results. How can they both have such vastly different results? Even if we say that they got as high as only 250 miles with the Thor missile, because they detonated it. Let's say they didn't actually get to 680 miles, they're lying, but they detonated their firmament at 280 miles. Okay, well, that's still way higher than the GoFast rocket. Something is not adding up between these two um, empirical evidence. Of course, we don't know if the military's results are empirical because they always lie about everything, but the GoFast rocket is empirical. So if we take the military's word on it, something is not adding up to either, if they're both right, then the firmament is doing some strange thing. Maybe it's curved, maybe it's oscillating, who knows? But this should not be the case. You shouldn't have a result that's 73 miles and then it stops and then one that goes, you know, hundreds of miles in the atmosphere. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Also, when you go with the dog cam up to 100,000 um, miles in the air, <clears throat> 100,000 miles, 100,000 feet, there's no, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no lights. There's no stars. This is 100,000 feet in the air, flat as a board. There's no, there's no stars. Where are the stars, folks? Look at that. I mean, there's no stars here. They're not above. They're, they're not shining anywhere, which is just a fascinating thing. It's very interesting. The sun is obviously behind. I wonder if it's going to get the sun pretty soon. But you see, flat as a board. This is impossible on a ball. But either way, 
there's nothing to look at. There's no stars. So where are the stars? That's a really curious thing. Next, we have conjectures, or I should say theories about the sun and the moon, and where are they, whether they're inside or outside. If the sun and the moon are inside, and they're on the same track, like our little graphic here, the, the classic flat earth graphic, right? Where these two objects are two spheres, and they're kind of just orbiting around the earth like this, which is not what's happening. If this was the case, then we should expect to see way more solar eclipses total solar eclipses, but they're rare. They happen every, I don't know, many years, that's for sure. The moon is not the one causing the solar eclipse. We know that because the solar eclipse goes from west to east. And you don't see the moon coming up to the sun. And if the sun and the moon are inside the firmament, like that graphic, the classic flat earth graphic, then there should be no triangulation problem. Meaning the problem that Eratosthenes supposedly solved is that when you have three points and you're trying to triangulate where the sun is, if you saw episode four in this series, then you have a triangulation problem because you never get the right angle of the sun because there's refraction. That's the whole point. But if there's, but if these luminaries are inside the firmament, then there, there should be no triangulation problem, meaning the firmament shouldn't be refracting their, their light. And should, you should be able to triangulate the sun successfully. But you don't. Now, it's possible that the atmosphere may still be responsible for that. So here's the, you know, if we go back to our little graphic, here's the dome, they're inside the dome, and then the, the atmosphere between you and the sun somehow is, you know, re refracting and creating the triangulation problem. I don't know. But either way, um, it's hard to say. Because there's other things that tell you that there is refraction, like the green flash, like the triangulation problem. There has to be something in front of you and the sun, meaning there's a lens between you and the sun. There has to be some sort of lens or medium. The atmosphere, I don't know, the atmosphere seems to me like there are there is refraction through the atmosphere, but I think there's also something else, right? There's the ether, which carries and oscillates medium, uh, light is a medium, but there's something more. There's something more to this because of those other problems that we stated. If the sun is outside the lens, meaning outside the firmament, then a total eclipse would make the whole world dark and this doesn't happen. Do you understand? So if here's this, here, I don't know, I could do this. If the sun is outside the dome, and just imagine it, and something covered the source of light, the entire dome would be black. Does that make sense? Except we don't, we don't see that. So if we look at this video, you can see here's a eclipse, solar eclipse being filmed mid-flight. Wow, look at that. Here it comes. Oh my God, look at it. Here comes the shadow, look at that. It's like a tornado. Oh my God, here we go. Here we go. Oh my God. Oh my God. Watch how you're gonna see once it's covered, it, you still see light. It's not, it's not covering everything in blackness. Here we go. Look at this. Oh my God, it's coming. The moon's shadow is coming. It is coming. Oh my God, here it comes. Look at this. I've never seen it like this, ever. Only in a plane. No flashes. Oh my God, here we go. Look at it. Oh my God. Whoa. Look at that. Oh my God. Here we go. Oh my God, it's coming right over. It's like a storm. Look at this. Oh my God, we're getting close. Getting close. No filter. Oh, I got Corona. There it is. Diamond Valley's beads. Valley's beads. Diamond ring. Look at that. Corona. Jump. See, there's still light. There's some refraction going on, but it's it's not total blackness when the moon, or it's not the moon covering the sun, but when there's a solar eclipse. Totality. Totality. Oh my God. Look at that. Totality. Oh my God, look at those streamers. Look at the crumbs, it's all prominences. Look at that. This is interesting too. I don't know if you see this, but you see these little, we'll talk about this with the multiple suns phenomenon. See how these are, this is not a lens flare. These are, I don't know what they are. It's, it's, it's like it's multiple suns. When we get to the two suns phenomenon, you'll see this again. These are not lens flares. These are, I don't know what they are. 
basically it's like two sons kind of situation but something's happening prominences look at the moon red all around full shadow completely elongated oh my god look at that look at that streamer seven o'clock prominences 12 o'clock two o'clock ten o'clock streamers look at that elongated Oh my God, look at that, absolutely amazing, oh my God, totality, oh look at that. So that's basically, we have video proof of a total eclipse in the air and you still see light, whereas if the, if you had a, let's say you had a dome and you had a flashlight, you can do this at home and just shine it into the dome and now cover the flashlight. There'd be no light anywhere. And yet, if you look at this picture, here's, you see the light, there's light being refracted and bounced off and there, there's still light. It's not like the entire world is dark, right? There's only a period, there's only a place where it's dark, but the rest of the world has light when there's a total solar eclipse. Not everybody sees it, which would be the case if the sun was outside the lens, meaning that the sun cannot be outside the lens, the firmament, which again, there's evidence that it is inside and there's evidence that it's outside. So this is this is the problem with the dome versus firmament uh, topic that we're on, that there's contrary evidence on both sides. This creates a mystery. The moon is clearly a 2D projection. We know that from the moon map. We know from the lunar waves. We know from the fact that you only see the same side. It's clearly 2D. Remember that scientist in the 1960s that said that it's a plasma phenomenon? So it can't be inside the firmament. Otherwise, people would see it differently. It's not an object. It's, it's a projection of some kind on the firmament. But if the sun is a projection, there's no evidence that it suggests that it's a projection, meaning it looks like an object. There's no lunar waves. It's, it's an object moving through the sky. So the question is, what is the sun? I don't know. I think that eclipses are so, some, some sort of electromagnetic phenomenon. Like when you put a magnet up to a TV screen, it creates this interference of magnetic fields and it creates what looks like an eclipse. And we, we know that we live in an electromagnetic realm with gears spinning the, the two vortices of the earth. You have the northern and southern. It's like a giant magnetic double toroid maybe. I have no idea exactly what it is, but I can see the patterns coming through it. If the sun is a projection with a source, here's some other problems. And the source is moving over the dome. The source has to move at a different speed than the sun. Like that video we saw where the penny was being dragged across and you had this, you know, the little um, penny across and the, the little, I think it was an aspirin or something, it was getting dragged across. So these things need to be reproduced. We have no, we have no evidence that this can work with a projection. This is why the flat earth is being so easily refuted because the map is wrong and the model is wrong. All of the claims that the flat earth makes are wrong. That's why I said, stick to the main four and the rest accept a mystery. Because the point is not that you understand what the cosmological system is. That's not the point, folks. The point is you, number one, don't get deceived by heliocentrism because it's a false sign of wonder to bring the world back to the beast. And two, that you marvel at God. And if you try to explain everything, you're not going to marvel and not going to nurture the part of you that sees mysteries and learns to think in depth and detailed. You're going to nurture the part of you that wants low-hanging fruit and wants a quick answer. So you don't want to do that. Flat earthers are making constant claims that can't be backed up, like as you can see, and they get easily refuted. So here's an example. Here's the dome, let's say a circular earth. Here's you. Here's the, the apparent sun and then the actual sun, the source. The refraction is the blue line, meaning Here's the source, but it's being refracted, so it looks a little lower than it. The actual sun is higher than the than the what it looks like, okay, because of refraction, whether that's the firmament or the atmosphere, whatever. And let's say the sun moves like this across the top of the dome, and the and the refraction of it moves what you see, which is the zenith. Again, the sun does not move in an arc, but you know, just for the sake of drawing here, this is what it is. It's a straight line. But either way, let's say the sun does this. Well, the the distance. X, right, the, the top distance, is much greater than Y. Has to be. So how, do, how does this work exactly, where they're moving, in a, where this thing is moving slower than this, and this thing is moving faster than this? 
and yet they're they're arriving at the same point at the same time. That doesn't doesn't make sense. We need we need empirical evidence that this could even happen. First off, if the sun is atop of the dome and it's moving, let's just say laterally, it moves like this, and you have here's the apparent sun, and somehow it's moving through the sky. <laughs> however, that works. Then you have the same problem again. You have x, which is the distance that the source travels, and y which is the distance that the projection travels, they're different. This time, this one's shorter, this one's longer. And the refraction here is not realistic. This is absurd. That the sun would be so far up, and then you would see it down here. That doesn't make sense. This is more realistic, because in fact, you'll what, what you remember from episode four with Eratosthenes, the globe says that refraction makes the sun look lower than it actually, the apparent sun is lower than the, ah, I get this, I always get these mixed up. The globe says that the apparent sun is higher than the actual sun, right? So when you see a sunset, you're, the sun is already set. You're actually just seeing a refraction. Whereas the truth is, because you're living on a plane, the actual sun is much higher, or I should say a little higher than the apparent sun, because you're on a plane with a local light source. So it's a little higher and the atmosphere is diffracting it. That's why you have a hard time uh, triangulating it. So again, if this is how it works, we need to reproduce this experimentally. Here's the supposed source, and the sun is maybe traveling straight across the Earth. I don't know. This needs to be reproduced. I mean, this is a neat little example to visualize it, but how do we know that this is actually what's happening? We need empirical proof of light being able to do such things with, with light sources and so on. If the military is lying, there's another problem. If the military is lying, and the height of the firmament is around 70 miles, according to the Go Fast experiment. Is it enough to hide Polaris at the equator? I haven't done the calculations for this, but that would be something interesting to see. Because again, Polaris, let's see, where is that? Um, so they launched, here's Go Fast rocket from, here's the United States. They launched it from right here about Nevada. So the, they went up to about, I'm gonna say like 70 miles up to here. See, so they went from here to here. Well, how much does does that work? In other words, does that work? It was probably way too high, actually, but does that work with our understanding that Polaris is the middle? Of course, we know that Polaris is not just the middle. There's two poles. But let's say with the circular model, we know that we have empirical evidence of the go-fast rocket stopping at 70 miles. It didn't stop for nothing. Something stopped it. A field of some kind, Obviously, because it didn't hit a solid surface, otherwise it would have exploded and destroyed. But it, hit, it hits some sort of field and it just goes zoop, and it just stops. I mean, it's, it's twirling around and then I think eventually it falls back down to earth. But the point is, how does that work? How does it work if that's 70 miles and then just run a calculation where the dome would be that high? Would that make it to where you could see Polaris all the way at the equator? I don't think so. I think that's way too low. I think you would not see Polaris like in Mexico if, if it was 70 miles, if the dome was 70 miles in the air. I just don't think they would be that high. So that's another confounding thing. If military is in line, then why can't we see Polaris at 6,000 miles? All these calculations need to be done and get some experimental data because we have some empirical evidence. And again, this will falsify the circle model very easily because if you have a dome that's, let's say, 70 miles Okay, let's say because this is in Nevada, it keeps curving up a little bit towards Polaris. But you can't, at the rate of curvature, I mean, I don't know. You don't have a second point to understand. You don't have two or three points to measure. But let's say, you know, a moderate amount of curve. I don't see how at 70 miles you would be able to see Polaris all the way to the equator if, if they hit the dome at 70 miles in Nevada. That doesn't make sense to me. That seems way too low. So something something's up. Of course, you also think that there's this glass ceiling, but there's not. If you look at, for example, the Go Fast test, the Falcon 9 launch, if you've seen this on video where they they go up and supposedly they're telling you they're releasing propellant, but no, they're, they're surfing on the sides of the firmament. They're probably collecting data or trying to go through it or who knows what the heck they're doing. But it looks literally like a boat is on the surface of the water, except it's in the air. And again, you can check that out. We looked at it in the first episode, I believe with the firmament, or we looked at that in the third episode, I believe, on what the Bible says about um, cosmology. I think that's what we looked at. But we looked at the video of this, how it just trails around and there's like this water trail. There's, if there's no, 
If this is the case, then there's no solid barrier, folks. A firmament is an expanse, and it separates two things, but it doesn't tell you what that expanse is made of or what it is exactly. Remember, Esdras said, now Esdras is an apocryphal work, but either way, it said the spirit of the firmament, which is very interesting. Just very, very, uh, again, it looks like a force field of some kind. Now, there's some more problems with this, and one of them is the two suns phenomenon. Many people have recorded these two suns, and these aren't lens flares, but there's something going on. This is in Stockholm, spring, at sunset. Look at this. These are, these are huge two suns, double sun phenomenon. It's not CGI, it's not Photoshop, this is real. We're going to watch a couple videos of it. And see what the heck is going on. All right, man, welcome to the Crow Discovery Project. It's been a long time since I posted one of these, and I will be uh, ganging up with... This is Crow 777, the one that did the lunar waves. ...some other people and posting more scope footage as the... The warm weather approaches here. Uh, I've recovered from my surgery. I should be able to heft that scope again. Uh, what we have here is co confirmation of the double sun by another individual. First footage you're going to see here is my footage. Hydrogen alpha scope with a double stack, a solar max. That is the sun you see with your eyes. Okay, I'm going to pan around here. And that's lens flare, legitimate lens flare that you're seeing there. There's the sun you see with your eyes. And in a second here, oh, I need to go the other way. There's lens flare. There we go. Watch the top. You'll see a little thing go by. Um, this is the first time in the spring of 2016 that I discovered the double sun. There's the sun we see with our eyes. I'm still scanning around. I'm going to scan back over and find the other object for the first time. There it is, top of frame. This is the sun we do not see with our eyes. Now, I was afraid to post this for a long time. Uh, you're going to see that it will blur out. I'll mess with focus. I put a huge wrapping paper tube over the end of the Solar Max scope. Um, when you see the disturbance over the face of this, that's what's going on. I'm trying to prove that this isn't lens flare, but all those there right there. Uh, I also take my hand and I do light blocking over the end of the scope, which ironically, the gentleman who I'm about to introduce to you, who you should all go sub, saw this footage way back in 2016 and he replicated what I did, uh, which I'm going to show you here in a minute, which is proof positive. Uh, another individual doing it. Scanning back, there's a little bit of lens flare. There's the real sun that we see with our eyes in the bottom of frame coming back into frame. Now I'm going to load another clip that I shot. I think I did this three or four days in a row um, coming back to try to confirm this. Now here's a new clip. There's the sun you see with your eyes. That is legitimate lens flare right there. Scan out. There's the sun we don't see with our eyes on a new day. I'm confirming it once again. In a minute here, I'm going to load footage from a gentleman called Chris Van Mater, um, who took out equipment and replicated exactly what I did here, which is proof in the pudding. But he did something more in one of the... Notice how it's a little higher, too. Just really quick. Here's the real, or here's the apparent sun, and the other one was like up here. It's a little higher, which is consistent with the idea that you're on a flat plane and the apparent sun is lower than the actual sun because of refraction. So that's interesting. Clips, you're going to see a telephone line going in front of the sun we do not see, which is also proof in itself. Again, there's the sun we see. Here comes Chris's footage. Uh, there's the name of his channel. You should all go up and sub him. There's the sun we see with our eyes. And there's the sun we do not. That noise is because this is a rip of a rip. Um, we'll have better footage of this as we move along. But there is this. He is confirming uh, in the same spot, in the same year, in spring, uh, what I did. Here comes another clip by Chris on a new day. There is the sun we do not see with our eyes with a telephone wire uh, in his field of view. When he scans back over to the regular sun, it's not there. There's the sun we see with our eyes. And again, we're back to my footage here. Um, there's the sun we see. There's the sun we do not see um, without a Hydra Alpha, Alpha scope with a double stack or a full spectrum camera. I will say that it is my contention this second object can be detected in visual spectrum with just normal tools at sunrise and sunset. Here comes the sun we see. 
So as we warm up here, I'm going to be pairing off with some people to do more work on the sun here. But there it is, ma'am. There is another object there. Uh, might well be the source of the sun that we see. And since I have stated the moon is plasma, it could also be the cause for that. There it is, man. Crow Discovery Project. Cheer so, very interesting phenomenon. Interesting that it's confirmed again that it's going... It's The apparent sun is lower than the actual sun. And also very interesting is that you see this usually at sunset and sunrise, which makes sense because as the sun gets higher in in our field of view, this this effect kind of cancels itself out. It's, it's, it's more extreme at sunset and sunrise because the sun is setting and, sunri and rising. That's the thing. If it was just going straight across the sky, there'd be no reason for this effect to happen. Does that make sense? The reason this effect is happening when it's at sunset or sunrise is because the sun has a different angle. And so there's more, probably refraction is my guess, is the, re I don't think there's two suns. We'll look at some more clips, but they're very, very fascinating. Let's see this one. We can see here two suns. This is a nice little beach view. I don't know where these people are, but sunset. I'm guessing this is sunset because it's really orangey. You can see. So two suns, see that? That's pretty crazy. I mean, they look, you know, they're, they're, it's like, which one is the real one is the question. I don't think they're both real because the Bible doesn't say two suns, but there's two, there's two objects there, it seems like. Very crazy. Uh, here's another one. This one's, I think, a little more new agey, but either way. These cycles have been shown to us in the old world. From the sightings of two suns to even three suns. This realm operates on a cycle, and it seems that cycle is repeating again. Now no one knows the exact dates of these resets. And you know that I'm certainly not a subscriber to any mainstream religion. I think most of it's all... Look at this for a sec. Do you see how there's two dots here? This is not lens flare. These are... This, uh, this is... I don't know what it is, but it's basically a, a result of the light from a, from a projection, right? So if there's two, that means there's two things being projected, which is very strange. ...about control. But as you know, if you follow this page, there are plenty of truths to be found hidden in old world text. The Bible is no different, though it went through many rewritings and many twistings and corruptions at the hand of man. There is still a lot of truth in it, like that verse from Luke chapter 21 that I copied. I believe we are beginning to see those signs in the sky and the stars. Many are starting to witness this multiple sun phenomenon. I myself have witnessed it in recent years. Before that, I was quite the skeptic of it. But the more and more videos of this I see, the more I dig up from the past that correlate these sightings. It is very hard to just dismiss them. And there are certainly no lens flares. Like I said before, I've seen these resets. Yeah, that one's behind the clouds, which is really weird. See, see that? This one's, there's a cloud, and this one's kind of behind the cloud. This one's in front of the cloud. How does that even work? That's the curious thing, too, is like, if this is a reflection of, if this is a reflection of this, how does that work with the cloud in the way? That doesn't make any sense to me. That's very strange. Then you have the light that's the brighter light. It's it's kind of seems like the clouds are kind of passing over it too, which is just really weird. Right. What happened? Well, the apocalypse is coming it's just weird
I don't think we have another one too somewhere. Oh yeah, this is also happening with the moon. So get a load of this. Let's see. Oh wait. Did you see that up there? Oh, I'm a trick of the light. Oh wait. Two moon planets, right? Oh, you want some fancy science mumbo jumbo? But I reckon there's got to be some sort of explanation for this. Two moons. These are real videos. Some of these are recent too, which maybe there are signs in the sky. I don't know. See, this is the moon. Look at that. That's how you know it's, the moon is a light, by the way, it's when you actually film it. But you see? Look at that. Like, what the heck is that? What's going on here? Very strange. And these are videos. I mean, these are real videos. They're not, you know, fake or anything. You can tell me what that second thing is, bro. Something amazing. Look at that. You see how they, these two, again, these two little light sources. It's like, what's going on here, man? About to happen, bro. Something fucking amazing is about to happen. All the trolls. Yeah, you explain that. Explain that! I'm looking at two moons, bro? Really? Two moons! Okay. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. I just waited to come outside to see what the fucking moon looked like. And then I seen it. Oh, hallelujah! Well, I'm ready. I don't know if y'all are ready, but I'm ready. Let's see if I can do some stuff. Whoa, there you go. Hey, what would that be? Hey there, there trolls. You tell me that that's, that's, that's natural. God, hallelujah. This is going to get taken off the internet fast. You bet me, bet my ass. So, some really strange stuff. But the question is, are these signs in the sky? Is this as a result of, you know, we're coming up on the end? Or has this been happening for a while? I don't know. I don't have enough evidence for that. I'd be curious to learn if there'd be other ancient other uh, cultures that have documented this phenomenon. And if so, then that means, okay, this has been going on for a long time. It's part of the Earth's regular astronomical things. Many of these are also recent, but also that's maybe because of technology and people are paying attention more to the sky. So who knows? Is the military doing something? I don't know. People say that there's a fake sun and China is launching a fake sun in the sky. And it's a lot of misinformation as usual, a lot of gaslighting. I, I don't put it past the military to do all kinds of shenanigans, but this is obviously not the case because these observations are from everywhere around the world, Russia, Europe, the USA, and so on. I think it's very likely a refraction effect we definitely need more info, though, because the Bible doesn't say there's two suns and two moons. It says there's the sun and the moon. So what we're seeing is something happening with the interaction of these luminaries and the electromagnetic dome or firmament or whatever is happening and to produce these variations. Of course, heliocentrism says that it's an atmospheric mirage. Flat earthers, because flat earth has been infiltrated, say there's two suns or three suns, Nibiru, there's the twin realm, all this Gnostic New Age stuff, which obviously just leads you away from the truth. So the question is, how do we walk the narrow road on this? Well, at the very minimum, I think that it's a refraction 
effect. Something is obviously refracting. And we have some evidence of that, um, you know, like with sun dogs, which we'll look at in a second. But I think at the very minimum, we can say it's refraction. Something is happening that is causing these things to be a signal to be forked into two or maybe possibly even three signals. The problem is if, if we're seeing the source of the sun and the projection of the sun, and the source is, let's say, outside the firmament, and somehow it's creating a projection inside the firmament, whatever. There's some refraction between the two, and that's why there's a difference, right? Because there's the apparent sun and the actual sun. And the reason you see those two differently is because of refraction. Well, the problem is the firmament being the water, the water's above, is water. You would see, like if you looked at the sun, you should expect to see like a wavy pattern of some kind. Now, maybe the waters are still, they're not moving, but still, there would I just imagine there would be much more refraction or just distortion in general if the source of the sun was behind water. And also, which is really strange, if the source of the sun was behind water, wouldn't the water evaporate? I mean, that's, that also doesn't make sense to me. When you look at the sun, or both suns really, they're both very smooth. They're perfect circles, just like the moon. They're just perfectly sketched out, man. They're perfect circles, which shows you that there's no distortion. There's no water interference pattern. There's the lunar waves for the moon, but you know, those aren't, that's not water. It's just like it's refreshing or something. I don't know. So that's very interesting. Some other problems with this are the fact that there's a lot of variance between these examples. You saw that one in Russia where there was like two suns really far apart from each other, but then you have times where they're very close to each other. See, like this, I don't know where this is, but these are super close to each other. And you have these ones are like really far away from each other. So that's a real problem because it's not consistent. And it's also based, it seems on humidity and, you know, basically the places that these places have are either very high in humidity or they're lower or whatever else. So I think it's based on refraction and that's also dependent upon the location and the atmospheric conditions. If the sun is reflecting off the dome behind it somehow, then it also is a problem because it can't be the same angular size. Like if you look at this one, for example, these two objects are parallel, which is very strange. It's very strange to see them so far apart. It's, it's very strange. In this case, they're closer together, but the problem with this is that the bigger one is on top of the little one, where it should be the other way around. If, if, we, if we assume that the source sun is the one farther away from us, right? then that is the one that should have the smaller angular size, meaning it, it should look smaller in your field of view. So if we go back to this picture and we see, you see the small one is actually under, whereas the big one is on top. So this doesn't make any sense because if the small one is the source sun, meaning it's farther away, then the apparent sun should be below it. So that, that also to me doesn't make sense. There's something going on here we're, we're missing a link to this explanation. The globe says this, that here, here's the horizon line, you're on the globe, and, you know, the Earth, the Earth's curvature is making the sun, uh, the sun's rays refract downward. But actually, if you look at, for example, Decimal Z's channel, we looked at that in episode one, with his, he did a 40-kilometer laser test of, of light, basically. 40 kilometers flat, no, no curvature whatsoever. If anything, it, it showed that re, they showed that refraction actually goes up, which makes sense because if you're on a flat plane, then that means that the apparent sun and the source sun are, uh, the source sun is higher than the apparent sun, okay? So it makes it the, oy, the source sun is higher than the apparent sun. So it works the other way around. But either way, they tell you on the globe that all this refraction happens, and when the sun is setting, it's already set. You're just seeing a reflection of the sun going over the horizon and basically reappearing to you. Whereas it's the other way around. The sun is here somehow, and then the, the apparent sun is below it. And if it sets, the apparent sun has the apparent sun sets, the actual sun hasn't set yet. So either way it works. I don't think it works the way the globe says it works, because again, we're not on a globe, and if we're on a flat plane, maybe it works this way on a flat plane. I don't know. 
I am more inclined to believe that the sun is higher, the actual sun is higher than the apparent sun, because there's evidence for that too, like in that uh, Eratosthenes episode, we looked at it. Either way though, if the apparent sun is lower because of refraction, then this is some somehow how it would work, where you have the source, and then you have the actual sun, and it's a little bit higher than the actual sun. But then you run into the same problem of the x distance and the y distance not being the same. This This doesn't make sense. How can this travel faster than this? They both move at the same rate in the sky. So that doesn't make any sense. So the sun or the source has to be higher than what we see. But all these videos, most of the time, they show it on the same level. Like, for example, this one right here. You see how they're... This one's a little higher, but it's still relatively the same level. Or it shows you the opposite of the way it should be, which is the smaller one being under the, um, the, top, the apparent sun. You see, like this, the small one, it's under the big one. It should be the other way around, based on a flat plane with refraction. So it's not consistent with the theory of a source and a projection. These results are not consistent with what we would expect if there was an actual source and it's projecting something. Why does it differ in size so greatly from one place to another? Why, for example, in this place are these so big and so far apart? And why is this one big and small and close together? That doesn't make any sense. It should be a consistent phenomenon if it were two suns. Why does it differ? Why is it why on the same level? Why and not always either on the same level or superimposed? In this one, you have one of them. I mean, this one's slightly higher, but either way, they're pretty much on the same level. And this one's one on top of each other. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense at all. So this suggests to me, ultimately, that there's an atmospheric refra uh, refraction effect. And we have pictures of sun dogs, like this one, for example, where you have sun dogs, where, you know, it looks like there's three suns, but this is just the sun and probably using the atmosphere and the firmament, who knows? Again, we don't know how these things work. The firmament is a luminiferous medium where light propagates through. Light is not a photon, it's, it's waving a medium. And nobody's, I'm sure the people who have studied it, like Tesla, all their information has been hijacked and, and buried so that we couldn't find out. But this is a luminiferous medium. And the sun, there's only one sun, is doing some crazy things, I think. It'd be interesting to find out what those things are, because certainly those videos are very convincing with the two suns. But again, the Bible doesn't say there's two suns. And so we can't drift into Gnosticism and all these other things. But either way, nobody's really tested these across different locations. I've lived in Phoenix for 30 plus years now, and I have never seen this phenomenon, ever. And it's very dry in Arizona. So I'm guessing that has something to do with it, which again leads further proof to the fact that this is not a universal thing, but seems to happen only in places with humidity. There's also extreme variance in size and position, which again suggests that this is having to do with location and atmospherics. I would be curious to, to have somebody study this phenomenon and document the different places, and let's put them on a map, let's see their humidity levels, let's see whether they're the same size and apart or on top of each other, What and see if there's a pattern. Let's see if we can find out a pattern for what's actually going on here. But my guess is it's some refraction. Another problem, again, is that the Bible never speaks of multiple suns. It speaks of only one sun. There's the greater light and the lesser light. It's not the greater lights and the lesser lights. People who insist on secret suns or three suns or Nibiru or all these other things, they're really appealing to a hidden world, a, a Gnostic understanding. Because no matter what we see, the Bible is the ultimate source of truth, folks. Those videos are very interesting of where he was using the heat, heat scope and looking at the two suns. They're very interesting. But the Bible doesn't tell you that there's two suns. It tells you that there's one sun. So that means then if the Bible is supreme, it's our supreme authority, which it should be, when you go back to the empirical evidence, we use the Bible to interpret the empirical evidence, not the other way around, so that we drift away from the Bible and into Gnosticism. Does that make sense? If, you're, if you have a video and you're looking at a phenomenon, you really don't know what that phenomenon is. It looks like there's two suns. I agree. It looks like there's two suns. But the Bible says there's one sun, so what I'm looking at must be some sort of manifestation having to do with the interaction of the one sun and the firmament and this electromagnetic universe that we're working in. Clearly so, because it's not everywhere. It's not universal. And so it's never mentioned, and not in a single line in the Bible is, is ever a second sun mentioned. 
if God would have created a second son, then it would be mentioned. It wouldn't be this occult thing that he's hiding away from us as some secret knowledge type of thing. Even other books like Enoch don't mention a second son. It just mentions the son. So this is really interesting because, again, we have empirical evidence of a very strange phenomenon, at the very least. It's very strange. The moon is also, that's, it's super strange that they both do these things. The question is, what are we looking at? It's a fascinating topic, obviously, that needs, that needs much more investigation. We know that NASA, uh, oh, this is about, oh, we're going to the new one now. Ch constellations are sunspots. But either way, I was going to say, yeah, the previous one is a fascinating topic as well. This, this other topic, now the next one is sunspots and constellations and sunspots. Very fast, another fascinating thing, a little rabbit hole for you to go into if you want to. But this basically is one of those things that needs more investigation. We know NASA is lying to us about everything, including sunspots and what they are. Sunspots are real, they exist, they can be photographed. But on a local model with local light sources and a, a smaller light sources, how do we explain these things? Because the model is very different. The observations suggest that the sunspots are somehow related to the constellations that the sun is currently in. I want you to remember, if you have seen it, if you haven't, go watch it. It's the number five episode in my Sabbath series, where we talk about God's true calendar. And basically, the true calendar that God gave the Israelites, which of course hasn't been used for a long time, but either way, it, God revealed the clock to the Israelites so that they would be completely in, synchronous, in synchronization with the world. And that clock is the sun's position in the constellations. There are 12 constellations in the sky at any given year. And the sun has a specific circuit that goes through these constellations. It appears in one and then appears in another and so on and so forth. And the moon is a second witness because at night, you can't, you can't see the stars during the day because the sun's too bright. But at night, when the moon rises, it tells you what constellation is in the sky. And then that way, you know, you look over there, okay, that's uh, Libra or whatever. They didn't call it Libra at the time, but there's that constellation. So when the sun comes out, you know exactly what month you're in, quote unquote, because months are an invented concept, but they would call them Chodesh. So again, check out that episode if you haven't. Very fascinating stuff, especially for the people who are clinging to Old Testament things, like you have to keep the feast days, which is nonsense. If you can calculate the feast days according to the original Hebrew calendar, not the counterfeit one that's being used today, or the Zadok calendar, or the Enochian calendar, then yeah, good luck doing that, because that's going to be pretty difficult to calculate the sun's position in the constellations and keep up with all that. But either way, that's the calendar that was used. And if that's the case, then there is a relationship between the sun, moon, and the stars. The moon is a second witness to the sun. The sun is the one that tells you what period of the year that you're in. And the stars are kind of the backdrop that tell you where the sun is. It's all relational. It's very fascinating. And what's even more fascinating is this idea that the constellations can be seen through the sun, which was like, what? I, I, I thought I had learned enough when I saw the moon map. And now this, check this out. This is taken again from Neil in Colorado. Good job with this research. This is taken on May 5th to 2024. Here's the sun. You can see these little sunspots. And here's Aries constellation. In, at, at the time, the sun was in Aries or around Aries. And so here's the constellation. Boom, boom, boom. You can see that there's similarities here to this constellation. A couple more here. This is on September 11th. This is in or around Leo. We'll see a little graphic of this. Here's the Leo constellation in, in his app. You can see it's kind of right next to Leo or under Leo, so to speak. And if we do a little drawing of it, you can see the same. Here's Mercury. Here's the Leo constellation with the sickle and everything else. So this is very, very interesting. Here's another one. This is in December 5th, 2023 in Ophiuchus. I think that's like the 13th constellation. But anyway, it goes through and it creates this little, you know, I don't know what kind of shape it is, but it's like a pentagon or not pentagon, but uh, like a house, I guess, like a, like a dipper almost. But you can see it's the same thing. Very similar shapes. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Not all of the stars are viewed, which is one of the problems, but you can see the shapes are very similar. Here's 916 in the Virgo constellation or around it. And here are the different points mapped out. 
Now, again, not all the stars are viewed, so is it these four, or is it these five in the Virgo constellation, or is it these? This one's a little harder to see, but is it these ones, right? So is it these ones that are being mapped out, or is it these ones? See, on the bottom. Either way, this is really interesting. It seems to follow the general shape and pattern of these structures. As the constellations rotate across the sky, because the sky is the one moving, they also reflect in different pictures in the sun. So here's one of Leo again, one, two, three. These are the three highlighted. So you have one, two, three, two, three, and one, two, three. They're highlighted. And then you see the same thing, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. You see the general arc of it? Like here it's going upward, then it's kind of more sideways, and now it's going down, right? Look at this. It's going upward, this is more sideways, and this one's kind of going down. Fascinating. I mean, this is just totally fascinating, which to me it reminds me of like a drop in the water on like a TV screen where it takes the information and magnifies it, or, or like a drop like this where it takes the visual information behind it and it creates a representation in front of it because because the water can almost act as like a projector and so to speak and of course we know that the eclipses are maybe some sort of electromagnetic phenomenon interference so could these sunspots actually be my point is i'm, I'm postulating right now I, I don't have any hard evidence of this but based on everything else could these sunspots be mini eclipses interference patterns between the electromagnetic field of the stars behind the sun that it's in, because we know the calendar is always based on the sun's position in the constellations. And these sunspots are just really a result of the interference pattern, that somehow they're interfering and creating these patterns, because obviously there's a relationship. Obviously there's a relationship. Now there's a couple problems with this. The sun is circular, and it, and it seems, again, that it's distorting the constellation slightly, kind of like the moon map distorts the map of the Earth. Not all the stars are represented every time, and the question is why. Why is it only particular stars? Because, like, for example, um, like this one, you know, like this is Virgo, one, two, three, four, five. The question is, is it these five, or is it these, you know, like we looked at, for example, is it these five? Like, which ones is it? This one has one, two, three, four, five, but you see these two stars are very close together and they're, you know, there's nothing here. I mean, maybe there's, it's representing these two and it goes up and so it's not entirely perfect, but there does seem to be a relationship and we need more data. We definitely need a lot more data with Leo is a lot more obvious, but again, even Leo, like this middle one here with the leg is not here. It's not represented. So the question is, why? Why is there only a certain amount represented? Why can't you see all the stars? Why is it that you just see a few of them? Which is very, very interesting. There's no explanation as to how this works because we don't have anybody looking into this. This is the kind of stuff flat earth people need to be doing rather than arguing over you know, uh, flight paths and the size and position of the sun. That's a waste of time. We need to be investigating things like this and trying to get some better models for the things that we can't explain. They're mysterious and phenomenal. But who knows? Is the sun a lens? Is it some sort of projector too? I don't know. We need more data and we need to evaluate this from different perspectives, this different places, create a database and see, you know, what's true, what's not. But it does suggest, if this is the case, that the light of the sun is inside the firmament. So this is again, one of those things where it's like, you have evidence that it's outside, and you have evidence that it's inside. So this particular piece of evidence with the sun and the constellations seems to suggest that the constellations are behind the sun, meaning the constellations are in the firmament, the stars are in the firmament, and the sun is in front of them, meaning it's inside the firmament, however that works. So then the question is, how does the two suns work, if that's the case? How does the sun set? Can people see constellations in the second sun? That's another question to be looking into. I'd be curious to see if you can find a second sun situation and then photograph the constellations in the sun. Or does it happen only at certain times that we see this? I don't know. There's many unanswered questions. As usual, with everything that you discover, there's like 10,000 new questions that arise. And that's fun. That's the fun part for me. I, I think it should be fun for you as well to, to have more questions than you started with. But certainly, 
it, it leads you to really scratch your head at these things. So summary of number 14, dome versus firmament issues. The basic issue is this, folks. You have conflicting evidence on, on all sides. Some evidence suggests that there's a solid barrier. For example, refraction, the green flash, the triangulation issues, suggest some sort of firmament or lens that the, sun is pass the sun's light is passing through and it's being refracted. The word rakia in the Old Testament, which is firmament, comes from raka, which is solid, which means to beat something out, like to beat a metal you know, shape. So it's beating something solid. In Job 37, 18, he talks about the sky as a molten cast metal mirror. Of course, Job is poetry, but again, it's consistent with raka, rakia, firmament, some sort of object there that's separating the waters above from the waters below. Some evidence suggests it's not solid, but water or force field. Again, the Go Fast 2014 rocket, when it launched into the air, it's you watch the video on YouTube. It launches into the air and then it just stops. Like some kind of force field stopped it. If the sky was made out of a solid glass-like substance, then that thing, if it would have hit the firmament at that speed, would have been destroyed. So that is evidence against a solid barrier. The Falcon 9 launch, where we saw the water trail patterns, it's, it's going on water. And again, the Bible suggests that it's just the waters above versus being separated from the waters below. It doesn't tell you what the firmament is made out of. It just says there's something that separates them. So could be a force field of some kind. We talked about Second Esdras being the spirit of the, talking about the spirit of the firmament, which again, it's apocryphal, but still very interesting. There's conflicting evidence. Some evidence suggests that the heavens are circular. Ancient cosmologies of, of, of circle square earth that we looked at, the Bible says the circle of the earth, the star trails are circular. But then again, you have two uh, circles that are counterclockwise. One's clockwise, one's counterclockwise, which doesn't make any sense. How does that work? How can you go north, all the way north, and look up and see the stars going in a circle, and then you go south and they're going the other way? That means there's two, almost like two domes kind of superimposed on each other or something. Some evidence suggests that it's a different shape. Four quarters of heaven, the earth being like a square, God walking on top of the vault, Ezekiel and John's visions of a flat surface. We'll talk about these later. Tents can be a square or pyramidal shape. God is the most high, so he's maybe on top. If the tent was a pyramid type of shape, then God would be the most high. He's the source. He's the highest point, which, of course, all of this Illuminati, you know, pyramid stuff is just a counterfeit of. If the truth, maybe, maybe the truth is that the, the firmament is some sort of pyramid shape. Let's say it is. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying if it is, with God as the most high point, and there's only one point for that because everything terminates in one point, that makes sense then all of this, you know, stuff that you see with the Pharaoh and the Illuminati at the top of the pyramid, it's just a counterfeit of the truth, isn't it? It would make sense that that would be the counterfeit, where you can be like God, you can be the one point at the top ruling all things and seeing everything. But either way, there's difference of evidence, right? These two things are contradictory. It doesn't make sense that there's circle of the earth, ancient cosmologies, star trails, and then you have four quarters of heaven, God walking on top of the vault, the visions of um, John and Ezekiel, and having two gears in the heavens, and basically tents can be square. These things don't make sense. That Something is missing about how all of this comes together. Some evidence says that the sun is inside the firmament, meaning when we look at the sun, there's no water interference pattern. It seems like a real object. It's very smooth in the close-ups. Eclipses don't cause a total blackout. If it were outside, then that would be the case. There's no lunar wave phenomenon with the sun, meaning there, it's not a projection of any kind, it's a real object. And again, if it was outside the firmament and in the waters, somehow it would have it would vaporize the water. It doesn't make any sense. At least if it was an object of heat, some kind. Maybe it's projecting heat. I don't know. I really don't know. But based on what we know, it doesn't make sense that it would be outside. Yet there's evidence that it says the sun would be outside the firmament. Refraction, the green flash, the triangulation problem. You know, all these things suggest that there's a lens. The moon doesn't cause a solar eclipse, we know that. And we know that this also could be resolved with the sun being inside, and the ether is a medium, and the moon is a 2D projection. Okay, you could solve these, but these are, these are just conjectures, really. 
Yes, the ether exists. Yes, the, the refraction of the atmosphere is a real thing. But does it really account for the triangulation problem of not being able to triangulate the sun? Is it really that bad? Is that is the atmosphere the only thing doing that? Is the atmosphere the only thing doing the green the green flash and and the problems we see with the setting of the sun, the rising and setting of the sun with the afternoon and morning and things like that? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that's just refraction and perspective. I think there's something more going on. I don't know what that is, but something's going on. There's some evidence that the sun is a projection, i.e. refraction, triangulation issues, because you can't triangulate the sun. So maybe there's a, a real sun and an apparent sun. And there's a being refracted. There's the two suns phenomenon. All these things suggest that the sun is a projection or that there's massive refraction being done and you see an apparent sun and then an actual sun. However, there's evidence that it's not a projection. The Bible doesn't mention two suns. Again, the problems with the source versus the dome curvature where one has to travel faster than the other, if you remember that. And of course, projections are two-dimensional. Even if the sun is holographic, how can it release UV energy and heat? How does that work? Nobody's been able to answer that. If this is a projection and you're seeing, okay, you got two suns going on, how does it work that you have a real three-dimensional projection that is creating heat, obviously? and moving across the sky. How does that work? That, that needs to be explained. Because even if it was a hologram, it doesn't make sense that it'd be projecting UV energy. Other strange evidence. The sun moves in a straight path, but the green flash suggests it's actually setting somehow. So that's interesting. We know that the sun moves in a straight path across the sky, yet how do you explain that it actually changes vertically? That means it has to arc somehow, but we know it doesn't arc because of the heat problem because of the heat would be equidistant from the, from the observer at all times. So you wouldn't have the difference in heat as it is overhead versus like in the afternoon versus noon, there's a big heat difference because the sun is, is overhead versus it, it's at a longer distance. But if it's arcing across the sky, then it's at the same distance all the time from you. So that doesn't make any sense. And of course the green flash might not be the sun setting, but you need a better explanation. I don't think that refraction is is a catch-all for all of these things. The light under the planes suggests that the sun is setting. The lumen change based on distance on a flat earth model with perspective, that doesn't, that doesn't work, folks. It doesn't work that the sun travels, you know, however many thousands of miles from noon to evening, and the light goes from 100,000 lumens to practically nothing. And that distance is almost the same distance between the, the two solstices. And yet, between the two solstices, you don't see a difference in light, like in terms of the, the frequency. It's not redder. It's, it's colder, for sure. That's true. But the light doesn't change. The light goes from uh, cold to, to warm. It goes from blue to red. And the lumens are still pretty bright at noon on winter, assuming a clear day, versus you know uh, noon on summer. So the lumen change is not there. The frequency change is not there. The sun's path is straight, but then you have a green flash that tells you it's setting. The light underneath planes, which is very difficult evidence for the globe, for the uh, circle map to reconcile, that tells you that the sun is setting. There's no stars visible at high altitude. Where are they? What's going on here? Everything, everything we're finding is, is just very conflicting, conflicting evidence. The shape of the firmament is unknown based on the test that we have with, again, the military says one thing and then the go-fast rocket says another. If the go-fast is right, it doesn't make sense that we see Polaris where we do because Polaris should be obscured much sooner. It would probably be obscured at like the Tropic of Cancer at that point. If, if 60 miles is as high as it goes or 70 miles as high as it goes, you should not see Polaris past like the Tropic of Cancer. I'm just throwing that out. We need more specific you know, calculation, but 60, 70... 70 miles is not, not very high. It's not very high at all. So that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. So conclusion, it's a mystery. It's an absolute mystery. And this is why making claims about the position, the behavior of the sun, what the moon is doing, what the stars are doing, what the dome is like. Is it a dome? Is it not a dome? Where, where's the sun in the dome? That kind of thing. You can't waste your time with people who are still in the globe model. That's not what you need to waste your time on. The goal for the general part is to bring people out of the globe and into the light of biblical cosmology, which is a mystery. While at the same time, very important, 
as a, because of this episode. At the same time, guarding them from the counterfeit, the controlled opposition, which is the flat earth, the flat earth movement. We want to bring people away from heliocentrism because heliocentrism is the false sign of wonder that the snake is using to bring the world back into a new world order, which I've talked about in my heliocentric conspiracy, while also protecting them from the counterfeits, the new age, uh, silly model of the Gleason map, which of course is just there to deceive people. Stick to the big four, which are gravity, the gospel, horizon, and water. Gravity and the gospel are two short videos in my playlist. And episode number one of this series talks about horizon and the water. We look at plenty of proofs. Between those four things, those are your strongest globe killers. Gravity is ridiculous. There's so many reasons why it fails. The gospel itself, many claims about the gospel, with the resurrection, the, the return of Christ, all of these things being created in God's image. All of these things do not work on a heliocentric model of the universe, where the universe is expanding and it's infinite, you know, in size and all this kind of stuff. And of course, the horizon and the behavior of water are easy ones. So don't be afraid of saying you don't know on the other stuff. I don't know what the sun is doing. I'm very open about that. I really don't know what the sun is doing. I know that it's moving straight across the sky, but even that, I'm skeptical because, again, in Phoenix, in the summer, it rises and sets very north in the sky. And yet at noon, it's in front of me when I look south. It's, it's almost overhead, but it's still, you know, still in front of me south. So how the heck does that work? How does it cross my vanishing point? When I look east, how does it cross the vanishing point? That means it must arc somehow, not arc this way, but arc, you know, that way somehow. But it's not arcing. If you look east, it's going straight. So what the heck? I don't know what the sun is doing. I don't know what the moon is doing. I, I have some faint guesses based on all these things I've presented to you. And I think it's fascinating. I think it's absolutely mind-bendingly fascinating. And of course, that's the whole point is to leave you with more awe than when you started. Now, the last point of this, of course, is that flat earth is a psyop. There's many red flags with this Gleason map. It's the azimuthal equidistant projection, which is, of course, is based on a globe, first off. This flat earth map that everybody uses is based on a globe. It's severely distorted at the south of the equator, which means that the land masses are not represented correctly. It's similar to the Urbano Monti map of 1587. And of course, we talked about this in the heliocentric conspiracy. The Urbano was born in Milan, Italy, which is basically the center of, you know, papal control. He was a Catholic noble. He was right in the you know, beginning of the Counter-Reformation with all the dialectics, all the new globes who were being created around that time. And he made the map of the flat earth. Now, he, they didn't call it the map of the flat earth, but look at this. This is no different. How do they know that this is what it looks like? You know, this just looks like the Gleason, except it's a little more, you know, exaggerated in certain parts. But can we trust this? The Vatican was also creating heliocentrism around this time to destroy Protestantism. The Counter-Reformation was in full swing, and Monty was an Italian noble and Catholic. So, I don't know. Did the, the dialectic of these two opposing ideas begin at that time? Just like the way Jesuits created preterism and futurism. The dialectic of these two to take you off the narrow road of historicism. The same thing I see with cosmology. Of course, the main weapon was heliocentrism, but I wonder really if this whole second alternative was also created to, to bring people back to this circular thinking, which of course is relativistic and occult and, and so on. The UN map has 33 sections and everybody say, look, the UN knows the truth. This is the true map of the earth. No, it's not. There's 33 sections in this map and it tells you right off the bat that this is a false flag. Then 33 is a uh, Masonic number that they code all their little false flags with. There's a track record of the occult controlling both sides all the time. So is the debate on cosmology immune to that? Absolutely not. It's very clear that, the, that there's two controlled oppositions. One of them is heliocentric and one of them is geocentric. The truth is geocentric in the sense that this is the universe, but the, the flat earth thing is a deception. Gleason's map is riddled with Masonic clues. This is that clip I told you from Richard Kahlberg on YouTube. He's an engineer. He's a flat earth blogger, and he had a video, again, it's it's not on YouTube anymore. It was something like, basically problems with the flat earth model. And he, he covers some of this research as well. But 
This is the section on Gleason's map. Let's take a look. The G in Gleason's, G is 33 from Freemasonry. Um, you know, they have that on the Freemason logo. Um, a lot of numerology, J.S. Christopher, 69, J.S.C., um, 32, like the double-headed eagle, 32, Shriners. Um, you know, you have a lot of numbers here. Um, this college here, Modern College, if you Google it. <laughs> actually, we can do that now. Um, Modern College Blackheath. This is what we get. <laughs> there is no modern college. There's just an elderly home with Masonic symbolism. Um, their logo here. <laughs> this is what we get. <laughs> so the the idea that you know this college you know made a uh, uh, in Blackheath, England doesn't exist. I, I looked for. It. I spent an hour looking for it. Couldn't find it. Um, not even in history books. So th this is. This is just uh, a fairy tale um, from an elderly home. <laughs> Plus, modern college is MC 133. Um, uh, we see the words as is. Why have they split that here? It's because A and S is 1 and 19. So that's in the 1 uh, 9 and 11 backwards. Um, you know, the it is, is all, I mean, it's 1933. Um, scientifically and practically correct in Gematria is 161, which is the gist of 9 11 flipped. Um, I'll get in, um, let me move this down a bit, uh, got some screenshots. Um, so at, at the bottom of the map, you got 1892 is the year of production of it, which is 1892 is 9 and 11. Um, this company here, Buffalo Electrotype and Engraving, uh, they aren't actually a map maker. They make one of the map, which is this one here. Uh, which I think was just, uh, you know, they made a second map just to give legitimacy to the first map when the first one was just a, f a fake as well. Um, this logo here is riddled with numbers. <laughs> you have the 13 here, weird point sticking out, 13. You have 666, 666 again here. You have the 666 here, 666 here, 666 right here. This is a rune to me. Like if I look at this, remember, if, I don't know if you've seen my Maseratic episode, but where they do, they basically put words in a type of design that's like a magical rune with magical properties to it. This is what it reminds me of. There's so many hidden and encoded, uh, you know, little symbols in here. It's a magical rune. You have the 911 digits in the year it was made. Um, so you have the 1892 digits for the other map. You have 911 digits on this map as well, the second map. They only made two maps. Um, I mean, this company, um, it's, it's, I mean, look at the map first. Uh, well, it was found in, a, there's a stamp, Boston Public Library. The stamp is made on the 33, 33 point here. Uh, could have put it anywhere, but they put it on 33. Uh, the Boston Public Library is just a 16 minute walk from the Grand Lodge of Masons in Massachusetts. And uh, the... In Boston, this is also just 20 minutes from uh, Harvard, which is notorious for secret societies, including the Owl Club. Uh, so, I mean, this is, you know, Boston Public Library close to this. I mean, a lot of Masonic symbolism on it. it I mean, it seems pretty obvious that it's just a plant uh, by Freemasons uh, to, you know, push this, this circle map. Um, I mean, there's a lot more here. It's called a time chart on the map. Um, up here we see, where is it? Uh, well, it's on the patent, actually. Um, you can look up the patent for it. Um, if you search for patent uh, Alex Gleason map, you'll find it. Um, but Alex Gleason, um, 669 in Jewish Gematria, 66 in Jewish Reduced. It's 33 or 3 Gleason's. So you got the 33 right at the top here. Um, Gleason map called 13 as well. Um, Time chart adds to 93 in Jewish ordinal, which is the same as Saturn, 93. Big number for Thelema um, in the occult. Um, you know, a lot of numerology attached to the, the engraving company at the bottom. Um, it's here, Buffalo Electrotype. Uh, electrotype and engraving is EE, which is 33 reversed. Um, in the patent, there's uh, the days between, uh, well, I've got this in, in the images here. 
the days between uh, the patent filing and the patent at the map being published um, uh, is 10 months and 13 weeks it's one of these there we go that one um, and then we have another date um, can't remember what this was oh, I was here dates between date on map and patent publication date so it's 13 months and 13 days so they got the 13 all over this as well um, got published the patent was from November 15th which is 156 which is the uh, 156 prime is 911 uh, Boston Public Library again um, the most curious point on this map I found was um, the fact well here we go uh, glee sons like the gleeful sons um, which you know when you consider that this map this this time piece here um, which is cut off you know it, it's it's 27 because it goes up here but it you know, it looks like 33 subliminally, um, and it's pointed right at Mount Hermon, which is you know where the, the fallen angels came down uh, in in the in the Bible. Um, that's you know what the significance of the 33 is. So, um, 33rd degree latitude there and 33rd degree uh, longitude. Um, so it's pointing to that. The map is called the Gleeful Sons. It's like the Gleeful Sons of God, the Gleeful Fallen Angels. But um, that's the whole other story. Um, I didn't want to get sidetracked too much on that, but just wanted to make the point that this map is just, uh, it's just full of it. <laughs> um, I mean, this modern college doesn't even exist. Um, Look at this too. I think you'll highlight this, but you see at the top, see how this is a pyramid? Subliminal pyramid. And there's a little illuminated eye right at the top here. You see that? I think he's going to talk about it. You know, you have the Order of the Eastern Star as one of the, the Freemasonic lodges. You got the Eastern Star here at the top, a, prison, a pyramid with the eye at the top. Um, the G, the, this translates to 33 in Jewish Matria, so you got the 33 right at the top. I mean, it's just, it's it's a very Masonic uh, production um, when you look closely at it. Yeah, so this is from a longer video that he had, but again, I can't find that video anymore, so I'm kind of bummed out it. I didn't download the whole thing. I just had a clip of it. But either way, you can see that the Gleason's map is the same as... Ever. Now, look, if flat earthers were consistent, just like the people with Trump, when they expose all the deep state and all the dark occult, you know, Freemasonic, numerology, all the stuff that you do with all the other people that you don't like. But with Trump, suddenly when people point that out, oh, no, it's not possible. Trump is still the billionaire, the hero that's coming to rescue us from the deep state. The same thing is with flat earth folks. If you... Listen to people like Eric Dubay who expose all the Freemasons and all the occult stuff going on, and yet you see the same things happening around this particular view. That should be a red flag combined with all the other things we looked at, like the UN, the Urbano Monte map, uh, and so on and so forth. There's still so much more, though. Like the people bring up this picture with, um, what's her name, Marilyn Mar Monroe. It's like, look, she knew the truth she was telling us the whole time. It's like, really? Kennedy was Illuminati. You can look into the book Illumini, Illuminati Bloodlines by, uh, gosh, what's his name? Something Fitzgerald or Fitzpatrick. But he wrote a book about how Kennedy was a Illuminati bloodline. And, you know, it's just two sides of the occult fighting all the time, light versus dark. Marilyn was probably in the club and she probably knew too much. And so they killed her off. But either way, people use these kinds of pictures, say, see, like, this is the proof. No, it's not. This map is wrong. This is an occult map. Remember, it's got the little eye at the top. <laughs> what do you think she's doing holding this map and signaling? She's signaling from her side to probably the other side. I don't know. Of course, we also have Admiral Byrd, who's a hero in the Flat Earth community, but Admiral Byrd was a Freemason. We talked about that in the last episode in the Heliocentric Conspiracy. He was a Freemason. And so were his cronies where they went to, quote unquote, Antarctica <clears throat> and did their thing. The point with the circle we looked at which is the monad. <clears throat> and we know that this is associated to sun worship, Baal worship. It's a phallic symbol. It's a Gnostic symbol. Circle is heaven. And of course, they want you to transcend and become one with the source, which is the middle. And of course, for them, that's the sun. That represents the sun. This heat, the solar system uses this circle and a dot symbolism. This is no different than the flat earth, where you have the solar system, right? The, the circular model of the universe. And then there's a center that has all of the 
power. It's, you know, you can't go to the North Pole. That's where, you know, Mount Maru is and all this kind of stuff. This is just Gnosticism. It's the same thing. It's just a, a different package. Of course, the Flat Earth Circle map has gone mainstream today. And everybody's all about research Flat Earth. And you have the Flat Earth Society, which is just ridiculous. And people get debunked so easily. It's become part of the truther movement to discredit people from actually doing more dil diligent research. There's flat earth rallies, there's concerts, there's alternative media. It's become this whole thing that it's in now to be in flat earth, which to me, again, if something's popular in the world, then that to me just right away is a red flag that it's uh, it's not. It's not the truth. Here's another thing with, with these various places. This is um, the Truman Show. You know, you got the dome and the circle. You got Thor Ragnarok, where it's got the circular view of the earth and supposedly a dome. Then you have the Hunger Games, the Simpsons. They all have these subliminal programmings to, to make you feel like, ooh, there's a conspiracy. And they're they're kind of giving you the truth in plain sight, just like with the UN map. But this is not the truth. The earth is not a circle, folks. You know that by now. So why are they doing this is the question. That's the real question. For, Flat Earth is dominated by people like Eric Dubay, who are antichrist, at least maybe God will open his eyes, I don't know, but at the time being, Eric Dubé is an antichrist, he's against Christ, and he's in place of Christ because he offers you a counterfeit path through the New Age, through Gnosticism, through nature worship, through worship of the self. These are antichrists. There's the whole Tartaria and free energy crowd, which are glorifying the old world order, where basically you had some new world order before the flood, that's why it got judged. And the devil's been trying to get back to that ever since. And he will get back to that because God has allowed him to. But people who are looking at Tartaria and saying, oh, the ancients knew what they, the ancients were corrupt. What are you talking about? The ancients were evil and corrupt and they got judged. So glorifying the old world order, the Tartaria narrative is being strung into flat earth because the Tartaria narrative is about making you glorify a, a one world order where there's free energy and there's a golden age. And once we get back to that, people are going to be very easily deceived. The Flat Earth proves God, but many are using it to basically go into New Age philosophies and pseudo-Christian beliefs. With three suns, with Nibiru, with dual realms, it's a typical signature of something that was hijacked by the enemy. Something that's true, There's, there's you're not living on a ball, but the counter-narrative, or I should say the, the alternative to that, to heliocentrism, has been hijacked by the enemy so that you can't go you know, you can't stay on the narrow path. Either you're going to go to the left or the right. He's going to either get you with the heliocentric model or he's going to get you with the false light of the flat earth movement. Either way, this is the, the tactic of the enemy the whole time. Here's some more red flags. There, there's this obsession with something beyond the ice wall. There's so many theories about all of these unexplored lands and, you know, basically it's called Terra Infinita, the infinite land which basically justifies all of the mythology and Pleiadians and Anunnaki and ancient aliens and all this stuff. It brings it back into the flat earth. It's truly brilliant. And that's how you know this is a work of the devil. They have these maps where you, here's the earth, right? Here's the flat earth. And then beyond the ice walls, actually, well, there's actually more continents with, with their own ice wall. And then beyond that, there's even more continents. It just keeps going and going. And you know, the really advanced beings are from here, from the outer circle, and they're traveling across, and they're visiting us, but then they're going back to... I mean, this is nonsense, folks. This is not... The Bible doesn't tell you this. Now, the moon map is really interesting. There may be some truth to, to that. I don't know. But again, the moon map is very distorted, too. So the question is, how do we reconcile that if the moon map is so distorted? And then, of course, you have this one, which is the Terra Infinita, which is, you know, even worse, where you have all of these little bubbles of flat earths are just in this giant two dimension. It's like literally, if you know the Oort cloud, right? The Basically the model of the heliocentric model of the universe where it's like the known visible universe. It's like that, but two dimensional. In a sense, it's like a flat version of that. So this is just the same thing, just repackaged. Look at all these worlds and there's so many aliens and oh, we can still have our ancient aliens theory and have and believe in flat earth. You see the problem? This this allows people to hang on to these myths of ancient aliens and reptilians and Pleiadians and everything else, but reconcile it with the truth that you're not living on a ball. 
Because the ball tells you there's no such things as Pleiadians and aliens. It tells you that the Bible is true and that whatever being you're communicating with, if it's not God, it's the devil and or his demons pre pretending to be Pleiadians and reptilians or whatever else. That's all you got is demons or God. And so this view of this terra infinita, all it does is justify the same old lies. And so to me, it's like, okay, the devil is just using this to pivot people away from the truth to keep them in mythology while satisfying their curiosity because they've woken up to the fact that, yeah, NASA is full of lies and they're constantly being exposed and you can't hide that anymore. So the only thing you can do, remember from the previous episode, is you have to create another lie because everything has an expiration date. You have to create another lie to quickly do, redirect people away from the truth. And so this is what the devil's doing. People are waking up to NASA. The flat earth thing is going mainstream. And so really quick, okay, let's make some other lies to keep people in the same delusion, but give them a little bit of comfort, you know, and, and feeling like they've discovered the truth. This is nonsense. This is not what the earth is. The, the Bible doesn't say that the earth, God created multiple universes with multiple intelligent life forms that they'll all have to be atoned for okay, through, through the cross of Christ. No, there is one earth and there is one man that was made in God's image because God chose to be in the form of a man so that he could take on sin and pay for our debt. That's what the Bible tells you. And that happens on earth, not on all of these different planets. Or uh, Practically, it's the same thing, really. These are different planets, except it's on a two-dimensional plane. So this is just, again, to uh, to divert you. So what's, what is the reason? Why the PSYOP? Very simple. To deceive and prevent people from going any deeper in their studies, to divert people into new age and false beliefs, to discredit the truth with a false opposition like the Flat Earth Society, a flawed model that is easy to debunk, and to dumb down ultimately the mystery of creation and control the narrative. Earth is 100% flat and motionless. That is absolutely true. 100% flat and motionless plane with local light sources. But the circle map is compromised and it doesn't work. So what is the solution? We got 1.0 <laughs> and you realize that 1.0 is a lie and you've been lied to your whole life. And then you go into 2.0 and you do that maybe for a couple of years and you realize, wait a minute, this, this is a lie too. This is, I've been just as lied to. So now we're at 3.0. And a lot of times this can feel like the movies. Of course, if you've seen this movie, The Maze Runner, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's actually a pretty interesting movie. I won't spoil it too much, but they go from maze to maze, and this is exactly what it's like. So this can feel a lot like Maze Runner, and the question is, what do we do about it? Well, the square model of the Earth has some problems in the sense that the sun can be viewed as it sets and rises. So if, I, if the sun is setting at, at my place in Phoenix, and I call somebody in Hawaii or in Japan or whatever, they can see the sun in a different position. So that is a mystery because obviously it seems that we have enough evidence to suggest that the sun is physically setting somehow. But how is that possible if other places in the world can see it simultaneously, especially now with the internet and phones and everything, we can all see the sun at the same time in different positions, obviously. So how can it be setting for me and you know, rising for somebody else like in Japan. That doesn't, doesn't make sense on a flat plane. It makes sense on a ball, absolutely. But we know the ball is nonsense, but the ball can explain this because of the curve and, and occlusion and so on. A square map also has 16 emergency flight landings, the book that, that don't work on the Mercator projection, like they're just a plain old square Mercator. But it may work on a rhombus projection. We'll, we'll take a look at some options for that. The midnight sun in the Arctic is also... Very strange. I don't know how that would work. Maybe on a rhombus projection, meaning like a diamond, it might work. The land representations aren't clear. The tiling isn't very clear. We'll, we'll, you'll see what I mean by all that. But what it does solve, what does a square model solve? And we'll watch a video on this that, that wraps up all of these points. But it solves the speed of the sun and the moon, meaning there's no speed difference because of the circles that we talked in the very beginning. It solves the, the track of the sun and the moon being on straight. I mean, when, we, when you observe it through the sky, it moves straight for the most part. It solves circumnavigation, no continuous curving, no ridiculous distances in the southern hemisphere. It solves the northern and southern lights phenomenon because there's two poles and it's like a magnet type of thing. It solves the southern hemisphere flight patterns because remember things break down at the southern hemisphere. 
It solves the Southern Hemisphere seeing the same constellations, because everybody's in the Southern Hemisphere. And it solves daylight hour problems. So it solves a lot of problems. Of course, it also brings up a lot of questions too, and that's okay. But I think it's a much better model than the circular model, absolutely. In Isaiah 40, 22, it says the circle of the earth. But in Job 26, 10, it says that the circle is over the face of the waters, over the deep. If the square is outside, then, it, meaning it would be the square of the earth, then the square would be over the waters, but it's not. The circle of the earth is the entire cosmos, but that circle is over the waters. The earth itself, just like all those ancient cultures represented, is in a square. Of course, Jeremiah 49, 36 talks about the four quarters of heaven. Is that an idiom or is that really describing something to you like those tents? Maybe there's a, 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 a four quarter issue with the dome that we're not thinking about. Ezekiel's vision of God's throne basically being on a flat sea of glass, same also in Revelation 4, 6, you see a flat surface. So if God is at the top and he's walking across the dome, like in not really, it doesn't say dome. It says, in Amos 4.14, it says he's walking on top of the vault of heaven. So if he's walking on top of the vault of heaven, it has to be flat for him to walk on top of it. Do you understand? He's not walking on a curved surface. The vault, it's like there's a vault, and then on top of that vault, there's like this flat surface. Does that make sense? So something is missing from our understanding of, of the whole picture here, because the visions of the Bible definitely describe, it, at the very least, a flat surface on top of of where God is, a sea of glass, and he's on top of that. And that's an interesting situation. Ezekiel's vision of the temple, Ezekiel's visions of God's throne, the four sides, four cherubim, four heads, all of these suggest that God prefers uh, square structures. New Jerusalem, the cube, the temple, the four gospels, four winds of heaven, the four angels in Revelation that are holding back the four winds. Compare it to you know, like a mosque, you know, like with domes or pyramids or triangular or stars or polygons, octagons. God doesn't have people build these kinds of buildings. Although, very interestingly, there's there's an exception to everything. <laughs> there's an exception to everything. And there's this thing we're going to read about something that's been lost in translation with the uh, canopy, basically, that the Israelites constructed in the desert. Is the true shape of the sanctuary in the wilderness a ten-sided dome? That's a really interesting situation. So let's see if we can get to that. And here we go. This is from Project 314, Tabernacle Research uh, Restoration. Very interesting. Um, let's see. The Tabernacle Discovery. Of course, the needs or wants that inspire invention are always exactly scripted. In fact, many great innovations like Post-it, Notes, and Velcro are prompted by incidental circumstance or unforeseen opportunity. While discovery, like innovation, may be achieved based upon deliberate planning, perseverance, and observation, in most cases, discovery, which often leads to invention, is often a matter of fate or happenstance. The idea that the necessity is the mother of invention is said to be, is said to date back to Plato's Republic. While it is a historical fact that inventions are sometimes conceived under circumstances of true need and des desperation, it's also worth considering that necessity isn't the only parent in the room. For example, the airplane, the automobile, and the telephone were never life or death necessities before they were invented. These few examples clearly demonstrate that premed premeditated want or desire can equally inspire innovation, especially given the fact that most inventions must be nurtured with time and resources, which is contrary to the conditions of duress and scarcity of resources, which usually define a condition of absolute need. To credit fate with discovery, of course, is not to say that the destiny of individuals or of humanity is materially predetermined or dictated by random chance, which has no causal power, but rather to acknowledge that human destinies are often government by circumstances outside of our control. In the words of Albert Einstein, Almighty God does not play dice. Well, Einstein didn't really believe in God, but anyway. I believe that man has been granted free will and that God is omniscient, omniscient omnipotent, personal, and benevolent, and therefore I believe that the fate of individuals and humanity as a whole is a mysterious and precarious mixture of divine providence and human decision. Uh, in order, in other words, I believe that God is not an abs absentee landlord involving himself in human affairs. And given these principles, I am compelled to say that this tabernacle discovery is not to be mistaken for a modern tabernacle invention. Although I am an engineer, I did not set out with a need or even a desire to invent or reinvent the ancient tabernacle of 3,500 years ago. 
To the contrary, the Project 314 tabernacle design was the outworking of a discovery and fateful event that was made possible by my favorite response to a divine prompting back in 2014. Tabernacle research. And let's see what we got here. Over the course of my life, I have made a point to read the Bible end to end, including the Exodus tabernacle account, on more than one occasion. However, I must confess that I never really made a point to diligently study the Exodus tabernacle. Truth be told, I was probably more fixated upon the completion of Exodus over the understanding of the content as I flipped through the pages. But I suppose that my reason for never taking the account very seriously might be comparable to that of millions of other people. After all, it seems boring, outdated, and meaningless at first glance. The pictures and illustrations don't exactly help, as the tabernacle is usually isn't depicted as something that is innovative or inspirational, or for that matter, even normal. Given my ad admitted levels of indifference, it would be a gross exaggeration to say that my discovery of the ancient pi constant was a result of intensely intensive study on or subject matter interest. Truth be known, my study of the tabernacle really began with an unrelated independent Hebrew etymology study, which was marginally related to the tabernacle in the first place. Nevertheless, I began to peripherally survey the traditional models of the Exodus tabernacle. Some things, when I began to do that, some things just didn't add up. For example, I wondered why the tabernacle models, like the full-size model built in Timna, Israel, as shown in the pictures, would feature a flexible leather rooftop with almost no pitch for watershed. Furthermore, I started to wonder why people in such a hot climate would build a tent that was covered with four layers of material. Not only did I wonder this, I wondered that too, by the way. I was like, why does it have four layers? Wouldn't it be kind of hot in the wilderness? But anyway, not only did I wonder this as an engineer, but I wondered this as an experienced camper, having never seen nor heard of a four-layered roof tent, which is exactly how most tabernacle models are depicted, as shown in the model below. Wondering how the tent roof layers related to one another, I scoured the internet long with original Exodus account, only to find a collection of inconsistent opinions. Eventually, I came to conclude that the tent did not feature a four-layer roof, as is typically assumed. So here's, you know, what they tell you. There's badger skin, rams, red skin dye, goats, hair skin, and linen. And all these things, of course, point to the incarnation and Jesus being divine in a human body that's very humble. But it's also, there's more to the story as well, in terms of it's been lost in translation. More importantly, my random curiosity and search led me to study the measurements of sheets used for the tabernacle coverings. While the study of the textile design of a 3,000-year-old tent may not sound remotely intriguing at first, or even relevant, I can assure you that there is more to the Exodus account that meets the eye. In fact, after scrutinizing every letter of the Hebrew Exodus text, it started to read like a good word puzzle or one of those clever story problems that you are assigned in math class. Actually, as I began to probe the Exodus de text details, I began to see the Exodus text as being written in a way that is comparable to an engineer specification written by a clever and... Is there a continuation? Clever and what? Clever and something... Anyway, well, let's see. Maybe it expands. For some reason, it you see, it, it blocks it when... Okay, boy, this has been quite an adventure. This website has some weird formatting things to where if it, if you minimize it a certain amount, it hides some of the text. So I'm going to just try to go back and forth so you can see what I'm reading, but sometimes I may have to read it uh, without having the screen displayed because it's just, it's just a nightmare. But anyway, this says, you can kind of see it here. I started to read a good word puzzle or one of those clever story problems that you are assigned in math class. Actually, as I began to probe Exodus text details with the details, I began to see that the Exodus text as being written in a way that is comparable to an engineer's specification written by a clever and meticulous customer who is trying to accomplish and maybe even conceal an unspoken agenda. This is the engineering tabernacle back to the drawing board. Okay, let's see if we can get it to behave. Let's see, tabernacle research, blah, blah, blah. Sorry about this, but some people just don't format their websites. Engineering the tabernacle back to a drawing board. Okay, let's see. Driven by the combination of frustration and... Can we go a little bigger? No, we can't. Yes, we can. Uh, driven by the combination of frustration and curiosity, I sat down with the Hebrew Exodus account, put my engineering hat on, and followed the advice of my father, who was an engineering professor. Diligently following Dad's advice, I made an FBD with the TLC which in his vocabulary meant I drew a free body diagram with a tender, loving care. 
Just like I had done so many times in school as an engineer, I drew a simplified sketch of what the text described, and only what the text described, without adding assumptions of my own, taking creative latitude with the descriptions or deferring to traditions. Knowing that I might be in for a long night, I sharpened my pencil, started drawing curtains, and with a watchful eye, kept a careful inventory over every single letter and number in the Exodus Hebrew texts. According to the Exodus account, the Israelites were to weave 11 fabric sheets depicted in the image below, which measured 40, 4 by 30 cubits, which is around 6 to 8 feet wide and 40 to 5 to 60 feet in length, depending upon assumed cubit conversion standards, complete with loops on opposite edges. Using the fabric loops in the edges, the craftsmen were instructed to unite all sheets together into a single assembly, at which point they were also told to fold the 11th sheet back over itself. It is traditionally assumed that these curtains are joined together in a top-to-bottom arrangement, i.e. long edge to long edge, in order to make a single flat plane sheet measuring 30, 42 by 30 cubits. So, uh, let's see if we can fin finagle this here. How are we going to do this? Oh, this is going to be fun. Let's see if we can somehow get this people in their job. Oh, let's see how I can get this so you can see it. Uh, let's see. No, leave me alone. Oh my gosh. Going crazy. Let's see. Can you see it? You see how it does this stupid thing? Can I zoom you out? Can I trick you? Can I maybe get it this way? You see? So here's as good as it's going to get, I think. These are the... These are the sheets, basically, the traditional rectangular sheet layout. Here's the sheet. I wonder if I can make it as big as possible. And, okay, there we go. It's a little bit better. Here's the traditional layout. Here's the sheet, 30 by, what is it, um, 30 by 4 cubits. And they link them one to one like this to create one giant sheet. That's the traditional layout. So now he says, however popular this traditional edge-to-edge, long-edge rectangular fabric swatch assembly approach may be within religious commentaries and artwork, the assumed fabrication method nevertheless fails to comply with the exact Exodus specification. In particular, it fails to account for two unjoined edges on opposite ends of the assembly, whereas the Exodus text describes all sheets as having loop joints on both edges. Regardless, by means of assumption, a rectangular assembly is created while end sheet edges are left unconnected, depicted in the image above via curtain one and the half-sized 11th black and yellow curtains above. Nevertheless, given this universal assumption, at this point it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, for students and scholars to perceive anything but a rectangular building, such as the physical models depicted in the photos above. You've seen them before, you know, like, uh, I think, like these kinds of pictures, like this. These are the very common models, but these may be wrong. These may be not at all what it is. Basic instructions in Bible math. Although scholars have come to universally assume uh, and fully accept the same top to bottom curtain joining approach as depicted above, there is another simple and more practical approach to joining 11 sheets together. In the following Exodus texts, literally, the tabernacle builders were to join the 11 like-for-like -like sheets via the end edges lengthwise, i.e. short edge to short edge, thus creating an extremely narrow strip. Of course, at only 4 cubits wide but 330 cubits in length, the narrow strip would hardly function as a practical roof for covering a tent. However, joining all the sheets at both edges, see the image below, would ultimately yield a cylindrical assembly, appropriate for covering over a building's sides, just as described in Exodus 27, 13, where the covering functions not as a roof, but as a barrier wall instead. So this covering, we'll look at a little bit more, but you see this covering, what he's saying is these edges are not, are not glued, or not glued, but attached to each other on the long wise to create some sort of rectangular building, but they're on the short wise because of the various features in the text and the instructions to create a covering meaning a barrier around the structure. But if that's the case, then the structure would be a circle, not a, um, a rectangle. Of perhaps equal or greater significance, the combined sheet dimensions and quantities point to a cylindrical sheet assembly. If joined in a cylindrical arrangement, the sum of the 11 sheets measuring 30 cubits in length 
minus the sheet overlap folded over per exodus 26 verse 12, and minus the nominal one qubit overlap adjustment, as each curtain end must slightly overlap with the adjacent one per exodus 26 13, would be expressed as 30 times 1 minus 30 whatever, yada yada, in, as is graphically depicted below. So it, div it shows you, kind of including all that math, what that would potentially look like. Consequently, when all of the proper edges are connected, the final length of the cylindrical sheet assembly amounts to 314 qubits, which is a near-perfect multiple of the mathematical constant known as pi, or 3.14. To summarize, the very same 11 fabric curtains that are assembled to make a single high aspect ratio of 30 by 42 rectangular swatch or panel joined via the long edges, as shown in the illustration above, would also create a low aspect strip of curtains that formed a cylindrical assembly joined via the short edges, measuring approximately 314 by 4 cubits as shown below. In later 20, in Exodus 27, these same sheets are hung from metal frames in order to create tabernacle courtyard walls. Not surprisingly, the dimensions for the courtyard are described as being exactly 100 cubits long, i.e. diameter, with the north and south portions each measuring 50 cubits wide. Two options, two shapes, two applications. Given that a sheet has two sets of two parallel and opposing edges, the Exodus Tabernacle text leaves the reader with pairs of possibilities. In the image below, two options are presented for joining a set of sheets together, i.e. the long edge versus the short edge. Two types of shapes are credible for the final assembly. Depending upon the end sheet connections or lack thereof, long flat plane or short cylinder, two final applications for the short assembly are viable, the roof or the wall. So here's the long edge that basically leads to a more rectangular type of situation where you would think, okay, this is the roof, i.e. the thing that you've seen all the time, you know, like here's, here's the uh, rectangle, which leads to this thing that you've seen where there's a, a rectangular building. But if it's on the short edge and it's really creating a, a barrier around this particular tabernacle, then that actually leads to a circular kind of situation, which is very interesting, with 100, with 100 cubits in diameter, a circle, which the math seems to work out, where, where you have a, what is it, circumference of 314, which is pi times 10, basically, and a diameter of 100, and the math works out. Circumference over diameter, 314 by 100 is 3.14, pi is 3.14. So it's very interesting that it's very harmonious with math, and we know that God does everything very harmoniously. So that's also interesting. As illustrated above, sheet orientation assumptions can drastically alter the presumed application of the sheets and thus have an impact on the perceived design of the balance of the Exodus tabernacle. The tabernacle decoded, an enigma wheel and Rosetta stone. When I first saw the total start to length end of the sheet assembly was 13, 314 cubits, something in my head instantly clicked. Right then and there, I knew I had discovered something magnificent, even though at the time I hadn't a clue as to how the remainder of the dwelling place was arranged. Regardless, it was clear that the set of 11 wool curtains were arranged somewhat like a snow fence around the tabernacle. The outer courtyard was clearly specified to be nothing less than a perfect circle. This number, a product of pi, i.e. pi times 100, I came to think of as the Rosetta Stone for Moses' tabernacle plants. It was the discovery that led me to question every other popular interpretation and scholarly assumption about the rest of the rectangular Exodus tabernacle, including all of its other pieces. After all, it is bad engineering practice to try to force a proverbial square peg into a round hole. Yet that is exactly what the theologians do when they give preference to their preconceived notions while translating the Hebrew. For this reason, because this 314 key was somehow been lost during Israel's exile, not a single English Bible translation in print makes any sense, and readers are consequently misled or forced to defer to the Hebrew for accurate descriptions, answers, and explanations. This is lost in translation, but this is maybe what it actually looked like here. So you can see maybe it's a, a ten-sided type of circular dwelling, which again, maybe might there may be some relationship to the earth here, where you have a dome, but it's not a perfectly smooth dome. Maybe it has these edges which cause all of the differences we see in refraction. And there's a top to this dome where God is the most high and he's walking on top of the vault of heaven. This, this is what makes it really intriguing to me. 
Moving on. With no doubt, the rediscovery of this 314 key will forever change the Bible interpretation, radically transforming how future scholars understand the tabernacle texts and many texts to follow. Clearly, it is not by accident that there is more Hebrew text describing the tabernacle tent fabric than there is describing the Ark of the Covenant. As the Hebrew Exodus indicates, the tabernacle sheets are a thoughtful work. Why? The tent curtains weren't made first and foremost for decorative purposes. They were not artistic work, made as fancy decor or for advancing esoteric mystical teachings. The sheets are as practical as they are a sign of intelligence. Surely in this regard, fabrics used for the tabernacle should be categorized as engineered hardware, as opposed to superfluous Bible detail that is not to be given any time or attention. Yeah, there's a purpose for everything God does, which is interesting to find out, you know, thousands of years later. Ironically, this great secret to the tabernacle design was never ever meant to be covered. Rather, the tabernacle secret is the covering, hidden in plain sight. In conclusion, as the ancient tent of meeting is examined further, it becomes clear that God's dwelling place was not invented out of necessity by Israel's displaced masses after the Egyptian exodus. Neither was the tabernacle a creative endeavor of Moses or the product of desire of Moses' assistant, Bethsazel. To the contrary, the tabernacle invention came about by means of divine revelation. Revelation is the father of invention, and only God is the father of revelation. So you can check more of this out. It's called Project 314. It's, uh, it is very interesting. And of course, what do we take from that? Well, we take from that that maybe some things have been lost in translation. And there are things that maybe we don't understand. Maybe the dome is like, like this picture here where you have, again, multiple sides of the dome and there's a flat on top. We don't really know, folks. We, we don't know. Again, the dome is a conjecture. It's, it's an image. The, Bi the Bible never says dome. The Bible says firmament and tent and vault, but it also has other things that are very contradictory, like the quarters of heaven and so on. This is another example um, from this guy that basically has a bunch of videos on these. I don't particularly agree with this because, again, you have a major problem that the sun doesn't go in a circle like this. But these are different models, right? These are different models that are trying to get at something which is very mysterious. It's certainly better than the circle model. But there's a bunch of videos on this. I forget the guy's name on, on BitChute. You can just type in Square Earth. I think he's like the only major one that talks about it. But he's not the one that we're going to be looking at in this video next. But you can see there's the Square Earth. And the question is, how do you, how do you, what kind of continuity is there? There's the Terra Firma. There's the Great Ocean, the Frozen Deep. You have the four quarters of the Earth. You have the, you know, the, the luminaries and so on. There's the top of the firmament that the God is walking on top. I mean, it's it's an it's an attempt. You have the two foci here. You can see, you know, maybe these things explain the, the Starfield program, which is the south and the north, right? So you have these whatever they are, magnetic vor vortices that basically are spinning the heavens in some way that is so profound. But you know, there's something something to be said about this. I don't know how accurate this is, but it's an attempt at least to try to explain. You have the different gates here. You have one, two, three, four, five, six the six gates, and of course the sun and the moon go through these gates at different rates because the moon is faster, but, you know, it's something. It's something. So It's definitely interesting. The sun and the moon set. You can see they set because there's a physical obstruction. Again, how, how this works, I really don't know because, again, if I'm if the sun is setting for me and somebody in Japan is looking and the sun is rising for them, that how does that work? How does that work on this model? It doesn't seem to work. So there's still questions that we don't have answers to, but that's okay. This is the fun part, is to go into the mystery and learn more about it. This is that final video I want to wrap up with, which is um, from that, I think it was Australian guy. I don't know what he, what he is, but it's very interesting. God doesn't come right out and say, or tell us what the shape of the earth is in the Bible. He's left clues. It's a puzzle. It's a jigsaw puzzle. And some people try and ignore, uh, you know, some of the pieces, and, or they try and fit pieces, and, and they're real fitting. But, you know, if you're a true tree seeker, you want to put all the pieces together. Everybody knows the famous Isaiah 40:22 verse which says he sits upon the circle of the earth. It uses the same Hebrew word as, as Proverbs 8, 27, 
it's exactly the same Hebrew words. So if you're going to accept one is circle, you definitely need to accept the other is circle. Although the King James translators use a different English word, the actual Hebrew word, as we can see from the Strong's Concordance, is the same. It's chug. And I don't think anybody has a problem with that. You know, the people that have a problem are people that think a circle means a sphere or a ball or a globe. And the Bible never ever describes the Earth as such. It never says it's moving or rotating, spinning, flying through space. And the important point about that verse is he sits upon the circle of the Earth and sees the inhabitants as grasshoppers. So where is it? Because NASA don't seem to have found it. You know, if you've got this idea that he's all the way across the universe, billions of light years away across galaxy after galaxy, but he can still sit upon the circle of the Earth and see the inhabitants as grasshoppers, it doesn't make sense. What does make sense is the biblical description of the three heavens, where, you know, God's in his throne in the third heaven. I, I don't agree with this. The three heavens, I've talked about this in my Afterlife series. This is a misinterpretation of what Paul said in his vision that he went to the future base of the eternal state. But either way, just good stuff. And he can quite easily look under heaven and see to the ends of the earth. It makes sense. All scripture makes sense when you get rid of the modern cosmology, the Copernican heliocentrism. And right away in Genesis 1, sun, moon and stars are created on the same day. And again, that's in direct contradiction with what modern scientism tells us. So are you going to say, you know, are you going to take the Bible as truth or are you going to say, you know, modern man knows better than, than God? If you know about DNA and you still believe in evolution, well, you're holding two contradictory concepts there. Nobody would ever say a book authored itself. And DNA is the very complex code for all life. Are you really saying the code doesn't have a coder? Back to our biblical flat earth puzzle. We've got the two circle verses. But we've also got two verses that tell us the earth has four corners and God doesn't use throwaway verses, throwaway phrases like men do. You can't make them figurative, otherwise we can make circle figurative. Well, you can say what God really meant to say he was, but that's reading the Bible Gnostically. I'll take the words exactly as they are. Now many understandably put the square outside of the circle. They'll include all four verses and say, okay, well, you know, there we are. But you can't leave it there because now you've got a problem with Proverbs 8.27 again. Now you've got God inscribing a square on the face of the deep. And also there's no way to gather people from the four corners if the, the circumference of the circle is the barrier, is the edge. It doesn't solve all the pieces of the puzzle. It's a bad fit. It's fitting a, a, round, a round hole, a round peg into a square hole. He means what he says. You can't call it for something else. And please don't say circles have corners. And the Orlando Ferguson picture that we get all the time with, with the four angels standing in the corners, it's the same thing. But not only that, <laughs> you've got the sun and the moon on, on wires and, and it's not even a flat earth. No, if you want to, if you want to solve the puzzle properly and make sure all the pieces fit perfectly together, we need to take the square and put it inside the circle. No matter what other questions that raises, scripture has to be correct. It's, it's, it's the benchmark. It's the foundation. And now this much is all of scripture. Now God can look down and sit upon the circle of the earth and he's inscribed a circle on the face of the depth and he's got four corners to the earth where people can be gathered from and where angels can stand. And it's not the only scripture. I mean, all buildings that God commands to be built are always four square. They're always four sided with corners. They, they always face the four directions, the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. In Here's something I just thought of really quick. I didn't think of this before, but what if that tabernacle, the outside was a, square, was a circle and the inside was a square? Wouldn't that be something? Because the outside, I think the argument for the outside for those sheets creating a circle is very convincing. But the inside, given the fact that all the other buildings that God commands are always square. It's very interesting, the idea that the tabernacle would also be a square within a circle, just like all those ancient cosmologies we saw where there's a square and a circle, 
same theme throughout. Ever, he never instructs anybody to build a circular building with a dome. It's never happened. I mean, it's not you know direct proof, but it's, it would be inconsistent. Take Ecclesiastes 1.5 and Psalm 19.4-6 to to give us a picture, not of a sun circling round and round, that's not what the language says at all. It says it rises in one part of heaven and, you know, sets in another and it hastens back to where it arose. That's not circling round and round, otherwise it would just say the sun was circling round and round every day. It's describing this. It's describing the sun going across the earth and giving light and dark where it's not. And it's a continuous circuit but it's not just scripture there are there are plenty of observable proofs that prove the circle model is is a wrong model of flat earth there's no way for the model to um, produce the daylight hours that are, are real I mean millions of people live in these southern cities We can show examples of that with animations and show how it's how it's impossible to, you know, for, for it to reflect reality. You set the you set the sun's reach so we can't reach Antarctica, but it's it's just giving the Arctic 24-hour light as we know it does in the June summer. Then we we look at what the reach is. We look at how many daylight hours is that sun giving, and up north it's giving. You know, plenty. It's given you know, 12, 4, 12 to fourteen. But down south, I mean, you can pause it anywhere, and you can see that along those latitudes where the cities are, it's only given five or six hours of daylight. Then it's going dark again. But they receive ten hours of daylight on June the twenty-first or more. This model can't give the reality. A model must match reality. I mean, it's a basic fail. Of the of the Gleason's disc model, and it's it's a common sense, commonly known. Uh, you know, daylight hours can't be faked. The number of daylight hours can't be faked. So you could set the you could set the sun's reach so you know it's now a lot bigger. Now it now it will give ten hours of, of daylight um, to those places where where they actually receive it. But on the flip side, you know, if you look in the north now, everywhere within the tropic of of Cancer really is getting twenty four hour light which again we know is not reality. It's inherently flawed because of the time zones. An hour up in Canada is worth 20 minutes down south and you're done. So the, the, you know, the sun's reach needs to be three times, three times further down south. It doesn't make sense. And then we have the, you know, the equidistant, equidistant solstices six months apart. North and South. Here's here's two here's two pairs of examples. Again, pause, check it out for yourself. Go check some other places. Do your own research. But this is truth. And some people do do recognise that there's a problem with the uh, with you know the, the daylight hours on the disc model. So we get uh, animations like this. And clearly, what what is the sun doing? What is the what is that sun doing? It is, you've got a dark patch and then a light patch behind it, and then it, and then and then it goes to an egg shape in the in the June in the June solstice. And people will look at it and go, "Oh, right, well, that's how it works," because it is actually giving the right the right daylight hours there. Believe it or not, it is now giving plenty of plenty of sunshine to to south and, and obviously the Antarctic twenty four hour daylight. And it's, it's all to do with simply the way they've created this this animation. It's the rectangular Mercator map. You can see it's the same graphics from, from timeanddate.com. And they put it through a polar coordinate filter and sequenced it, so it's animated. And that will satisfy some people. Say, ah, well, that's how it works. Watch that. The sun can't light up, you know, the North Pole there, but it can light up places much, much further. It's nonsense. The 24-hour uh, Arctic sun is fascinating. Now, people say this is the sun circling round, but I, that's not what I see at all. I see the sun, you know, arcing exactly as it does further south. 
So it's not going below the horizon and coming up in, in a different place. And it should give us clues as to the, you know, as to the nature of, what, of, of how everything works. But the fact that the sun is far bigger and only said it than it is on the horizon shows that it's passing by. We could be seeing, you know, the, the doors of our world in action. There's certainly some keys and clues here in this motion. But what it's not doing, you know, for sure, is it's simply circling around above the Tropic of Cancer. It certainly disproves we're on some kind of spinning ball as well, because we, obviously the landscape wouldn't have to pan like that. I mean, the sun's moving. It shows the sun's moving and not the Earth. I, I think a lot of the problem is the way they've wedded this model to the amazing true realisation that we're not on a spinning ball in outer space. That NASA are lying, we've all been deceived. Most, most people still are deceived, I think we're crazy. But because they've, they've you know, inserted this model in there as well, unfortunately not more people come to it. It puts people off. You know, if you want to wake people up to the flat earth, it's, it's time to get to grips with reality and find, you know, choose better models. Because even if you say, you know, 24 hour daylight in Antarctica doesn't exist, which it does, thousands of people have been there and seen it, experienced it, reported, videos. But even if you want to say, you know, 24 hour, how many hours daylight can this model produce if the sun's circling around there? There it is on the Tropic of Capricorn. Can it produce 12 hours of daylight even? Where those cities are, there's no way to produce 14 hours. It's again produced about seven. And you can't make the light any bigger, otherwise it would stop giving the Arctic its, it's 24-hour night. I mean, the daylight hours, again, is something observational. It's something you can, you know, you can really research for yourself and easily check out. And, you know, with the, with the internet, you can, you can find people. Flat Earthers in Australia and New Zealand and South Africa, South America. There's plenty of international groups. Do, are these daylight hours correct for you? Every single video of the Antarctic shows just very little night. There's, you know, however many hours, if you don't, even if you don't believe there's 24 hour day, daylight in Antarctica in December, how many hours do you believe there is and how many hours is, this, is the circle model capable of producing? It's funny because flat earthers always accuse ball earthers of, you know, denying, denying facts and denying reality in order to, you know, cling on to their model. But they don't, they don't see the irony in the fact that they're doing that themselves with a circle model. I mean, the Earth is flat and stationary, but it doesn't... It's not a circle. It, that doesn't work, and, and the two don't need to be the same. The two don't need to be welded together forever. Unfortunately, it's what makes flat Earthers look like it, look like the victims of a, of a psychological operation. I mean, you know, we know the big psyop is on the ball believers. It's on those who believe there's an outer space and NASA are going on all these missions. And... You know, eventually visitors are going to come and, and save us. That's what the Flat Earth Realisation is all about. So we want far more people to wake up to it. That's what, that's what every Flat Earther wants. They want all their families and friends to realise that they've been lighter and the Earth is stationary. It's still as exactly as they see it. And the stars are, are just, you know, the, the lights in the sky. All the heavens are, are lights for the Earth. The Earth is, the Earth is it. But, the, but what they'll do is then ask, how does day, day and night work? Where's the edge? Why does nobody fall off? All these questions. And they, are, they need answering. You can't run away from them. Is that ah, but, you know, NASA are lying. Yeah, OK, fair enough. But how, how does the world work? That, you know, what, what, what we actually observe from Earth? And if your model can't explain it, if it falls down just on daylight hours, which is such, a, is such an easily observable thing all over the world and easily, you know, easily communicated, then people won't go any further. And they're going to they're stay on the ball because the ball explains day and night. I mean, OK, you know, they need, they need the magic of gravity and everything else to, to, to back it up. And all these, all, 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 all the mind, mind control tricks that we know because we, we were under it. So there's only one thing to do, and that's to get rid of the circle model. The flat square model can explain daylight hours no problem at all, and seasons, and Antarctic, Antarctic 24-hour daylight. It's completely biblical and scriptural, and it's completely observational.
Here's the sun's reach as it goes through the seasons and the year. Obviously, it's where it is at 12 o'clock GMT. As that goes along, the Antarctica is never going to receive night. Most of the world is. Everywhere, you know, the extreme north and south there, the north's getting dark. The north's only getting dark. And it shows the reach of the sun changing as it goes through the year, as it moves from tropic, tropic to tropic. But now Antarctica's going to get the 24-hour night, and Arctic will get its 24-hour daylight. And here, here's it daily going along, so that's how you get day and night. It's a simple explanation. Because the Earth is made equal, it's, it's, it's of two halves. And another huge, I mean, this, 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 this would be my first point of research. Everywhere on Earth receives 12 hours of, of, light, of daylight on the equinox. Check that's correct. And see if there's any way to make that happen on the circle model. Because of the way the time zones work on the circular model, and, the, and you just get bigger and bigger as you go further south, there's no way for that to produce 12 hour, a 12-hour day everywhere on one day. It's impossible. And then you have the speed of the moon. It's, all, it's also observable. It's easily observable. The, the moon moves between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn over the month. It takes a month to do what the sun takes a year to do. And on the, you know, on the, circle, on the circle model, the tropic of Cancer is a lot smaller. You put, the, you put them side by side, and the tropic of Capricorn is, is 1.7 times bigger. So the moon, the moon must have to speed up and slow down by, set by around 70% each month. And that should be easily observable. And we can test that. We can, we can, we can test it. You can see, first of all, does you know just general observed astronomy. How, how much does the speed of the moon change? But you can do your own experiments. We've got a good friend David Marsh on his channel. You can see the full version of this uh, moon race experiment. And what you would expect to see is the Tropic of Capricorn moon being far faster than the other two. The equator being faster than Cancer, but Tropic of Capricorn being being you know faster than both of them. And the results actually show the equator is the fastest moon. The moon goes, goes fastest across the sky when it's over the equator during the month. And not when it's over Capricorn at all. Capricorn is even a little bit slower than Cancer, but I would imagine that's due to perspective. It's completely not what you'd expect. It's a solid observable proof that we're not in this radial circle model. And then you have um, non-stop direct flights across the south from you know from large cities and people say well you know they don't exist or you can't book them but you've been told that people have taken them flat earthers have taken them <laughs> and people have videoed it so again it's denying you know reality airline airlines don't make up certain you know certain these flights people really do want to go from sydney to johannesburg and and you know and do it quickly and the reason why you'll deny that they, they exist is because it proves again that the distance, distances on this model just won't work. They will not work. So all we have to do just to prove it is, you know, there's 24,000 miles in the disk model. Um, every line of latitude is 1,000 miles. So it's 12,000 to the center from the edge to, to the North Pole uh, center. It's 12,000 miles. That's what we want to remember. So if we draw them out, and you know, sorry if I'm a you know a few a few, a few hundred miles out here, here or there, but it's not going to make any difference because, you know, if we put this over the centre, you've got twelve thousand to the centre plus another two is fourteen thousand miles, and this flight only takes eleven hours. So at six hundred miles an hour or less, it's going to take over twenty three hours. I mean, you, you know, commercial planes fly at five fifty five sixty miles an hour, so they're not over six hundred. Now people want to go from Australia to South Africa, fully enough. This flight exists and it takes 14 hours. And again, if we move the line and check the distance from, from the edge, it's 12,000 plus 2, it's 14,000 again. It takes 14 hours. So either the airplane flies at 1,000 miles an hour, which we know they don't, but again, you can check on the aircraft that it uses. Or it needs to take 23 hours, which it doesn't do. I mean, the times are, are so out, I mean, if it was an hour or two out, then, you know, you can say, well, you know, I'm only using PowerPoint to, to measure these distances, really. You know, it's only a rough guide. But they're 200% out. So clearly we can see why 
why people will insist that these flights don't exist, that they're fake and you can't get on them, even though, you know, there, there are forums all, all over the internet where you can, you can see people reviewing them and, and what have you. Um, I think Max Egan took this one twice. You know, confirming that it's a, a, a sub-13 hour flight. But again, on the, on, the, on the official flat earth model, on the disc, big disc model that everybody promotes, that this flight's 15, it's over 15,000 miles distance. It would take over 25 hours in a regular commercial airplane. This proves the distances on the, on the model are wrong. This proves the whole model is wrong. Now don't get me wrong, Earth is flat. It's not a globe. It's not a rotating ball, as they told us in outer space. And one of the best ways to prove it is the lack of curvature. We can see buildings and mountains and what have you, miles and miles in the distance. People say, well, the curve's hiding the bottom of them. We say, well, where's the curve? Where's the corresponding curve going across? Do you live on a cylinder? But this particular model of flat Earth is wrong. It, we've been sold a lie, again, fully enough. We've wedded the realisation that we're not in outer space and the Earth's not a big rotating giant ball to this, another false model. And it stops more people waking up to the, the first fact. It stops it because they will look at the alternative model and go, no, sorry, that's not it. So it, it does stop the flat Earth awakening, which is why it's important. And with the, the 4D model, I know people have a problem you know, are, are you, te are you kind, of, kind of teleporting from one side to the other? No. I mean, when you're looking at that, that's... We're looking at it from kind of God's perspective, from 4D. We're seeing the doors in action. As far as we're concerned, you know, it's a continuous strip. The Pac-Man analogy is, is perfect because we know, and it's a great way to explain it, we know, we know Pac-Man is, is, is fixed in his, his world, but he doesn't. When he, goes, when he goes through the doors, he, he doesn't know he's going from side to side, he's not teleported, neither do planes or ships. But they are going from side to side. But as God says in scripture, he shut up the sea with doors, a door you can go through two ways. You can keep going through it as much as you like, unless it's locked. Well, they're not locked. He gave the sea his decree, he didn't bound it with a wall or a barrier or, you know, anything physical, or the self. I mean, if you're in a, in a plane or a boat going from America to Japan or, or wherever, east-west, east, you, you know, there's no teleport, there's nothing strange going on with you, it's just the, the nature of the Earth space itself. It's continuous. I mean, that's why there's no edge. And it's also how they've, you know, managed to convince everybody that they're, they're on a continuous ball, because you can keep going and come back to the start. But there's always more than one explanation for everything. That's also why if somebody's determined never to ever uh, reject the, the spinning ball, the spinning bail, then you'll never convince them because there's always two explanations. As far as as far as you know, Patman's concerned, he's he's in a he's in a, a forever world. He can keep going left and right forever, and come back well, and kind of come back to where he started. And it's the same for us. You've got to kind of hold the thing in, in two, from two different perspectives at once. So the 3D where, where we are, and you just be, you know, you be keeping on going. But if you look at it from above, you would actually be going from one side to the other. But it's a seamless door. And like I say, it's God, it should be supernatural. The sun and the moon and the stars aren't hanging on wires in the, in the sky. They're not project, being projected from the ground like a Batman symbol. You know, it's all supernatural. Life is supernatural. I don't understand why, why science can't be the discovery of God's world, God's creation, God's amazing work, you know, the intricacies of DNA and life systems and, you know, how indeed the, the sun and the moon do work. But the earth is, is, it's fixed, it's flat, it's on pillars, it has a firmament where all the, all the lights are, the lights, to, you know, the lights are to give light upon the earth. Either you believe the Bible is the word of God or you don't. I mean, even if, I suppose even if you're a non-believer, the, the observable proofs that the, the, you know, the disc doesn't work should be enough. But if we keep within the parameters of the Bible, there's, there's four different shapes it can be. Square, rectangle, parallelogram, rhombus. And, you know, one of loads of different projections. There's loads of different square projections. There's loads of different ones for each. Well, a few different ones, anyway. 
Makita and the Central Solenu Club and Adams. <laughs> Like I said, there's always going to be, there's always going to be continuous east-west travel. There's no edge to the earth. There's only one of it, but it's shut up with doors. So as far as you're concerned, you can just keep going and keep going and keep going forever. Never-ending plane. That's what it is. The rectangular Mercator is whatever it's used to, and it matches scripture, where you know God's temples and tabernacles are twice as long as they are as they are wide and it can be a range of a range of projections and like i say the prime meridian can be anywhere it might be through london it might be through america or it might be through giza or jerusalem or maybe where the international dateline is for all we know and it doesn't matter because as we say it's the, it's the earth it's the space itself it's a continuous strip uh, nothing special happens to us we're not teleporting from one side to the other it's space itself that's doing the you know the, the weird magical thing if you like and I like the, the, these two because the, the equator line is, is the longest line, it's longer than the tropics line, which would explain the speed of the moon. This particular one has distorted land masses. And somebody needs to do one with you know, more, maybe a more accurate land masses. This also, really quick, by the way, might be a better explanation to um, reconcile the 16 emergency flight plans by Eddie's book, where it seems to, to work in the Northern Hemisphere and you have these angles because on a Mercator, everything is straight. Whereas if you had a rhombus type of tiled situation, that might explain those 16 emergency flight landings. So just a food for thought. But it fits together nicely again. It's quite easy to see how east-west travel will work. I think with the rhombus, you've got more chance of, of getting the, the land masses in um, I mean, we, again, we don't know the exact shape of the land masses, but you've got the equator line as the longest line. Uh, north, south, east, west work exactly as you expect them to. And then also, you know, if you're stargazing in, in South America or Australia, you look, you look south, you're going to see the same similar, similar skies, similar constellations. And that's <laughs> completely opposite to the to the circle where where they're on they're facing opposite. If they they look south, they're facing opposite ends of the sky. But the truth is that they do see the same constellations. We can look at the heavens, we can look at the earth, and and they both say flat square. They both say this four dimensional continuous loop. I mean, the Bible says that. It says it with its descriptions of the sun. It says it with it you know with the doors. See the sea shut up with doors. What else can that mean? And his decree. Is give a supernatural decree, and then you know it's got four corners. The four of the four angels can stand on the north, south, east, and west and hold those wings. And the sun, you know, the sun takes its planetary system, its renegade planetary system, to fool us into believing there's a solar system. But I've explained that on the flat Earth astronomy video. So you know. I don't understand why more, more, more flat earthers aren't, aren't looking into it, aren't questioning the circle model the same as we did the ball model, and you know, seeing that we've got far better, a far better model that explains far more observational realities and matches scripture perfectly. I don't understand why more people aren't on it, but hopefully they will do. Hopefully they will do in the future. So anyway, that's pretty much that. That's the end of our little show here. So a couple final thoughts for you. I know this was kind of a lot to take in, especially maybe if it's your first time in the cosmology discussion. Um, but fear not, ultimately what it comes down to is a mystery, folks. And I think that it's okay to acknowledge where you don't know. I think that's the most scientific thing. It's the most humble thing we can do is to acknowledge what we don't know and what we do know and be bold about what we do know, which is, again, is the gravity, the gospel, horizon, and the water and everything else. Leave it up for discussion, for, you know, exchanging observations with one another and exchanging data and supposing, you know, what it is and what it's not. But either way, 
couple final thoughts to wrap this up. I've studied this topic intensely in the last few years, and today I have more questions than when I started, which is a good sign. I also marvel more at God's work than I ever did. Than I ever did when I was obsessed with sci-fi and the heliocentric model, and than I ever did when I first woke up to the fact that the ball is a lie, and maybe the circle Earth is the truth. So I think this is what matters, is that we continually grow in our ability to have discernment and also in our marveling at God and his creations. The Earth 100% is a plane. It is a flat, emotionless, enclosed system with a firmament, whatever it is, and li local light sources. How this system looks as a whole is a mystery. I don't know if we're ever going to find the answer to that until Jesus returns. Maybe when he returns, we won't even have the answer. I don't know, but I would love to study. After everything is said and done, eternity is here, I would love to spend like the first thousand years just studying all this stuff and really asking God questions and so on. That's, that's a, it's a fun thought to me. But either way, it's a mystery, and that's okay. It's okay that it's a mystery because a mystery preserves you from deception. It's better to not know the answer than to think that you know and be deluded by the carrot of something that you think is real when in fact it's a delusion. Now, it's very important that we understand a distinction, and that distinction is between comprehensible and incomprehensible mysteries. Some mysteries are comprehensible, like omniscience, omnipotence. We have a lesser to the greater in the world that we can use for that. For example, you know that God is omniscient. It's hard to understand what that is, but we have a way that we can kind of conceptualize it through the internet, through Google, right? Through these big databases. I'm not saying God is a computer. I'm saying that we have a lesser to the greater. Oh, God must be omniscient. What is that like? Well, it's kind of like Google knows everything in the sense that you can ask Google and you can look it up immediately, but way better than that, right? Profoundly, infinitely more profound than that. But we have an example. Omnipotence. You can see earthquakes, uh, giant bears, you know, giant Nephilim, uh, uh, you know, dinosaurs, storms of all kinds. You have examples of really powerful things in nature and in history. And those are a way for you to understand lesser to the greater, like, wow, you know, if these things are really powerful, how powerful must God be? Right? That's the point. In fact, that's the whole point of Jesus letting the devil be worshipped at the end, is that you understand who is omnipotent. When you learn about all this evil stuff, and certainly if you've seen the Helocentric Conspiracy, the last thing I released, you realize just how profoundly powerful and evil and ubiquitous the devil is with all of his schemes, especially as we reach the end and he's going to be worshipped. It's profound. And then you realize, wow, how much more profoundly powerful must God be, Jesus, when he returns and destroys all of this with like the flick of his fingers. And that's the point. The whole point. That's the point why... Egypt was allowed to take power and to rule with an iron fist so that when God delivered the Israelites from Egypt, they would realize, wow, this invisible God that we can't see, he's the true God. He's the one that has all the power, that rules with a rod of iron. And this is the point, folks. So we have com comparisons that we can do to understand lesser to the greater. However, there are some mysteries that are not comprehensible. You do not have a comparison for it. A couple of examples. Self-existence. You don't have anything in the universe that is of itself. Nothing is a lesser to the greater for that. Self-existence is a confounding mystery. How is God self-existent? How has he always existed? How did he exist for an eternity before creating the earth? How, how is that possible? It, it's confounding. There's no, there's no even first step that you can take towards that to understand it. The Trinity. How does God exist as three persons in one being? It's confounding, and that's why a lot of people stumble over this stuff, because they don't understand it, and they can't tolerate a mystery. The Incarnation. How can Jesus be God fully and also fully human simultaneously? Doesn't make any sense, and yet this is exactly what the Bible teaches. The nature of life. How does life exist? How do inanimate things like proteins and lipids suddenly reach a certain level of organization where there are living units? and they run around and do stuff. And then how do those living units create bigger things like organs, which eventually create systems, which eventually create a human being, which has emotions and a consciousness and so on? How does that work? It's crazy. It's a crazy thought. Being born again is a mystery. How is it that suddenly you have a new life? 
And it's not something you did, it's something that God did to you. It's a mystery. It's the mystery of salvation. Creating something from nothing. How did God create the world from nothing? That is a principle that's very important. Some people think that God created the world from existing matter. It's not true. God created ex nihilo. He created everything from nothing. That is, there's no precedent for that. We don't have a way to understand that. We don't even have a way to, to step towards that, to say, oh, it's kind of like this. There's nothing that even remotely comes close to understanding how God created something from nothing. Just like being born again, just like the resurrection, just like the incarnation, just like all of these mysteries. There's no way to even begin to understand them. And of course, another one is divine simplicity. That's just a theological term for basically that God is not made of any parts. You and I are made of parts, but God is not made of any parts. He's not divisible, which is something I talk about in my Trinity series, so make sure you check it out if you haven't already. But divine simplicity, it's a mystery. How is God not made of any parts? He is of himself, and he's unique, and he's not made of anything. It's under, like, there's nothing that makes God. God is God. God just is. So there's a lot of things that we don't understand, folks, and your Christian faith, all of the things I mentioned, should be, hopefully, part of your walk with Christ. It should be part of your Christian faith. Meaning that if you accept all of these mysteries, which have no way to be comprehended, then is it a, is it a stretch of the imagination to believe that creation, which reflects God's glory and God's mysterious nature, and genius and power and supernatural quality, is it a mystery, is it a stretch to ask you to believe that maybe something like continuity on earth is supernatural. I don't think it is. I don't think it's a stretch. I think it's very likely. It's not comprehensible how space and time work. We think we understand it, but again, if you've seen my heliocentric conspiracy, all this talk about quantum this and quantum that and relativity is wrong. They don't have a clue. We live in a supernatural reality with a supernatural creator, and that's okay. It's okay not to understand how that works by design. I think that's the point, is so you marvel at it. In some sense, maybe we are living in a simulation, and not in a Gnostic way, not in any kind of weird way, but in a supernatural, unexplainable way. You know, in video games, if you ever play like first-person games like where you're exploring and things, they're, they're generating the territory as you walk through it. And that's happening in real time. So you, so you have a sense of continuity, but in, in reality, the game preserves its RAM and its information by not rendering the entire terrain all at once. So I don't know if that's maybe a lesser to the greater to try to understand something very profound. But either way, we, we can't explain life. We can't explain being born again. We, we can't explain God creating something from nothing. We can't explain a lot of things. So are we really going to be upset that we can't explain continuity on our world, that we can't explain all of the aspects of cosmology? I don't think so. I don't think we should. I think we should be humble and we should accept a mystery and marvel, marvel. If, if indeed supernatural continuity exists, which it has to, because the earth cannot be a circle. And the first problem, it raises many problems and questions, but it solves a lot of problems too. But either way, it raises many questions. The first question that it raises is, how the heck do you go from one side to the other? That's the elephant in the room. And the, and the answer is, well, it's supernatural. And if that's the case, well, then Everything is supernatural. Now, another thing on that note is that there's two kinds of supernatural. Supernatural, the word supernatural comes from super, meaning above, and nature, nat natural. Above nature, meaning above the laws of nature. But the question is, what kind of supernatural is it? Because there's two kinds. Again, just like before, comprehensible and incomprehensible. Consider the following events in the Bible. When Balaam, when his donkey spoke, did the donkey speak because his vocal cords were altered temporarily and there was some mechanical change that allowed the donkey to speak and the donkey was given, you know, different you know, awarenesses in his brain and suddenly he could speak? Or did he speak because God commanded the donkey to speak and it just happened, like something from nothing kind of miracle? The plagues in Egypt, did they happen because God was using the physical laws of the universe? Or did they happen because he spoke them into existence out of nothing? Like the frogs, the locusts, did they come out of literally nothing, out of thin air? Or 
was God manipulating the laws of the world, because he's supreme, he can do that, to bring about these plagues? Two different types of supernatural. When the Israelites got quail dropped on them because they needed food, did God steer a bunch of quail from someplace and brought them over there using the laws of physics and the universe and manipulating them? Or did he just speak quail into the air and a bunch of quail just came out out of nowhere and basically fell on the Israelites and they got to eat? Did the Red Sea, did it part because of an electromagnetic force field that God used somehow and he was parting the water? Or because God told the sea to part ways? Did Jesus walk on water because his consciousness could somehow manipulate the surface tension of the water? Again, using the physical laws of the universe and manipulating them. That still proves you're God. It's still supernatural. But one is measurable and understandable, while the other is not understandable. Did he use a force field or something to basically manipulate the, the surface tension under his feet? Or did he just tell the water, I'm going to walk over you and you're going to support me? Which, that's a whole nother discussion. How did Jesus feed the 5,000 and the 4,000? Where did he get the matter to reproduce the fish and the bread and to make more fish and bread? It doesn't make any sense from, from our perspective. It's literally something from nothing. Hebrews 1 says that Jesus maintains the universe by the word of his power. And the question is, are we dealing with a comprehensible situation or an incomprehensible situation? Modern science has led us to believe, and we've all been indoctrinated by the globe model, that you can put, you can define everything according to science. Everything can be explained. There's nothing mysterious going on. It's just this or that. But I think what we're dealing with is something incomprehensible. I think that we're dealing with incomprehensible supernatural things. Meaning, if there's a comprehensible supernatural thing, if Jesus walking on water was him somehow manipulating his electromagnetic field and creating a surface tension effect on the water where he could walk on it temporarily or whatever, there's some scientific explanation. Still proves that you're God, that you can do that, you know, with your will. Still proves that you're God, but there's an explanation. Then that means that there's answers to be found in the cosmology that we're exploring. There's answers. We may not understand them because we don't have the budget, we don't have the data, but there's answers. But if Jesus was walking on water because he told the water, hey, I'm going to walk on you, and you're going to support me. That's not comprehensible. If Jesus brought the fish and the bread out of nothing, out of thin air, and just, poof, literally created them, ex nihilo, from nothing, just like he created the world, then that's not comprehensible. That means that there's no answers for some of these things that we're looking at. And they're happening because God tells them to happen. Just like Hebrews 1 says, that he maintains the word, the universe by the word of his power. God is constantly speaking, which maintains all things. Our breath, the movements of the sun and the moon, they do what he tells them to do, and it just happens. There's no explanation for it. Because some of these things are very confounding, like with the sun setting. How, how has that happened? I don't know. Even the square model that this guy was talking about, it's very compelling. It solves a lot of problems. But how does it work with the sun setting? Because the sun in that model just travels above the earth. And again, there's, very, there's a lot of problems with the sun going above the earth that prove that the sun setting is not just happening because of perspective. But if the sun sets, how the heck does that happen when one person can see it in the sky and I'm seeing it setting at the same time? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. So we're dealing with something that is so supernatural and beyond anything we could possibly imagine, I think. Because again, there are countless evidences in the Bible that you are dealing with something that is not comprehensible. Jesus multiplying, you know, two fish and five loaves or whatever it was into 5,000 meals is not comprehensible. There's no scientific explanation for that. There's no scientific explanation for a talking donkey. There's no scientific explanation for the water parting. There's no scientific explanation for the wor world being created from nothing. So these things are well beyond our pay grade, and maybe this is what David means in Psalm 19 when he says that the heavens declare the glory of God, in the sense that he's marveling. He's marveling. He's caught up in that moment of, of coming to terms with the fact that nothing that you look at is comprehensible. It's so marvelous. 
and amazing that it re reveals the glory of a mysterious creator. Creator so far beyond our understanding, how much higher are my ways than your ways? The Most High. And of course, that creator revealed himself in the person of Jesus, who translated all of that mystery into a physical body that could be experienced, that could be with, that could be talked to, and that will be seen forever. Such a profound statement. But the heavens declare the glory of God, and that glory is incomprehensible. It's mystery, it's majesty. There's no answers. You can't even take a step forward into beginning to unpack self-existence. You can't take a step forward into beginning to unpack something from nothing. Meaning, all you can ever do is marvel and be in awe and gratitude at the Creator. And I think that's the point, is that these things are revealed so that you can fulfill your purpose, which is to be created to worship God and to marvel at the Creator. Because again, there's no way to understand any of these things. And I think that's what this is. I think that all these things ultimately lead us to a confounding situation on purpose so that we can marvel. Either way, God didn't give us senses and a mind to discern everything about reality, but rather gave us the equipment to realize that He exists and who He is as omnipotent, self-existent, full of majesty, wisdom, incomprehensible mystery. We can discern that through our brain and through our senses so that we can marvel. Marveling is the end point of all study. If you don't marvel at God more, then your study has not led you to the destination. All of these things, cosmology, the afterlife, the Sabbath, uh, you know, all of the, the things we've talked about so far with the different series, the end times, if they don't lead you to marvel at God more, then you haven't gotten deep enough in that study. Anything that leads you away from marveling to being secure in, oh, I, this is how it works, in that sense. Sure, you should be secure about knowing certain things, but at the end of the day, the deeper you go, you ultimately realize there's a mystery about everything. Yes, we're saved by grace. And that's a simple thought, but it's, it's not so simple. Because the Bible has many imperatives and tells you that you need to run the race and embrace your election and so on and so forth. And then it says that you're predestined and, elect, and elected to Christ before the world was created. Well, these two things seem contradictory. And yet they create the dance of life. And the same is with cosmology. There are things that are contradictory. And yet they create this dance between two things that seem completely contradictory, but they're probably complementary. Because again, the world is mysterious. We live in a supernatural world. And that points you to a supernatural creator, which is designed for you to marvel. The devil doesn't want you to marvel at God. The devil wants you to be distracted and to marvel at his lies. You know that from the heliocentric conspiracy. And of course, the flat earth movement is no different. It's just a little antichrist designed to say, no, 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 quick, quick, quick. Before you, before you find the truth, look at me, look at me, look, 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 this is how it works. And of course, that's not how it works at all. True science is investigating and discovering, being experimental, being open-minded, being curious, acknowledging your ignorance, not rushing to an answer, doubting your hypothesis, collecting all sorts of data, building a case, being detail-oriented. This is true science. And true science is also acknowledging that you don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I have more questions now than I ever do, but I'm happy with that because I know that I'm not being deceived by either the ball or the circle. And I am able to perceive the mystery and to marvel at the mystery, which is truly profound. The square orientation answers many issues and the Bible, but true reality, at least for now, is a mystery. And many things are mysteries. Maybe on the other side of eternity, we will know We'll be able to ask Jesus, you know, maybe we'll be able to investigate these things, who knows. But there are many things that we don't have answers for, and that's okay. The mature mind accepts that reality and marvels at it. The immature mind thinks that you can put an infinite creator into a box of your own design and figure out how the creator works and how he does things, and this is it. I don't think that's the way it works, folks. I think if you're dealing with a self-existent creator that creates something from nothing. And there's no way to even to begin to understand any of these things. You have no comparison. You have no first step that you can take to say, oh, this is what it's like. 
These things are confounding. Self-existence, something from nothing, you know, not, inseparability, the incarnation, the Trinity, being born again, life. All these things are just so confounding. Where really, if you're honest with yourself, you you do the research, you find out how these things work, and you learn about them, but you don't ever really find out how they work. And that's the fun part, is to remain in the mystery and to never forget to marvel. So the point of this episode was, first and foremost, that you aren't deceived by the Flat Earth Movement because it's infiltrated, it's controlled opposition. The truth is much more profound than we could ever, ever imagine. And I hope that maybe one day we will find it out, but who knows? Again, I don't think we could ever truly understand it, but maybe we'll learn a little bit more about it. And that's, that's a fun thing to imagine. But stick to the key points when you're debating with people, gravity, horizon, water, and the gospel, and help them come out of the ball while at the same time helping them avoid the counterfeit, which is right there ready for them as soon as they come out of the ball to be going into another matrix, just like the Maze Runner movies. And of course, always remember to marvel. So I hope this has been edifying for you. I hope you've learned quite a lot. I hope you have more questions and certainly write me emails if you have answers to these questions, post them in the comments, start a discussion in the Fennec Fox chat. I'd love to hear more about this. Like I said, I have more questions now than I have ever had, and I hope that's the case for you too, which would mean I did my job. We'll see you next time. Take care, and God bless.